this uh, public hearing uh, to order. We're reconvening from uh, June 28th and 29th, and um, this meeting is convened by electronic means. And as such, council members may participate in person or by electronic means. Um, please ensure your video is turned on so we can ensure quorum. Uh, any member who is video is disabled will be marked as absent for that portion of the meeting. If uh, council members lose a connection during a portion of the hearing, uh, we'll recess until that connection is restored. Members of the public can view the proceedings via the live stream and YouTube, which is on Twitter. Uh, and of course, we acknowledge we're in the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Slavel Tooth people and thank them for their generosity to all of us who live on their lands. I want to thank staff too for everything they're doing, especially in these. Uh, very long days at the end of our uh, four-year term. With that, uh, clerks, can we uh, have the roll call, please? Mayor Stewart in the chair. Councillor Carr. Councillor DeGenova. Present. Councillor Fry. Present. <clears throat> Councillor Swanson. Here. Councillor Hardwick. Councillor Weeb. Present. Councillor Boyle? Present. Councillor Dominato? Present. Councillor Bly? Present. Councillor Kirby Young? Present. You have quorum, Mayor Stewart. Thanks, uh, Council. We've got a, a few things to go through before we get to uh, resume hearing from our speakers. Um, First of all, the public can participate over the phone by submitting written comments or uh, by speaking in person and have five minutes to uh, make their points and to state whether they are in support or oppose the recommendations and if they're a resident of Vancouver. Uh, speakers may only speak once and should uh, just follow along on Twitter at Van City Clerk for updates. And I will call out the number of speakers as well, uh, the number we're on, so people can kind of plan their day accordingly. You can also make online comments uh, on our web form at vancouver.ca forward slash public dash hearing dash comments. Um, and um, council is committed to ensuring that all people who participate in the public hearing will be treated fairly and respectfully. The language we'll all use in public hearings should reflect respect for all residents and no form of uh, discrimination will be accepted or tolerated. Discriminatory language includes attacks on groups of people and individuals, and Vancouver's procedure bylaws prohibit council members from the use of words, tone, spe spe uh, speech, or gestures that expresses a negative view of the character of any person or groups of people. Members of the public are expected not to engage in improper conduct, which includes the use of expressions that promote hatred or are defamatory. The creation of a safe and inclusive environment for the public, staff, and council to participate is all our responsibility. So members of council may call points of order if language used by another councillor during a meeting is not respectful. And as chair, I will ask speakers to modify their speech to ensure that they are using respectful language. And I will remind folks as we go through, uh, I think, the 250 speaker or 200 speakers that we have left on this item. We also have a long-standing commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion, uh, and respect for all genders. So I just ask council when addressing speakers and staff, we avoid using gendered honorifics and instead refer to people by their first or last names, first and last names, role, or title. This is a quasi-judicial uh, hearing, which is uh, the rules of which are outlined in the charter and uh, in our procedural bylaws. And uh, according to these rules, uh, we're only to consider the merits of the rezoning application or heritage designation. Council members may ask clarifying questions from speakers, but should save any debate for after the close of the speakers list. After we close the speakers list, council will either approve the application, refuse the application, or refer the application to staff for further consideration. Uh, before we begin, I'll respond to a point of procedure raised at the public hearing last night uh, to the chair by Councillor Kirby Young uh, a, re regarding further opportunity for council to ask questions to the applicant. In consultation with law and city clerks, it is recommended that this public hearing continue to follow the process outlined in the procedure bylaw, section 13.13, .13, order of business. As per the section of the bylaw, the opportunity to directly ask questions to the applicant has passed. 
As public hearings are quasi-judicial proceedings, the order of business is intended to maintain the integrity of that process. Council will have the opportunity to ask questions of staff following the close of the speakers list. Uh, as well, the applicant, uh, who I'm sure is listening intently to these proceedings, will have does have an opportunity to uh, offer closing comments, which uh, can be extensive. Staff have worked very closely with the applicant and should be able to respond to any questions as well with respect to the application. Council members may send questions in writing to staff who will respond following the close of the speakers list. Finally, it's anticipated that we will not complete this public hearing, uh, hearing from speakers tonight due to the number of registered speakers remaining. Uh, the next reserved date to continue this public hearing is July 14th. So I suggest the council consider a motion to continue this item on the reserve date of July 14th, starting at 3 p.m. So would somebody be willing to move a motion to that effect? I'll move, Council Bly. Thank Thank you. You. Councilor Bly. Councilor DiGenova. Thank you. Uh, all yeah. those in favor, yay. Yeah. Any opposed? Thank you. Okay, that, that uh, motion has passed, thanks. So uh, we are scheduled to go clerk. to 10 o'clock. I, I tried to raise a, a, a question at that time and didn't have the opportunity before the vote was taken. I don't see you on video. I'm trying. Are you, are you on cha in chambers or are I you? I am in chambers. Ah. I didn't I, hear I have. I'm sorry, I have a question before I can register that vote. May I well, ask the question? It has passed. Is it a point of procedure? It what is a point is the... of procedure. Okay. What is the point of um, procedure? As, as is today, um, my understanding is that public hearings are supposed to take place after six o'clock in the evenings in order to accommodate the public in non-work hours. Today, we've gone to three o'clock. You've now suggested we do it again at three o'clock. And my understanding is that the public hearing regulations specify that the public public hearing should be held after six in order to accommodate the public. Yes, uh, we have though, uh, with this vote that's passed, uh, have varied the bylaw and um, and we'll now start at 3 p.m. on July 14th. Well, in that case, I'd like to register my vote of opposition. Sure, I'll have clerks record that. Uh, Thanks so much. Uh, we are now moving on to continue to hear from the public. Any speakers who wish uh, to speak to this item can call toll free 1-833-353-8610, uh, code 106 pound. Um, and that number is available on the live stream and on, uh, and, and on Twitter. And any speakers in the council chamber, please come forward to the podium when I call your name. We have uh, speakers on the line to provide comments on this item. Uh, and yesterday, I think, clerks, we ended with Speaker 46. So we're going to continue with Speaker 47, David Chudnowski. Is uh, David Chudnowski on the line, clerks? Yes. Great. Uh, David Chudnowski, please go ahead. You have up to five minutes. Good, good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and members of council. I assume you can hear me now. You sure can. My name is David Chudnowski. I was for a number of years the MLA for Vancouver Kensington and the opposition critic for homelessness in the legislature. As part of that job, I traveled on an organized tour to dozens of communities across BC and to every corner of Vancouver and had the privilege of speaking with hundreds, hundreds of homeless people, direct, honest, and formative conversations. I also spoke with many, many service providers. I read the literature, both Canadian and international, about homelessness and how to deal with it. Now, numbers of people who've spoken with you already have uh, uh, recommended to you uh, to follow the science. So here's the science. Housing unhoused people saves lives. I'll repeat that. The science is clear. Housing unhoused people saves lives. We need to provide appropriate supports for those people and those of us who care about this issue must and will encourage, campaign, and demand those supports. But never forget the science. 
Housing unhoused people saves lives. I want to tell you a true story. Back when I was running for MLA, the former member organized a meeting at John Oliver Secondary School, and 600 people joined the, the, jammed the gym to oppose the building of a dual diagnosis residence just a block away from the school. They said all the same things that opponents of this project have been saying, except they didn't talk about shadows. The facility got built and it's been providing important services to our neighbors ever since. And they've been good neighbors with virtually no problems over all those years. People who were once opposed to the project have come to me and told me that they were surprised at how well it's worked. Members of council, we live in one of the wealthiest and most privileged communities in the world. One of the wealthiest and most privileged communities in the history of the world. And our neighbors, human beings just like us, have nowhere to live. It's a disgrace. You've been asked to approve a place for 129 of our neighbors, 129 human beings, to live. It's appalling to me that already 11 units have been removed from that plan. That's not theoretical, it's not an abstraction, it's 11 human beings who won't have a place to live. Within three or four blocks of where we live, there are already existing or approved by this council rental buildings, social housing, and supportive housing. That's great for our neighborhood and great for this city. And it needs to be the reality in every neighborhood in Vancouver. Members of council, you all know there is a crisis of homelessness in Vancouver. There's no shadow crisis. You all know the right thing to do. The only question is whether you have the courage to do it. I want to believe you have that courage. Please approve this building and this development. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. I do not see uh, any questions for you, so I will uh, just thank you for participating tonight and I will uh, move on to the next speaker. Just gonna check here with the clerks first. Great, I think I'm good. Uh, so we're moving to the next speaker who is uh, Maria Roth, speaker number 48, Maria Roth. Not on the line. Not on the line. Thank you, clerks. I have speaker number 49, Bill Thielman. Here, Mayor Stewart. Great. Uh, go ahead, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'm a Vancouver resident and opposed to this project. Uh, I want to thank you for all of council for your time today and the uh, afternoons and evenings to come. Uh, I'd like to also be clear at the start, I worked briefly for the Kitsilano Coalition in 2021 and for St. Augustine School until earlier this year, but I neither work for nor speak for either of those. But I strongly agree with their deep and thoughtful objections to this BC housing project. And this should not be a difficult decision for you. First, it is far, far too big and too tall for this neighborhood. 13 stories would be opposed by the Kitsilano community, whether it was for luxury condominiums or for supportive housing. This is an unwelcome density, period. Secondly, this project should never, ever have gotten to this stage at a council public hearing, given the overwhelming opposition expressed by the community at every opportunity. It is the wrong size in the wrong place. Third, this is also the wrong approach. It is not integrating those in need of housing with the community, as many other social housing projects have done in Kitsilano. It is isolating them in an incredibly obvious and giant tower unlike anything in the Arbutus and Broadway area. It is warehousing people in need of housing in a tower of 129 single rooms. It is 60 feet from an elementary school and that alone should have disqualified it completely. It is next to an existing effective shelter for women and that too should have disqualified this site on its own. There has not been a single open public hearing to allow the Kitsilano community to be collectively informed and to have its concerns heard and responded to. Again, this is grounds for disqualification. Let's be blunt, this BC housing project should have never got through the initial application, let alone get to council, 
and that's on you as a council and on the city staff. Please do not accept unfair allegations that Kitsilino or this neighborhood are, quote, anti-homeless. Just the opposite. It has many social housing and supportive housing projects, and it has had for many years. It is through this particular, it is this particular BC housing project that is over height, over density, warehousing people, 60 feet from an elementary school, single rooms only next to a shelter for women, and not in any way a fit for the neighborhood. That is the problem, not this great neighborhood. I urge you strongly to reject this proposal. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. You do have some questions. Uh, Councillor Hardwick, up to uh, five minutes. Uh, thank you, Bill. Um, interesting comment you started with saying that if this was a 13-story luxury strata condo unit, the, uh, the neighborhood would not object. Are you sure about that? No, 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 I said the opposite, Councillor Hardwick. I said it, whether it was luxury condos or supportive housing, the neighborhood would object. Sorry if you misunderstood. Okay, that's interesting. Um, if it was luxury condos, I might have had more of an issue. Um, you talk about the public process. We're having a public hearing here now. You suggested that there had been not a single open public hearing in the neighborhood. What do you mean by that? Can you elaborate? Certainly, I think that there should have been, and I understand the, some of the restrictions of COVID, but there hasn't been an opportunity for the Kitsilino community, the neighborhood, to come together, hear from the city, hear from BC Housing, hear from the proponent or the uh, applicant to run this facility, ask their questions in a group way, see what the answers are, and register their concerns and have them addressed. A council hearing is the final stage because you are going to proceed to a vote. We don't have the community together. If I look online, I suspect there's probably um, a few dozen people watching this because it's in the afternoon. And in any case, we, we want to, I would expect a situation where the, the community was brought together, given several opportunities to have input and concerns raised and, and have them responded to so that they could make a, a more informed decision whether they oppose or support this project. But that has not happened. So, um, Heightened density, um, but not social use per se. You said there's a bunch of other social uh, housing in the neighborhood, correct? Well, there's the Sancta Maria uh, Shelter for Women, which has been operating for, I believe, 15 years, which is right next to this location. There are several other locations in Kitsilino, most of which most people wouldn't even know about because they aren't 13 stories tall and don't have 130 people in them. Um, I think that that in and of itself speaks to the success that a more integrated and more low rise and low uh, density facility has. So in your uh, way of looking at things, a um, integrated facility that was brought into the neighborhood of a lower height would be acceptable to the neighborhood? Well, I think it's already been proven to be acceptable in several locations in Kitsilino. I believe there's over 13 locations that are currently operating and um, we don't have reports coming to police or council or anywhere else that there's significant problems with those. I think that that's, uh, you know, I think we've, council has been somewhat jammed into a situation to accept a tower or nothing. And that is extremely unfortunate. But w if we hadn't got this application to this stage, we could have, if council and staff and the city had said, this isn't going to fly, this isn't going to work, as staff previously did on an 11-story proposal at the Broadway and, and our Butish uh, Shell Station location, uh, that was rejected before it even got to council. If this had gone that way and been rejected at the right stage, as I said before, then we could have been looking at alternatives by this time instead of looking at this proposal, which is just the wrong place, the wrong time, the wrong size, the wrong density, everything else about it is wrong. Thank you very much. Thank you, that's it for, uh, thank you. That's it for questions. Thanks for coming in and sharing your views. And I'm going to move on you, to the next speaker. Thank you. Okay, Council, the next speaker is, sorry, too many screens going here. Uh, next speaker is uh, uh, Dragana uh, Bajolovic, speaker number 5050. Hi there, can you hear me? Sure can, up to five minutes, please. Good afternoon, Council. My name is Dragana Vajankovic. I live in Vancouver. Thank you for the opportunity to speak in opposition to the zoning application. I welcome social and supportive housing. I oppose the model proposed for Abuse Senate. I'm not sure how many councillors have already made up their mind about how to vote. 
If there is a chance you have not, please consider the points I will try to raise. First, the lack of planning detail on most aspects of this project is concerning at this advanced stage of the rezoning application. The council is not approving a generic building concept at this stage, but a very specific housing model for a defined set of residents in a specific area. Here is what you are approving, a low barrier building for 129 adult-only residents, many suffering from addictions and mental health issues with no complex supports in the building or in the neighborhood. We heard on Tuesday night that BC Housing has no established best practices for staff to resident ratio or best practice about ratio of residents with mental health issues and addictions. We also heard that the standard staff ratio is two. This translates to only one staff per 65 residents for the proposed building, which is extremely low to provide effective support to residents. Many asked through the application's webpage if any assessments were carried out to determine a fit between a low barrier building and its immediate surroundings. It's clear from the answer that no consideration was given to neighborhood context. The key criteria were a vacant lot and proximity to transit and public amenities. However, the context matters greatly for the well-being of the building's future residents as well as for the other vulnerable populations who share the same site. The lack of complex support services in the neighborhood is ignored. There would be none in the building either. The building would be right in the middle of the following. There are hundreds of elementary school children, a daycare, a busy total playground just a few meters away. No children will be allowed to live in this building as it's not deemed a safe environment for them. How then can it be safe to have it mere meters away from kids? The building would cast extensive shadows on the elementary school and daycare across the street for most of the school day. This is in direct contravention of the shadowing amendment for schools that was adopted in the context of the Broadway plan. Riederman residence was mentioned as a comparison. Riederman is half the size in terms of occupancy and it's only three stories high. It's a temporary building where the proposed one is permanent. An abstinence-based recovery home for women is just across the Greenway. A building with open drugs consumption just next door would directly clash with their efforts to recover from addiction. We heard about a dramatic increase in 911 VPD calls in relation to Margaret Ford building. Many women in the recovery home have fled violent situations and witnessing daily incidents requiring police intervention would be traumatizing. Finally, Maple Crest Low Income Seniors Home is just across the, around the corner on the next block. This is not even discussed. We repeatedly heard that neighborhood concerns are unfounded and that any issues would be resolved within the first few months of operation. Yet, in a recent interview, David Eby suggested that this specific project may well fail. He was an, exa an example uh, of a similar building in Victoria that had to be relocated due to serious issues in the neighborhood. A question keeps coming up. Why insist on a model that fails both its future residents and other vulnerable populations in the neighborhood? <clears throat> Housing for people experiencing homelessness is a key priority in both federal and provincial governments' 10-year housing plans. Why not use this as an opportunity to build something that can be successful at this location? Other and equally needed forms of housing were never proposed for this location, despite the feedback from many in the neighborhood right from the very start of this process almost a year and a half ago. Dr. Summers' research clearly documents that scattered individual housing is more effective for recovery. Many in the neighborhood have been asking for additional models to be considered, the models that BC Housing operates elsewhere. Why not consider a building that can finally provide continuity for women who are exiting the recovery program next door, many of whom are trying to reunite with their children? Many have pointed out that the existing infrastructure at the Buddhist and Eat is ideal <clears throat> for effectively supporting and integrating a resident mix that includes families. It was said on Tuesday evening that there isn't such a great need for family housing as families in need are accommodated quickly. For many families, this is not what's actually happening. There are 1,800 calls a year to battered women's support services in Metro Vancouver from women who struggle to find housing. The building is institutional in appearance and its scale would prevent it from blending in. People will be housed in what are prefabricated metal structures, which is troubling given the recent memory of last year's heat dome. A rare green space on the north side of Broadway with a large grove of mature trees will be completely concreted over. This makes little sense for the well-being of prospective residents of the building who would be right next door to a major train station and a busy bus loop. Too many aspects of this, this proposal are flawed. They should go back to the drawing board. BC Housing should genuinely engage with the immediate neighborhood on finding an alternative model that can be a success. <clears throat> Thank you for listening. Thank you for your time this afternoon. I do not see any questions for you, so I will move to the next uh, speaker, but thank you so much for uh, sharing your views on this uh, item. We're moving to speaker 51, uh, Tim Matheson, uh, who I believe is in person, clerks. Yes. Great, thank you. Tim Matheson, whenever you're ready, uh, please go ahead up to five minutes. 
Hi there. Um, my name is Tim Matheson. I'm a resident of Kitsilano, very close by where this proposed uh, rezoning is uh, scheduled uh, to or, or being asked to uh, occur. I'll try not to go over all the things that uh, Bill Thielman so eloquently spoke of earlier, but for me, the, the main issue here is no one is talking about the children. A lot of talk by the uh, BC Housing and by the city and by uh, NPA Society about the facility is going to have this, the facility is going to do that. A fellow called in earlier and said, housing unhoused people saves lives. God knows that's true. But at what cost? The MPA Society suggested that they have multiple facilities around the area that are close to schools. And when asked how close, they said 500 meters, which is a third of a mile. So this is 20 meters from a school with 450 students, St. Augustine's Middle School, right across the street. So I think that's the cost that we have to consider. What is the danger to these children? This facility is, let's put it this way, in our neighborhood, I don't think there's 140 or 145 people on any block on both sides of the street. So it's not very dense. There's apartments, there's townhouses, a few condos, but it's in homes, private homes. Um, and so it's not very dense. There's Delamont Park, which is a toddler's park, which would be directly across from this, where young families, young mothers and, and uh, fathers take their toddlers to their first experience on, uh, uh, you know, play, th play th stations, play things. And these things would be put into jeopardy depending on the occupants of this facility. But 140 people dropped into one one facility that is this big in an in, at an intersection which can't support the traffic. Our Butis is very busy. 7th Avenue is a one-lane <clears throat> a roadway and a bikeway. So it, it's, it's just too many people right in the middle of, of a community that has been designed basically for children. The uh, St. Augustine School has plans to grow to 750, 800 people by extending it, I think, to high school. I think that's probably been approved. So they're going to get bigger. Um, to drop 140 people across the street from them, I think would seriously imbalance the neighborhood. When asked uh, at, at a previous session what, what kind of uh, interview process did the people go through, what questions are asked about their criminal record or Point of order. Councilor Swanson, I'll just pause you there, Speaker. Go ahead, Councilor Swanson. I, I don't think it's, I think you should caution the Speaker about assuming that these folks have a criminal record. Um, uh, speaker, uh, what we just heard from our legal department yesterday is we can talk about occupying the building, but not occupants. So uh, your your initial comments were were bang on, but as we drop into as we move to talking about the occupants of the building or potential occupants, uh, our legal team has said that that's uh, we shouldn't go there. So if you can just uh, stay on the same track you were on, I think we'll be in good shape. Just a yeah. point of procedure, ma'am. Uh, sure, Councillor Dejanova. Do we still have to state the the section of the procedure bylaw when we call a point of order? Or not in this meeting? I think I, I will take the prompt from Councillor Swanson. As I said at the beginning of the uh, meeting, okay. I would, I would uh, but you're right. Uh, Just wanted Swanson. to know in case I had one later on. Thank you. Great, thanks. Yes, so Councillor Swanson and others in the future, um, let's try to state the, uh, the procedural bylaw uh, section that we're quoting. Uh, speaker, sorry for that interruption. Please continue. Thank you. Um, the point I was raising was that in, in a similar um, facility to house the homeless in the Olympic Village, I spoke with Deputy um, Chief uh, Counsel Howard Chow, who said he was, not, he was not asked to give any information or any advice about this uh, proposed um, building. The police department was not contacted and didn't enter in uh, any information about that. The um, ratio of calls before and after 
the building in, in the Olympic, sorry, in the Olympic uh, Village raised 17,000 percent, 1,700 percent, I'm sorry. So it, it is, I think, critical to this situation to find out who's going to be in this place and, and how they're going to behave uh, and how they will interact with 450 to 800 students across the street. Um, it, uh, I think more than anything, we're a community that wants to be involved in this process. I would ask the council to turn this proposal down and to begin again with the community, maybe even ask the, uh, um, the Sancta Maria house that's run by the, um, the church, uh, the St. Augustine church in that area. They had, they have tremendous experience in this field, in this area. And could, they could easily, they're right next door. They could easily uh, uh, build a, a facility there that they could control and they could handle. And I think that would be of greater import and greater uh, satisfaction to the community. I, I also think that, uh, that I just, I think that we have felt in the community that we have not been allowed in. This was a fait accompli presented to us. It's going to be this kind of building and it's going to be this tall. And it was like we really had no input. Okay, so they dropped 10 rooms and they changed uh, the, the height, not of the building, but just of a sort of a something that stuck up above it. And I don't think that's satisfactory. The other things of that. I think you are at the end of your five minutes, but you do okay. have a question from uh, Councillor Hardwick. Councillor okay. Hardwick, please go ahead. Hi, Tim. Hi, Councillor. So um, you started off talking about the children, the proximity, the vulnerability. Um, then you sort of segued into talking about the neighborhood and lack of input. And throughout there also talked, I think, about the height and massing of, of the building. Those, that's a one, two, three. Is it any one of those things? Is it the combination of the three? Um, as we try and see a path forward, uh, are there priorities among those three? Could you elaborate a little further on your reasoning? I think the, the thing that is of greatest import, because I think the community does want to welcome uh, people in need into our community and, and to give them a great opportunity to recover from their homelessness or, or any physical conditions or mental conditions that they're suffering. Um, I think that the volume and height of the, the facility that they're proposing is the key impediment for most of the people I've talked to, some of the people I've talked to, and that it's it's so large on such a small site that it invades the, the standard setbacks that even a high-rise uh, apartment building would have, a condo building. They would have a greater setback from the, the, the street. They would have a, gre a greater setback from the property line. They'd have wider sidewalks. This has not been taken into consideration in this specific instance. So I think that the density of it and the the size of the building are the, are the critical elements here you talked about the neighborhood input have you had any other experience with neighborhood input in these kinds of rezonings um no i've not just wondering what people compare it to when they think about a, a what a neighborhood process would look like so um anyhow that really answers my questions thank you very much thank you Thank you. Thank you so much. I don't see any other uh, uh, questions for you, so I'm just going to move to the next speaker. But thank you so much for. Thank you, uh, Mayor. Coming. Yep. Thank you. Um, let's see, Council. We have the speaker number fifty-two, Monica uh, Monica Agala, next. Hi. Do you hear me? Sure can. Up to five Hello? minutes whenever you're ready. Yep. Okay. Hi, thank you for City Council and Mayor Stewart. So my name is Monica. I'm a resident of Vancouver. I have lived here almost my entire life, and I'm opposing this rezoning application. This application puts a high density of three vulnerable populations together. As we have heard, there is a school with 500 plus students within 20 meters, 1,500 students within three blocks, women's recovery house next door, 
and a toddler park within 20 meters. This is a safety concern if BC Housing is planning on putting 50 to 100% supportive housing for people with mental health and addiction issues. This population requires and deserves complex care. Unintentional harm can occur, and there's no guarantee enough supports will be put into place, especially when there are currently real healthcare shortages and workplace shortages. As far as I know, there's only one other supportive housing building across the street from an elementary school. It is Mount Edwards in Victoria. It is only 78 supportive units and across the street from Christ Church Cathedral School. There is no drug use. Incoming residents are 55 or older with low to moderate support needs. There are at least three staff on site 24-7. Potential tenants are screened and only those with no known history of violence and no current substance abuse issues are housed at that location. Also, as discussed at the current height, it will shadow the school and schoolyard during the morning hours, and it will shadow Delamont Park during the afternoon hours during the fall and winter months, and shadow the Arbutus Greenway. Supporting this location and density of the building is a bad decision. I recognize there is a homeless crisis in the city, but we need solutions that are smart and effective for all members of our city and community. Thank you for your time and listening today. Thank you, Speaker. And I just have to say you did uh, very well express your views while standing within the, the boundaries of, of uh, kind of uh, how how we're hoping people will express themselves through this uh, hearing. So I just want to thank you for that. Uh, you do have a question from Councillor Carr. Yes, thank you very okay. much. Um, yeah, I appreciated um, your statements as well. I wonder if you wouldn't mind going over again. Um, the require are they requirements at that um, shelter you talked about, or the seventy-eight unit bill, um, uh, building? Um, the re you said that there's. I, I caught a few of them. Yeah, I think they are. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. One, one, one was there can be no current drug use. What, what were some of those other? Um, uh, yeah, it was stated that. Um, there's no known history of violence and no current substance abuse issues. So the tenants are screened, I think, through a vulnerability tool, from what I read, a, vul a vulnerability tool assessment. Yeah. Vulnerability assessment tool. Okay. Yeah. Appreciate the information. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. That's it for questions for you, Speaker. So thank you for uh, calling in today. And uh, I'm okay. going to move to the next speaker. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so uh, Council, the next speaker is James Stewart, uh, speaker number 53. James Stewart. Not on the line. Okay, thank you, clerks. We have Veronica VW, uh, speaker number 54. Uh, no, not on the line. Okay, thank you. We have Zoe Mabry, Mabry uh, speaker number 55, Zoe Mabry. H Hello, can you hear me? Sure can. You have up to five minutes whenever you're ready. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm a longtime resident of Vancouver. I used to live in Kitsilano, now living in Mount Pleasant after being run evicted from the Kitsilano area. I'm in full support of this project, adding more homes like this all around Vancouver that offer support and housing to our most vulnerable residents is one of the most vital things for this council to be doing as we face a worsening housing shortage and climate crisis. We cannot keep segregating less fortunate people into the already crowded downtown east side or onto polluted arterials. I'm sure you'll hear a lot of opposition today, as we've heard from the last few days from longtime residents of Kitsilano, but I hope you'll consider the needs of the public at large, who by a pretty sizable majority support more affordable housing in less dense areas of Vancouver. Listening to the Broadway plan hearings, I heard from supporters and opponents who both said, we need to be spreading out density in single family zoned areas. We need to stop displacing current rentals and we need to make more affordable housing projects. This does all of those things. I hope you'll cons also consider the needs of the people you will very likely not hear from today or in the coming days, which are the people who will be living in this building people whose lives will be most directly affected. There are a lot of barriers to calling into council meetings, so you tend to only hear from educated, well-off, comfortably housed people. If you're an essential worker or someone struggling with homelessness, it's simply not possible. 
It's also not an easy thing to do to work up the nerve if you're just a regular person with no experience in development or city planning or architecture or any of those things. This is my third time calling in, and I'm just as nervous as the first time. All I can tell you is even as someone who makes a very comfortable wage, as a renter, I still feel squeezed. So I, I can't even imagine how precarious it must feel to someone who even makes 60 k or lower. I honestly don't know how people are surviving out there right now. The lack of urgency I feel from the city to address this desperate need is so disturbing to me. The city also spends an enormous amount of money policing the homeless population on homelessness in general. It is far cheaper to just get people into the housing they need. Not only are lives changed, but the city saves money. Some of you have spoken a lot recently about the rise in crime in Vancouver. Housing and giving people the services they need to improve their lives is a solution to that. The CMHC just came out with a report saying Canada needs to build double the housing we are currently projected to build. The IPCC report is very clear that we need to build for higher density in order to fight climate change. This is exactly the kind of new housing we need. And we are actually cutting out some of the units because of shadows. Why is protecting the neighborhood from shadows a priority over giving people shelter? Again, where is the urgency from council to address the housing shortage? I've been listening to other speakers for the past few days, and a lot of really hurtful, offensive comments have been made about the people who would be living in this building, insinuating that they might be pedophiles or violent criminals. Low income or homeless people or even drug users are not synonymous with dangerous. These are our neighbors and residents of our city who deserve safe homes and the chance to change their lives. So thank you to Councillor Swanson for speaking up about that when it happened again today. I also want to note that last week we heard a similar proposal um, for King Edward and Knight, I think, uh, that passed pretty easily. And without imposing a lot of new conditions on the project that might make it, make it impossible or asking staff about schools and service levels. So I'm just wondering, why is it so different now? Uh, I don't want to insult council. I think you're all trying sincerely as best you can to balance different interests. But it really creates the impression that there's just a concern for appeasing wealthier residents of Kitsilano and not so much a concern for tenants. Uh, who might be living in these buildings. This is so clearly a desperately needed public good. I struggle to understand why we are even here debating this today. There should be no question that this collection of homes be built. Why are we making these affordable pro why aren't we making these affordable projects as easy to build as mansions and single family homes, which basically no one can afford at this point? I wish I didn't have to call into every public hearing to make sure this city gets the housing it so obviously needs. Many of you campaigned on the promise to make this a more affordable city, to make more housing for all residents, but we are still so far behind. It's Thank an you. incredible you injustice. You are at your five Am I minutes. Over time? Okay, you sorry. Are. That's okay. Thank you so much for calling in. I don't see any questions for you, so I, I am going to move to the next speaker, but I appreciate your, your input on this on this item. Uh, we have speaker number 56 next, Raul Martinez. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Sure can, up to five minutes whenever you're ready, please. Perfect, thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Raul Martinez. I'm a resident of Kitsilano, and I strongly oppose this rezoning application. Let me start by mentioning that I've worked in healthcare for one of the regional health authorities for the past 17 years, uh, and I still work at that health authority. So I've read many reports, looked at lots of data, and I can say that what is being proposed here is a model that has failed before. You cannot just take an entire block from the downtown east side, flip it vertically, move it to another neighborhood, being Kitsilano or being anywhere else in the city, and expect that somehow the issues for the people in that building will just go away. By doing that, you're just moving the problem to a different part of the city, exporting the issues, therefore exposing a new area and its residents to what you already have in the downtown east side. While you might be providing a home to those people, you're keeping them in an, in an environment that is not conducive to their recovery. Their issues will not go away, 
and their new neighbors will now pay the price. By having 129 people with mental health or addiction issues in one low barrier building, you're basically creating a new hospital wing without the appropriate medical and social services required to operate it. People need supports. People need to concentrate on their needs and their recovery. You cannot, you cannot expect to heal when you're surrounded by many others going through their own crisis. You need a peaceful environment. Have a look at the women's shelter next door to where you want to build this 13-story building. It's such a different model. It's been so good for those women, and as far as I know, no incidents have occurred there. By the way, the lives of the women at this shelter might not be the same if the 13-story building goes ahead as planned. A few days ago, the housing minister said that any problems that arise with new supporting housing projects settle down within six months and then people don't, don't notice the buildings. I wonder where he got that idea from. I know you've heard it before, uh, but let me repeat it. Data provided by the DPD tell a very different story. You might be familiar with the Margaret Port Apartments. Data shows that the number of 911 calls to the block where that building is located increased by more than 1,000% from the two years before the apartments opened to the two years after it opened. And, you know, the actual number is much higher, but 1,000% is already alarming. So how's that for settling down? There are ways to provide housing to the same number of people, but you need to spread them around. You shouldn't institutionalize them. Please take the time to listen to the experts, to read more about models of care, to inform yourself about solutions that actually work. By putting 129 people in one place, you're simply ticking a box on your checklist of campaign promises without actually solving anything. Let me quote something from the BC Mental Health and Substance Use Services website. Research evidence shows that people are most likely to recover when they are supported by a family member or loved one. Now, let me ask you a question. Where do you think it will be more appropriate or appealing for a family member to visit? At a building with 129 people, each and every one of them with dealing with their own issues, or at a small shelter where there's only a handful of other people with issues. For those of you that are supporting this proposal in its current form, I have a couple of questions. Do you have children under 12? Do you even live around the area? Are you supporting this project just because you live far away from it, so what happens here doesn't affect you? Please listen to your constituents come up with a plan that will actually solve the issues of the people in need of housing, healing, and recovery. Thank you. Thanks. You do have a question, uh, Councillor Hardwick? Up to five minutes, please. Thank you very much. Just confirming that you have work in the health sciences arena. I work at a, uh, at a regional health authority. Thank you. And um, I guess the key question, based on, uh, as we keep hearing, as the science says, if that is the case, why would BC Housing want to uh, put 129 suites in such a dense, high space instead of spreading it around if the science supports that? What, what would, do you think, be the um, motivation? Um, I think the motivation is just to get it over with as quickly as possible like house 129 people. Will their issues be solved? Will they recover? I don't think so. But they might be able to say that, oh, we put a roof over their head. Okay, thank you very and much. And that will not solve the issues. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, that's it for questions from the speaker. Thanks for calling in today and sharing your thoughts on this item. And I will move to the next speaker. Uh, speaker number 57, Andrea Bellissimo. Hello. Hi there. You have up to five minutes whenever you're ready, please. Hi. Um, my name is Andrea Bezomo. I'm uh, a resident of Vancouver. I've been for many years, and uh, I'm here today um, just to voice my opposition to this proposal. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, uh, we've heard from some fantastic speakers over the course of the last couple of days. Um, both uh, for and against the proposal uh, in front of you. Um, a lot of the comments we've heard have caused me to write and then rewrite and then rewrite again my comments um, quite a few times now over the last couple of days. And uh, 
uh, there's been been many many different kind of points raised, different thoughts, different um, concerns. Um, uh, it's it's quite obvious why this proposal is inciting so much pushback. Um, the the from what I can gather, um, the main theme from those in support of the motion seems to follow the logic that because there is a dire home and homelessness crisis in Vancouver, uh, you know, therefore any housing by default is good housing. Full stop. Um, and and I, I guess if if you allow me just the opportunity to explain why why I respectfully disagree. Um, the first part obviously claims there is a dire homelessness crisis in Vancouver. Uh, is there? Absolutely. I think everyone here in support against agrees that there is a massive problem. It needs massive solutions and it needs them quickly. There is there's quite literally no debate there. Um, it's the second part that I find quite dangerous uh, because it ignores anything and everything else, uh, if I'm understanding cor- it correctly. Um, it's, it's almost like saying this project gets to, I don't know, exist in some sort of a vacuum where there is only one box to check, and that box is, does it add housing stock? Yes. Well, therefore, who cares about anything else? Uh, quality of life, for example, of the residents uh, who will live there. Quality of life or the impact on the, the surrounding neighborhood and uh, neighbors. Uh, pre-existing zoning regulations, um, you know, uh, the safety of, of the other vulnerable populations in the neighborhood that others have spoken to. Um, you know, it's almost a, nope, it adds housing stock. So why are we even talking about those other things? Um, no need to debate it, push this through. It's a, it's, you know, a non-negotiable. Um, it almost, I was trying to think of parallels and that, that might hit home. Um, and for me, it's it's almost like saying that, you know, in order to solve what is a very real climate change problem, well, the solution's easy. Let's stop driving cars, you know, eating meat, building buildings, importing and exporting goods, for example. Let's stop all traveling. There you go. Uh, <laughs> that's the solution. Unfortunately not, though, obviously. Um, by expecting this proposal to only have to check that one box, Quite frankly, I can't see it any other way than us setting ourselves up for failure. Uh, and at that, it sounds like, uh, based on other comments and other speakers and other experts, that's looking like 60 to 80 years of failure for the neighborhood. Um, the, so the, the question I'm, I'm always kind of coming back to is, is who really benefits here? Um, the, I mean, obviously, we look straight to the future residents of the building. But from what I understand, from what I've read, from what other speakers have said and I and have spoken to far better than I can, um, apparently the size, to, the, sorry, the science doesn't necessarily support that. Um, the, 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 the science, and by the science, I mean the irrefutable evidence-based peer-reviewed multi-year studies that have have been presented to council that has been spoken about in previous um, uh, by previous callers, I should say, um, does not support this model of housing. Um, uh, we, we, I guess, just a side note: we we heard from BC Housing on Tuesday night and from various other callers that there is evidence to support congregate housing being a successful approach. Um, just wanted to put it out there that I've personally asked BC Housing multiple times over the last year for that evidence, because I would love to to see it. I would love to be able to say that, yes, there is science that supports this. Uh, uh, quite frankly, I'm, I'm still waiting for that. I know they promised they would send hey, it to you, you, you the council Sorry, on Tuesday. You're at your five minutes, uh, and uh, you do have oh, questions sorry. from Councillor Hardwick. Uh, Council, just a uh, reminder that... Uh, um, uh, as I read in the script, that we need to keep videos on. Uh, and if if it, your video is off for too long a time, uh, clerks will mark you absent for this portion of the meeting. Uh, Councillor Hardwick, you have up to uh, uh, five minutes for questions to the speaker. Thank you. Um, very insightful um, remarks to us. 
What I, I think I got from it is that this is being positioned as a binary black and white argument. We have a housing crisis, we have a homelessness crisis, ergo we must have housing at all costs, damn the torpedoes, and um, shame on anyone who opposes that. Do you think, I mean, I think you're nailing it here on that, that binary response. It's either or, it's not about is this, is congregate housing working? Did, I, I guess my question to you is, did, what brought you to that realization as you analyzed the problem? Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you for the question. Um, it, it, like I said, it's, <laughs> I've, I've arrived um, at, at these comments, at that, you know, selecting those comments um, for speaking in front of you today over the course of the last two days and listening to um, the, 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 the callers that have uh, spoken and BC Housing and MPA all in support of the motion, trying to understand, you know, what is it I'm missing, uh, essentially? Um, I, 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 I failed um, to to understand until I, I realized that it is being presented as somewhat <laughs> binary. Um, love the word. Uh, it's black and white. It's either all yes or all no. And if that is your criteria, then this proposal obviously makes sense. It's, it checks that one box. Unfortunately, to the detriment and um, at, uh, while ignoring all other boxes that we as a society knew, need to ensure we're considering and acknowledging and uh, satisfying. So, so I'm not sure if that answers your question, but, uh, um, but it was in trying to understand the arguments for the proposal uh, that I that I arrived at my comments today. I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. That's it for questions for you, Speaker. So I am going to move on to the next speaker. Thanks so much for participating today. Um, Thank you. Thanks. We have Augustin uh, Marshall. Marshall. Next yep. speaker number yep. fifteen. King. Hi there. Can you uh, hear me? I Hi. can. Up to uh, five minutes, please. Hi, thank you for uh, Council for giving me this opportunity to voice my opposition to this project. Uh, I have myself a scientific background and I trust evidence-based peer-reviewed studies. And uh, a lot of peer-reviewed uh, papers talked about the difficulty to re rehab people with addiction and mental illnesses. And their guidelines are going the opposite direction than what the city has suggested suggested, sorry, um, dispersing instead of congregating. Um, but the city insists on the same congregating model that we uh, and they know does not work. It feels to me like a little bit like deciding to not vaccinate for COVID unilaterally despite science proving vaccination works. Um, the city might have experts at uh, housing-related matters, but uh, clearly not at rehab of people that we are trying to bring back among us. Some experts uh, studied it for them and their conclusion are ignored, seems like. Worse, we're about to congregate even more people than ever in the same building. For which reason, I'm absolutely not sure. Beyond the fact that science proved that congregating drug addicts and people suffering from mental illnesses doesn't work, common sense goes the same direction, to my mind. It does not take a ton of science to know what is going to happen. These people can't have the willpower or the mental capacity to take the right decision or to sort themselves out of this situation without strong support and close monitoring. Yet the city decided it was a good idea to park 129 of them together with a low barrier environment and little support, making things even harder for them. It's like me deciding to run a marathon without training and at the last minute somebody give me a 60 pound backpack to run with. What are the chances I'm going to finish that marathon? They're close to zero. Coastal Health refused to bid on this project because they already know it's not going to work. It says a lot about this project, and just that should be enough to re revisit this decision. I come from France and also lived in London in the UK for a while. Um, after the Second World War, a lot of Victorian houses that had been bombed during the war in London got replaced by some larger concrete several stories building. Mixed low-income population have been put there in the middle of wealthier and not so wealthier areas of London. 
the integration went well because the population that live in this building was mixed and not because necessarily uh, a low-income building got put in a wealthier environment. I lived in the suburb of Paris. The university study had sponsored a family of North African immigrants who live in the middle of an established community in our street and studied their integration. Again, it worked really well because they were integrated piecemeal, not 80 of them. On the other hand, France has been parking its immigrant population with a very different culture than ours, all together in very tall buildings. These areas have now have, have been ghettos for the last 20 to 30 years. The police can no longer go there. If you're an immigrant in this type of environment, your chances of succeeding are very low, and you will have to work several times harder than somebody like you and I to get yourself out of this situation. There is no integration possible this way. These ghettos live with their own rules, and they are health, heavily stigmatized by the rest of the population. Obviously, you can't compare French immigrants with our homeless situation in Vancouver, per se. But the concept is exactly the same to me. It's not because you put these people in a more stable and wealthier area of Vancouver that it will work. The problem is the content of the building, not what surrounds the building. The building is too large, and the people we are trying to bring back to more normal life are all the same. Somebody said, if I want to quit smoking, I'm not going to move in a new building that has 129 smokers. I heard somebody earlier saying that housing people saves lives, but this person forgot to elaborate on the content of the successful building they're talking about, which I think is a key here. Social housing is required everywhere, everywhere in Vancouver. We all know that. So to be successful, we need to collaborate with all experts available. We can't build something in a hurry with public money and think we will deal with the problem later, especially when we already experience this problem elsewhere in the city with small congregate of the same people. Collaborating on this is an opportunity for Vancouver to maintain its reputation to be one of the most livable cities in the world. The opposite could lead lead us in a structural decline comparable to what is now happening in San Francisco, even though the root of the problem is slightly different. I implore the city to open their mind to other ideas like a smaller building with a sound mix of elderly, families in need, single mom, and a small amount of homeless suffering, addiction, or mental illness. We pay taxes for you to use our money wisely. A warehouse for homeless is not wise and is an offense to human dignity for a lot of people like me. We can't accept the project the way it is now. I'm asking you to reject it. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen to my request. Thanks. You do have questions from Councillor Dominato. Councillor Dominato, please go ahead. Uh, thanks, Mayor, and thanks for calling in today. Um, I didn't catch at the beginning. Were you citing your own research or were you citing secondary research with respect to housing? And uh, No, I, 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 I've done a quick PubMed and there are like hundreds of articles. I'm not reading through the articles. But okay, I know so it, you, you it, just it did your little so bit of... Yeah. Sort of a, yeah, a light just like dive from into like the, what's from yeah, exactly. Okay, no, I appreciate that. I just wanted to clarify that I wasn't clear at the beginning. Um, I guess the other question I have for you. That, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I was just saying, like, and this is something that we've heard quite a few times. Uh, Dr. Summers actually uh, uh, presented himself that I had like over a hundred papers that are talking about this. Yes, yes, uh, he's been referenced several times. Um, I can say the question I have for you is you because you referenced that research and congregate model, um, and what I heard was you'd indicated that your understanding was that um, that um, individuals of uh, that would have all the same vulnerabilities would be um, housed through this initiative. But are you aware that we actually have support of housing throughout the city that actually looks at a mixed model, recognizing that um, people have different needs and that um, a mix does uh, make a lot of sense and actually helps people thrive? Yes. I, I mean, like, this so is my So you are aware that that is a, you know. a tenanting model that's yeah. used by operators? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's been used, and I don't understand why it's not used here. Okay. I'm I'm not sure that that's the case, but we'll certainly clarify that with BC Housing and with the proposed operator. So, But I appreciate you calling in. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. That's it for questions for you. Thank you so much for calling in and sharing your views today. Uh, I'm going to move to the next speaker, who is speaker number 59, Margarita Vasquez. Hello. Can you hear me? Hi. Yeah, so just wondering, uh, we do we are required to ask if folks uh, live in the city or not. I'm just wondering, uh, that's not indicated on the form. Uh, are you a resident of Vancouver? I I was a resident of Vancouver for 22 years. I just moved out, um, okay. but I lived oh, there fine. for 22 years. That's, yeah, that's cool. Thanks. And you have up to five minutes whenever you're ready. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Margarita Vasquez, and I oppose the rezoning of um, application for the site on 2086 uh, and 2098 on West 7th Avenue. I have been a long-term resident of Vancouver for the last 22 years, most recently living on 12th Avenue, just four blocks away from the proposed supportive housing project. I must admit, I had to look up the low barrier terminology and supportive housing and many other terms when I first learned about this project because for an average citizen like myself, these definitions are not very clear and not very easy to find. But after much research, I understand now that low barrier means that the tenants on this 13th floor building, predominantly men, as the applicants have targeted, will not be provided with any clinical support on site for recovery for mental health and addiction issues. As an average citizen raising two boys, <laughs> I find this very responsible to not have this site oriented as recovery just 20 meters, 20 meters from an elementary school and the park that I usually take my children to play on weekends. BC Housing has mentioned during this consultation that other quote-unquote successful supportive housing projects are located within 500 meters of the school. But let's be very specific here. This one in particular will be located only at 20 meters from a school. This site will also be one block away from the 99 bus station where I used to stand every morning at 6.30 a.m. to go to work. As a woman, I felt I feel it is already unsafe to wait for transit in this particular area, particularly in the middle of the winter. Sorry, Excuse speaker, me? I'm just gonna pause you there for a second. Uh, Councillor Swanson, what's your, uh, what, what clause are you citing for your points of order? 7.5. And what is your matter uh, contained in report? The matter has to re has to refer to what's contained in the report. Okay, I I've heard. I'm gonna let the speaker continue. I didn't hear anything that was outside what we've heard from either in the report or what was reported by um, the the applicant in their explanation. So, but I will keep a a close uh, ear on things. Uh, speaker, please continue. Thank you, Mayor. My point is that I stand on that bus station for many, many, many um, months uh, in the middle of the winter, sometimes when it was very dark outside, and when there's only a handful of people waiting for the bus with you. So on one side, uh, you want us to uh, Vancouverize to become a greener city and to encourage the use of transit. But on the other end, you're considering housing more tenants than are recommended by DC Housing and Cost of Mental Health for success with an unknown ratio of support and hoping that public safety won't be an issue. This proposal, as it is proven by the rise of 1,700% in calls for response to emergency at compatible sites, could serve to deteriorate what we perceive is safe, child-filled neighborhood. I urge you not to succumb to the pressures of BC Housing and ask them to reevaluate what actually makes sense for this area. For example, early this year, I learned about the great work of Dixon Transition Society. This is a place for women and their children to escape from domestic violence. Women are given an apartment for two years, and during that period, they, recall, they receive counseling, legal support, financial education, and all the necessary tools to prepare for an independent life when they graduate from the program. However, I also learned that in 2021, 1,600 women are children seeking to escape violence and seeking support were turned away due to lack of space. We just don't have enough places to play with women. It was an increase from the previous year when 1,300 women and children were turned away. A few of you councillors have asked previous speakers what would they like to see in the proposed space for rezoning. I believe a home inclusive for women and women-led families such as this one that I'm posing as an example will thrive in our community. Thank you. Thank you for your time today. I don't see any uh, questions for you, so just want to thank you for calling in and sharing your views. Um, you. Next speaker is speaker number 60, Mary Elizabeth Burke. Yes, my name is Mary Burke. Um, I live in Fairview uh, near VGH, and I oppose the report uh, recommendations. As there have been many speakers before me who have spoken so eloquently to the issues of this proposal, I will address just one point 
for my complete lack of support for the proposal as it is set out at present. I have worked in healthcare for over 40 years, and in that time, I've witnessed a decreasing care for patients. The focus seems to be more on getting people through the system and out without optimal care, pushing them out of hospital too fast with not a lot of uh, community resources that are difficult to access for these people. I find that I feel that this plan uh, for this project falls under that same lack of caring for the people it purports to want to help. Studies have shown, and I know you've been told the studies, I'm not going to repeat, uh, that the model doesn't work. It is not what these vulnerable people would choose for themselves. I think they deserve much better. They deserve a plan that's been proven to work and gives them hope for their future. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time today. I, I don't see any questions for you, so we'll just move on to the, the next speaker. Although, uh, Speaker, I have a question for you. Uh, since you work in healthcare, and, and I often don't ask questions, but if uh, uh, you're concerned about the care that's provided in the, in the building, and I, I understand your point, I'm just thinking, like, if these folks are coming out of a homeless situation where they're where they're living rough, do you still think that's um, better than living in a say a, a a housing situation that doesn't have the level of care that perhaps you think they should require? No, I think we should be building something that's going to work for them. I, I uh, this has been a problem for years. And all of a sudden, um, it, I think they were being pushed to do something very quickly when it should have been, this should have been going on for years. We've made them wait for years. Um, I think we need to, it needs to be a better plan. Um, but think, here we are yeah. with, with this choice in front of us and, uh, you know, with, with a, a funded dry space as opposed to someone living rough, but, but you think, this isn't the, the model and that we should wait for for some other opportunities for them? Yes, I do. I, I, I've i offered patients places and they don't want them. There's, they want a place that, um, and I found, I've actually found places for patients to live, which is not, was not part of my job description. Um, but, but they want a, a safe place to live. They want a good place to live. And, um, so I, you know, and they, they're willing to wait for it. I think we need to do, we need to follow things like the um, Housing First Project in Houston, Texas, that has been very successful at, at housing people. And down, and I was listening to a um, Michael, uh, oh, I've got his name somewhere, um, some, the New York, Michael Kimmelman of the New York Times, and they did a project down there, hugely successful, and they put people in apartments. But again, as um, uh, was mentioned earlier, in buildings with a general population, this is what they want. They want to be in the general population, um, and this is what they've done in Houston, Texas. And they've funded them, and some for one year, some for longer. And and they're finding success there, and other cities um, are following suit. I'm not a big fan of the United States, but I, I, in this case, I think they're doing something positive. And what they did do was all these um, community or these um, societies um, have gotten together and shared their data, shared their, inf the, the inf their information with each other and worked together, and they cut bureaucracy to make this happen. So, uh, yes, I think people would wait. Um, okay, I did, I did hear that podcast. I did listen to that podcast too. So thanks for for bringing it up, and thanks for uh, sharing your thoughts today. And uh, we're going to move to the next speaker. Thank you, Mayor. I have Thank a point much. of procedure before we move to the next speaker. This doesn't refer to the last speaker, but um, uh, uh, we okay. have heard a number of previous speakers suggest that tenants in the building would um, be a threat to the neighborhood, and it it's my interpretation that that under Section seven point five would be um, out of order because it it isn't related to anything in the report, but I just wanted to clarify or or, uh, or hear from you on that before raising that as a point of order if it should come up with a future speaker. Yeah, I'm, I am, uh, just so I can explain how I'm chairing, I am 
uh, trying to allow as um, you know as much leeway for for speakers as possible. Um, and uh, council may find fault with this, but if if I kind of have a somebody drift into the gray zone in a minor way, I tend to let that go. But when it gets um, when it becomes obviously um, uh, unacceptable, that's when I'll interrupt speakers. But uh, I, if if councillors find that I'm providing too much leeway, then you're more than welcome to uh, jump in with points of order. So uh, we're all trying to navigate this this uh, very complex uh, uh, project, and so I appreciate the the questions and any uh, and and for us to work together as a team to kind of uh, figure out how to best navigate through our uh, the uh, 200 remaining speakers. So, so thanks. Uh, so I hope that explanation is, is sufficient, and I will keep a an ear out for that, noting that uh, it's something that uh, you think violates the, the the procedural bylaw. Okay, appreciate that. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks. Okay, Council. We're uh, next. We're on. Uh, uh, get on. Pardon me. Councillor Hardwick, did you have a... Yes, I'm sorry, Mayor. I was just trying to, uh, on a similar uh, uh, point of privilege, um, I, just as I hear one, one side uh, demonizing uh, potential uh, occupants, so too do I hear uh, the other side, if it were, uh, de demonizing people uh, in the neighbourhood for their positions, so I'm, I'm just would like to ensure that uh, that your ears are open to both. That's all. Yep. Thank you. Yes, I did notice one speaker did that. Uh, yes. Did it once, and so I thought if it continued, I would interrupt, and almost did, but then it drifted back to where it should be. So, uh, and I I feel like if 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 any council members think um, uh, disagree with the approach of you kind of have. Uh, people can slip, but, you know, nervous and often uh, when they're in these uh, hearings. Uh, but if they go too far, I'll try to steer them back in. But uh, appreciate prompting as long as it's not uh, all the time, uh, uh, you know, which would disrupt the, the speaking uh, flow. So, but I do note your point, uh, Councillor Hardwick. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, speaker number 61 is uh, Jack in, uh, Jack in, uh, Jacinta Lawton. Um, Mayor, members of council, um, my name is Jacinta Lawton. Close, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, I'm speaking. I'm speaking today um, as a, a prosecutor, a criminal prosecutor, uh, with uh, over 25 years of prosecuting. Uh, a lot of that, most of that, in fact, uh, at the provincial courthouse on the downtown east side. I'm also a resident. A resident of uh, the neighborhood, uh, specifically within two blocks of this proposed development. And I'm also uh, someone who has children who went to the elementary school that we've all been talking about. They also went to that little toddler park, uh, Delamont Park. Um, listening to the proceedings, um, and, and I, I struggled to come up with something that might be useful and different to assist the council, councillors in, in making their decision. Um, it is a, a really quite a narrow decision that you have to make, and that is to decide whether or not you're going to allow uh, for this, uh, uh, this lot, RM4, to be rezoned to a CD1. Um, and I, I looked that up uh, and I, um, in endeavouring to assist you to do that. Um, RM4, the way it's currently zoned right now, is uh, designed, and I'm quoting from the website, your website, is designed to encourage the retention of existing development of six-story social housing apartment buildings. And as we know, um, you've heard lots about uh, there's one, a couple of blocks for um, people who have physical mobility issues and elderly who struggle to find housing, and um, it fits in beautifully with the neighborhood. Um, and uh, that is what the current zoning is. Um, what's proposed um, is a 50% increase in density and an increase from six maximum stories to 13, which, as we've heard, equivalent equivalates, if that's a word, to 17 stories in height. 
Um, I'm not going to talk about shadows and uh, the other things you've heard from experts on that, but I am going to say that in making this decision, it's a, it's a big one. It's a big change. Um, and so when you're looking at this application, especially in face of the tsunami of local concern and legitimate questions about the use of uh, the, the property, that looking at this application, I should imagine the council is uh, uh, shocked and disappointed with its lack of substance, lack of specifics, uh, lack of real answers to legitimate questions. Everybody who's called in wants to end homelessness. It is intellectually dishonest to couch this debate as something that involves people who are against homelessness. Everybody wants to end it. I mean, rather, anybody who's not against homelessness, everybody wants to end it. But the question for you is whether this project in this place is the right way to go. And we've heard lots of evidence about this experiment failing, and we've got an example of it failing, respectfully, just down the road in the form of the Marguerite Ford building. Um, people's concern about how this is going to be used, how this property is going to be used if it's developed in the way it's proposed is legitimate. To deny that there's an intersect between drug addiction and crime is naive. That's not an insult. I'm not insulting people that battle with drug addiction, but that connection is live. It drives a lot of property crime to feed a drug addiction. That's just reality. And uh, to suggest that it's uh, somehow histrionic, Mayor, to, to uh, ask to ask that there be crim criminal record checks on a development of this kind is is not fair. It's the, the people are coming together to voice their legitimate concerns, and in my respectful submission, um, the council have been very good about hearing about that. And it should be that if this development is going to go ahead, that there should be answers to that concern by the applicant. And I looked at the application, and the application includes concerns about safety. That's actually something that the applicant purports to address in their presentation to you, members of council. Their response to safety concerns uh, and let's face it, when we're talking about zoning, we're talking about not only the type of building, but also the use for which the building will be put. So in those safety concerns, the applicant responds with this, quote, communities benefit on financial, social, and equity objectives by providing people who are experiencing homelessness with support services. With respect, I'm not sure what that even means. I know that what it doesn't say is that there will be this number of ratio of uh, support workers uh, to the number of residents. There will be this amount of square footage devoted to support and counseling services. There are this number of uh, community resources available from this location. Uh, with the greatest respect to the work that MPA does, and I know I've worked with them, um, I, I, I there are, were no specifics are, offered. You are over event. your time. May I just say in conclusion, you're, Mr. Mayor, we have an opportunity You're well here. over your time. Uh, it's five minutes. Together. You're, you're at five minutes. You're well over five minutes. Fine. So, I, And you don't have questions, so I just want to thank you so much for uh, phoning in tonight and sharing your views. Uh, Next uh, speaker is uh, 63, Erica Picardo. Uh, uh, speaker 62 is on the line. Oh, I'm sorry. I've missed uh, 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 Dar uh, Dharmesh uh, Makwana. Hi. Uh, so first, thank you uh, to the mayor and council for granting me the opportunity to speak. Um, I've done my best to keep up with most speakers, so please forgive me if I'm repeating points made by others. Uh, my name is Dar Makwana. I'm a resident of East Kitsilano, and I'm opposed to the rezoning of the site at Arbutus and 7th and 8th Avenues because of its scale and density. Uh, to try to keep in line with the focus of the public hearing, I believe the impact of the surrounding public space is the key reason this proposal should be sent back for further reevaluation. Uh, so you know I'm the full-time caregiver to my two-year-old son, and because of that, my submission is small and narrow uh, from that perspective. Uh, part of our routine when weather allows is to go to Delamont Park for an hour or so in the morning. Um, this is a large and vibrant community of parents, grandparents, caregivers, and children who use that space 
uh, for their well-being. Uh, I think the current demands placed on that public space and the possible demands of the proposed building's residents will likely be in conflict. Uh, for context, BC Housing has repeatedly affirmed that this development is one of low-barrier rooms for at-risk people, uh, perhaps struggling with addiction. Uh, BC Housing has also repeated that the residents will be able to consume as they see fit inside the building. Uh, until BC Housing can clarify the nature of supports available, I think it's entirely reasonable to believe that the new residents will also have the opportunity to do the same outside of the building. Uh, there's plenty of anecdotal evidence that shows playgrounds can be sites for users to inject drugs, and there have been plenty of complaints from parents who share this particular type of public space all around our city. Uh, these complaints aren't new. Uh, they go back for many years. Uh, when complaints are made, often through lines of communication like, say, 311, immediate action doesn't follow. Uh, instead, it is parents who are forced to sweep for needles, garbage, clothes, condoms, waste, and other items. Uh, I haven't heard of any coordination between the city and the parks board uh, as, as to how best to maintain Delamont Park in light of this proposal. And generally, I would say that the persistence of spent drug paraphernalia being left in parks across the entire city needs more attention. Uh, this is a safety risk uh, that has become another cost of raising children in Vancouver. Uh, to be clear, this cost never should be, have been placed on any parent in any neighborhood uh, in the first place. So this isn't a west side, east side thing. No parent anywhere uh, should have to deal with this. Uh, I don't think, I don't know if this message reaches you often enough, um, but it is hard to be a working family uh, raising a kid in Vancouver without affordable supports. A public space like this, like this one, is vital to our success as parents and for the success of these children. Uh, to compromise the nature of the, that public space is problematic, to say the least. Uh, the other reason I think this proposal needs to be reevaluated is that there's been little discussion or indication that improvements to pedestrian infrastructure will be made. Um, as the use of e-mobility options increases, so too does the risk for pedestrians sharing paths like the Arbutus Greenway. Uh, to be clear to me, pedestrians are parents pushing a stroller, uh, walking the dog while carrying groceries, or the toddler or child uh, walking beside their parent. Um, I've already experienced enough close calls to know there needs to be a second look. Um, a second look needs to be taken at traffic control and capacity if e-mobility users um, continue to grow, um, as the rate suggests. Uh, there's also been no discussion of increasing pede pedestrian safety on Arbutus, um, and I say this not as a call for adding more bike lanes uh, to the street. Uh, as someone who sp spends time with the toddler at Delamont, I've come to learn that Arbutus is a key north-south corridor for garbage, delivery, and other heavy trucks to service the area uh, south of Broadway. I've also seen firsthand how inadequate designated crosswalks are in getting drivers to stop on the opposite side of the intersection. Uh, cars and trucks tend to be crossing behind me before I can get my son's stroller touching the opposite sidewalk. Uh, the same goes for cyclists on 7th Avenue crossing Arbutus. Uh, I believe to approve a plan of this scope also requires concurrent approval of new pedestrian safety measure, measures, uh, such as wider sidewalks, a larger sidewalk dips, pedestrian court controlled intersections, and more street lighting. Uh, as someone who pushes a stroller regularly up and down Arbutus, uh, those improvements are already needed up to 12th Avenue from 4th. Uh, right now, the plan is to drop in 129 new residents, almost all pedestrians or cyclists, uh, who will be relying on paths and sidewalks that are well overdue for renewal. Um, I hope you consider these points when casting your vote. Thank you. Thanks for your time today. Uh, I don't see any questions for you, so I'm going to move to the next speaker. We have now we have uh, Erica Picardo, speaker number 63. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, you're a little faint, uh, but please go ahead. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, Council. My name is Erica Picardo. I have lived on the west side of Vancouver for 11 years and have two young kids who attend school in Kitsilano, close to the proposed corner housing site. I vehemently oppose the current plan. A 13 story tower consisting of 129 single occupancy units is a severe cost for concern. From listening in on the hearing, it is very clear and little thought has gone into this development. For starters, you have no idea on the staff to resident ratio you'd be looking to implement. The main details are planned to be worked on later. Great, speaker, you you um you're 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 a little unclear. I'm just wondering. It sounds like you're on a cell phone. If you might, uh, if it's possible to move to a, a an area where where it's a little more clear, that would be great. Uh, is this better? Uh, we can try oh. it. Yep, go ahead. Okay. Um, for starters, you have no idea on the staff to resident ratios you'd be looking to implement. Design details are planned to be worked on later. MPA has not operated a building this size, and the neighborhood has not been given clear details on who will be housed here. 
A statement was made earlier in the hearing indicating older men are the targeted group for housing. So women and children are just left out of the equation when this neighborhood is designed for them. We are left to guess on so much while the city conveniently informs us they will make decisions at a later date. It's abundantly clear that our concerns have never mattered. Aging housing also implies that many point of privilege. Uh, speaker, we, we are still having a, a difficult time uh, hearing you. Uh, your your signal is unclear. Um, okay. So I, I don't I, know what else I, I can do for you. Back? Can I, uh, sure. I try falling back? Okay. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. And we'll just move to the next speaker and clerks will note that. Thank you. Okay, Council, we're going to move to the next speaker. Uh, and clerks, just keep your ear open for uh, speaker number 63, Erica Picardo. We're going to move to Jason uh, Arnija. Jason Arnija. Speaker 64. Uh, speaker 64 is disconnected. Thank you. Speaker number 65 is Sheila Vizzi. Hello. Hi there. You have up to uh, five minutes to speak to council. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, councillors. My name is Sheila Vizzi, and I oppose this rezoning application in this current form. My primary objective or objection focuses on the safety of the most vulnerable group in our society, the children. Homeless people are not the only vulnerable group to be considered for this proposal. On the first night, the applicant could not state what the tenant composition, what services there would be, what is the staff-tenant ratio, and what is the operational budget. Today, I'm even more dismayed about the proposed building as, uh, as before. Uh, Mr. Eby, Minister of BC Housing, is quoted as, I hope to address as many of the concerns as I can before opening day. And after opening day, if any issues that come up, to reassure them that we'll be there to take action if it's necessary. The word if implies a possibility of a harmful situation. Mr. Eby may not even be reelected to follow through with his promises. Both the referral report and the applicants didn't offer any mitigating actions to appease the neighborhood, na neighborhood's concern prior to this opening day. What are the mitigation actions proposed to ensure that no drug paraphernalia uh, will be found near the school or in the park or greenway? Will there be a community police station or a 24-7 security staff patrolling the vicinity of the building and the SkyTrain station? What are the assurances that the tenants will not, uh, I, I guess, uh, um, attack, for the lack of a better word, children, gonna, women, I, or... I am, I, speaker, I am going to stop you there. Uh, again, we're, we're talking about the form of development, and I have let you kind of go and uh, speak about uh, in a general way, but, uh, you know, uh, saying that residents of a building will potentially attack somebody else is, is just out of line, so I would just kind of uh, try to modify your language, please. Um, all right. Uh, thank you for correcting me. Um, so what are the insurances that uh, the neighborhood could be uh, have the security uh, to walk around the greenway or the neighborhood. Um, and the other point is I haven't heard um, any of the voices of the BC Minister for Public Safety or the Minister of Education on this project. So, dear councillors, unfortunately, this huge decision lands at your feet. The safety of 500-plus vulnerable children in every neighborhood needs to be a primary concern of all the elected and appointed officials who make these decisions. In addition, children need sunshine, light, warmth when they play outside the schoolyard or playground. As demonstrated by Stephen Bogus, city staff did not do their due diligence 
on reporting the shadow studies impacting the school. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your time and for calling in today and, and sharing your views. Uh, I am, uh, Council, going to go back now to Erica Picardo, who seems to be on a different uh, line. Uh, speaker number 63, Erica Picardo. Hi, Mayor. Uh, can you hear me loud and clear? Yeah, that's, that's much better. Thanks so much. Okay. We'll restart your timer okay. and away. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Council. My name is Erica Picardo. I've lived on the west side of Vancouver for 11 years and have two young kids who attend school in Kitsilano, close to the proposed supportive housing site. I vehemently oppose the current plan. A 13-story tower consisting of 129 single occupancy units is a severe cause for concern. From listening in on the hearing, it is very clear little thought has gone into this development. For starters, you have no idea on the staff-to-resident ratios you'd be looking to implement. Design details are planned to be worked on later. MPA has not operated a building this size, and the neighborhood has not been given clear details on who will be housed here. A statement was made earlier in the hearing indicating older men are the targeted group for housing. So my question is, women and children are just left out of the equation when this neighborhood is designed for them? We are left to guess on so much, while the city conveniently informs us they will make decisions at a later date. It's abundantly clear that our concerns have never mattered. BC Housing also implies that many groups, including the VPD, were consulted for this project. I have a written email directly from VPD, which explicitly states, and I quote, it is important for you to know the VPD had not been consulted, nor were we a part of any decision-making process with the city slash BC Housing, end quote. Listen to our voices. There are over 500 elementary school children within 20 meters of this site, a women's recovery house next door, and a toddler park also located within 20 meters. I ask you this, where is the compassion for these vulnerable groups? Where is the empathy for parents who will fear what their kids could be exposed to? How can you be confident that the proposed development would be safe and secure and that reported drug use or violent incidents would not happen more often than they do now? You cannot. A building of this size, of this magnitude, does not conform to the neighborhood. It sticks out and leaves many of us utterly concerned over safety. Rather than integrating these individuals into communities, you are further fueling the stigma and discrimination against those who need support. I believe the proposed plan does not provide opportunities for a sense of normalcy to these individuals. Not to mention the neighborhood has been given zero reassurance, no consideration, and has been forced to live with a severe lack of communication, all of which has been incredibly disappointing. Now is the time for introspection. Rethink how we support people in BC. Because to me, this simply feels like you're taking the failed housing model of the downtown east side and bringing it here. It feels like you're ticking a box to house a high concentration of residents with serious issues. It is so unfitting and it demonstrates your callousness towards taxpayers. If you genuinely wanted to make a difference, you would work with the neighborhood. Listen to our input and the experts like Dr. Julian Summers. I urge you to please go back to the drawing board, come up with a better plan, or find a more suitable site away from a school. Please do better. Thank you for your time. Thank you for uh, your input. I don't see any uh, questions for you, so I am going to uh, move on to the next speaker. Uh, speaker number 66, Gustavo uh, Marin. We have uh, Gustavo Marin, speaker number 66. Yeah, can you hear me? Sure can. Uh, just, uh, I'm required to ask under the uh, procedural bylaws if you're a resident of Vancouver. Or are you uh, are you a resident? It's just not noted on the sheet. Um, I am not a resident of Vancouver, but I am speaking on behalf of my children and my wife and myself, who are residents of Vancouver, and my daughter does attend the school across the street. Sure, you could. Uh, yeah, it's 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 just a small thing we ask, and uh, please go ahead up to five minutes. Uh, my name is Gustavo Mer uh, First of all, good evening, Mayor Stewart and members of council. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. My name is Gustavo Marine. I speak on behalf of myself, my children, and their mother, which I've already mentioned, residents of Vancouver. My eight-year-old daughter attends the elementary school adjacent to the proposed site. Let me be clear that we are opposed to the rezoning of 7th and Arbutus in its current form. Please do not interpret my opposition to this rezone as, in, as not wanting to help these people, but rather an opposition directed to the manner in which is unfolding, which is unbelievable. Through my opposition, I'm saying no so that we get to a better yes, a yes that looks at our vulnerable, all the vulnerable populations that are involved here, and a better yes that is effective in achieving what we're trying to achieve. 
to help and better the lives of these people through proper integration. I had a beautiful five-minute and one-second speech prepared, but I had to rewrite it because of unbelievable concerns that came up in, in, uh, in the evening and in the initial comments uh, that were raised by the applicant. Since I only have five minutes, I'm just going to highlight the most concerning. Number one, the proposal includes unsupervised injection sites and no screening for violent residents. How does this make any sense with the vulnerable communities of the elementary school children, the women, the women of Sancta Maria House, and some of which have suffered physically and sexual abuse and some who are recovering from addiction and the toddler park? How does this not introduce new problems? How does this help the vulnerable people that need to be considered, all the vulnerable people that need to be considered? This concern makes me wonder what kind of planet I live on. Number two, on this note, Heidi, uh, Heidi Hartman, BC Housing, said that there was a number of supporting houses within half a kilometer of the school um, in previous uh, projects. Um, but what we're talking about here is across the street, 20 meters, and a large number of units that would be directly overlooking the schoolyard. How does this make any sense is, is my question here. Number three, why is a site like, like this proposed within proximity of two other vulnerable groups, namely um, uh, the Sancta Maria House and the Toddler Park? Why, are, why isn't something that focuses on housing families in this site not being considered? And the monies that were uh, described in the, in, the, in the first evening that are able to move to, to elsewhere that could house um, the target audience that is being put here. Number four, Nick Blackman of MPA stated that we take pride, and I quote, we take pride in our community relationships, end quote. However, virtually none of the recommendations from the school or the Kitsilano Coalition were considered. Particularly, I would like to highlight that the, cool, that the school represents hundreds of individuals, and yes, they have little voices, but those little voices do matter. Can Mr. Blackman and or the applicant outline the recommendations from the school that were actually considered? I think not. I would um, implore that the counselors uh, um, the review the, the considerations that were that were actually considered because none of them were. Number five, James Forsyth from BC Housing says in his introduction, "Open quote: These people need homes. These people need housing." And they need to integrate and contribute. Emphasis added into their community and neighborhood. Close quote. How can I? How can a proposal that does not consider the community even have a chance of having its residents, and I mean the residents uh, in, in this proposed building, accepted by that community? How could they not be further stigmatized? Uh, Nick Blackman, MPA, is, in his words, we seek, or sorry, um, he says that a society inclusive of people with mental illness to be able to participate fully within their community, a plan that does not consider its neighbors, um, it will never be a successful integration because there is a piece here that's missing is the consideration of the integration of these people. Um, they will be stigmatized right from the get-go, these people, not for their issues, but rather how they arrived there with a flawed housing plan. Is this the help that, we're gonna, that the applicant is proposing to give to these people to put them in a place where they're not going to feel like they belong? They, they can feel like they belong if this whole plan is scrapped and rethought out. And finally, my biggest concern was with response to Councillor Swanson. She mentioned some, um, I'll say open quote, but it was something like this, a theory of the effect of congregated people with mental issues. This question was asked again by Councillor Hardwick. First, this is not a theory, but rather a study comprising 17 years of work. In a first instance, Mr. Blackwick avoided a solid answer to this question when asked by Councillor Swanson. In a second instance, there was hesitancy in answering um, this question at all uh, when, when Councillor Hardwick asked the same question. When Heidi Hartman finally got um, up and answered, she provided one example on Vancouver Island with a much smaller building population. Now, let's, uh, let's flip the coin here a bit. Brian, Brian Palmquist um, unlike the ap applicant, is giving tangible data that this is a bad idea in conjunction with uh, Dr. Summers' uh, findings. Will council mandate the con that these concerns be properly addressed and for real data to be used instead of generalizations and cherry-picking information by the applicant? Okay, Thanks, during speaker, the pandemic, right, we you're regularly... You are, sorry, you are at your five minutes. Uh, so uh, uh, you do have questions from uh, Councillor Swanson. Uh, Councillor Swanson, go ahead up to five minutes. Yeah, I am um, 
going to read you a quote. No, I, well, we just got to make sure it's a question, Councillor Swanson. And then I'm going to ask you who said it. So yeah. the quote is oh, Housing Sorry. First, it's very short. Okay. Housing First in scattered and congregate formats is capable of achieving housing stability among people experiencing major mental illness and chronic homelessness. Only congregate housing first was associated with improvements on select secondary outcomes. Sit long, Councillor Swanson. Like so this is, these are cl clarifying who questions. Said that? I don't know who said the quote. Pardon? I, I do not know. know who said that quote. Okay. It was Julian Summers. In this okay. uh, quote that, from that like study, a randomized trial examining housing. Okay. Councillor Swanson, it does sound like permit. debate, so I, I am going to just stop you there and thank the speaker for coming in and uh, just move on to, I think, one final yeah. speaker before our dinner break. Thanks, speaker, for coming in. Uh, we do have uh, Charlene Kettlewell, uh, speaker number 67. I have a point of procedure merits, Councillor Kirby Young. Okay, Councillor Kirby Young, go ahead. Thank you. I'm just looking for your guidance in reminding Council um, in terms of asking questions and listening to speakers that it is our responsibilities and not to keep an open mind and hear all the speakers and not reflect and infer a position that we may or may not have already taken on this matter because I feel that Council are stepping into showing their perspective. Not really. A, it's a bit. It, the. Uh, what we're supposed to be doing during questions to speakers is to ask clarifying questions. So I have noticed uh, that's not always the case with all the questions, but I will um, reinforce that uh, as we go through because we still have lots of folks. So and I do know this is hard, uh, you know, as we're trying to make up our minds through this to hear all the uh, anxiety and and people working through their own thoughts. But I think council's doing a good job. So uh, let's just keep uh, moving on. But uh, just to be clear, my clarification to you is that it, we are required to keep an open mind one way or the other until we've concluded hearing from all the speakers. Is that correct? Uh, sure. Yes, that that's right. Okay. Um, Thank you. But also the questions during this part of the procedure are really for clarification. Thank you very okay. much. Charlene uh, Kettlewell, speaker number 67. Sorry, I just got a note from the clerks here. Are you okay? Oh, yes, great. Go ahead. Uh, I believe you're in person, so uh, please go ahead. <laughs> Good day, Honorable Mayor and Council. My name is Charlene Kettlewell. I'm a mother of four who attend school in the neighborhood of the proposed building. After 18 months of listening and learning about homelessness and housing options, I have come to be a staunch advocate for inclusive models, and I am in opposition to this rezoning application. The applicants asserted that only 3% of homeless children, so of the homeless have children, thereby justifying the use of single rooms only. However, an SFU Center for Applied Research in Mental Health and Addictions local study shows fully 25% of the 500 homeless individuals who participated actually had children under the age of 19. Many of those suffering homelessness have to place their children in care of others, and, and as such, the children are invisible to the point-in-time surveys. By offering only studio suites, the Seventh and Arbutus Project, as well as the King Edward and Knight Project, and the other three projects that BC Housing is currently proposing, all will exclude 25% of the homeless population that have children. For the immediate 424 units in the BC Housing Supportive Model Pipeline, Individuals with children in Vancouver will have to make the heartbreaking decision to place their children in government care or with family members if they wish to live in any of these permanent projects. This acts as a systemic barrier to housing for those 25% of the homeless who have minor children. It was contained within the referral report and was repeated on June 28th by the applicants that women would not be the target demographic for this site. And this aim presents a direct restriction to access for housing. 
This proposition does not support the city's equity strategy aimed at making Vancouver a place where all women have a full access to the resources provided. In 2018, over 2,000 homeless were counted, 1,330 of which were living in temporary domestic violence shelters. Those were predominantly women. According to the Downtown Eastside Women's Shelter, since the beginning of the pandemic, there has been a significant increase for those women needing safe refuge as gender-based violence and increased, had increased substantially and people had lost access to support services. No consideration was given to an alternative composition for this site, one that could serve women and women-led families, an unfulfilled need. On June 28th, the applicants said that no data could be provided to council to assure them that there was those homeless in Kitsilano that would be a priority for the site. Given that BC Housing Project for 40 women-led families, just three blocks from the proposed site, could be threatened with dem eviction pursuant to the Broadway plan, with no promise of replacement, as well as an immediate opportunity right next door to provide housing to the vulnerable women and women-led families exiting the stage two recovery home, I would think this would have been top of mind and a fixed need that planners would prioritize. The number of units planned for this project is well in excess of 40 to 50 units contemplated in the provincial government's 2017 rapid response to homelessness program framework. If density is the target, build 50 units, inclusive of families, which could reach or even exceed the 129 total individuals housed. North Vancouver has approved this model for Lloyd and 16th site, which is near schools in a residential neighborhood and is built with a welcoming wood frame structure that includes a playground on site. Residents of Kitsilano have raised the North Vancouver model with both BC Housing and the City of Vancouver as an excellent model for 7th and Arbutus. In summary, I believe this model is helpless, helpless to those most in need in Kitsilano within the immediate vicinity of the site and at risk, current risk of homelessness. It is unmanageable, unmanageable in size. It is its exclusive tenanting aims is a lasting systemic barrier to entry for many, too many. And when the population of homeless women, women-led families are faced with eviction, homelessness, violence, and worse, this is not the time to discriminate by exclusion. I urge you to not give up on your opportunity to influence the success of this site. And if you have any doubt about this ability to succeed exactly as proposed, then I urge you to send it back at this juncture for revision so that it can be a success. Thank you. Thanks very much for your comments. Uh, we do uh, have a question for you, but I'm going to need a motion to. Um... So move, Councillor Dijanova. Just one second, Councillor Dijanova. Uh, I'm just looking at a message from the clerks. Uh, so we also have a speaker who's waiting in chambers. Uh, so I'm wondering if we could extend to both finish questions for this uh, speaker and then hear the speaker that's sitting in chambers waiting. We'll we can move the motion for that. As well. We have a seconder for that. Thank Anyone? you, Councillor Bly. Thank you, Councillor Bly. All in favor, yay. Okay. Yeah. Any opposed? Great. Okay, Councillor Hardwick, uh, you can go ahead with your questions to the speaker. Thank you. I've been thinking about your remarks as you've gone through, and I, it kind of took me back to first principles. This is land that the city owns, that the city put out to, uh, to find an entity to build uh, housing on, and BC Housing stepped into that role, and then put out a bit, uh, seeking an operator to operate that building. So if we go back to first principles and your point about um, women and equity, um, would your recommendation then be to go back to those first principles? Maybe this is something that we then ask BC, BC Housing and the uh, potential operator if they could adjust their thinking to be aligned with what you're suggesting. Is that what you'd like to see happen? Yes, I would suggest that if simply, as was done in Victoria, with a similar project that was right across the street from the school, it's the only one in the province that we actually currently have with that closest proximity. How and why it worked was because BC Housing got to a point 
because there was actually such a disturbance in the community that they had to sit down and meet with the school. They sat at the same table and they came up with a strategy that would work. It basically is like they just got pushed against the wall and then they decided to cooperate. We're not pushing anybody against the wall. We're asking to be at that decision table first so that we can actually bring forth a successful solution for the site. And when we, as we see it, it is exactly as I've described. Um, and if this proposal had been similar in even a few respects to the process and the resolve that had occurred in North Vancouver at the Lloyd and 16th site, you would, as you, all of this could have been avoided. And you would have a community that would be throwing its arms around a project. And you, you would have no unrest. Um, I don't know if there's anything more that I, that I can add, but I, I want a success for you as well. Because I believe this is, you are also a partner in this. You've made the point, but it's something we've already said. It's your land. You actually get to make that decision where it gets assigned. We often hear in the market that the objective is to make the numbers work. Um, with pro formas that, uh, you know, where developers are trying to figure out how that they can make the money that they need to make it viable. I think the question has to be asked similarly uh, in, in this situation. Are we being driven by the same metrics? You can, um, but actually, if you look at the math, um, I've discussed this at length in person with almost every councillor up to this point. Um, and everyone's been quite receptive to, to my line of thought. And is that if we actually looked at people that were shorter than five feet as humans, and we included them into the count, and we looked at a site, a project, that could incorporate humans of all sizes and units, multiple different types of sizes of units, similar, and I encourage you, look again at what's been sent to you about the Lloyd Project. It is, um, it's actually quite incredible. The well of support versus the tidal wave of, we need to fix this. There was about a 95% support I've spoken to their counselors. Thank you, it does seem like a missed opportunity. Appreciate well, I hope not. Thank you. And just to remind counselors, this isn't a uh, place for comment, just questions of clarification. Uh, Point of counsel procedure, Mayor. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, Councillor Carr. Yeah, I just um, want to make sure that um, the speaker is um, asked the question. She noted that she had met with almost all and spoken to almost all councillors. Um, I just want to make sure you verify that that was done before. Absolutely. Um, the, yes, before the referral to public hearing. Just I think, for the record. Oh, yeah, no, I don't think I've spoken to anybody for about three months. Yeah, so. I know that, but I just think important to yeah, the I, public. I, oh, okay, sure. Her, you're actually not supposed to interact with uh, that. It's through me as the chair, and I'm now I'm going to move on to Councillor Dejanova. Councillor Dejanova, go ahead. Questions to the speaker. Thanks so much. Um, I, I do have questions. Um, I'm wondering if, if, and they're clarifying questions, what I'm hearing you say is that you'd like to see family units in this building or on this site. Um, and, and just as we consider with other projects, um, you're concerned that there isn't space for families here. Is that correct? Sure. Uh, when, but when also, and yes, I'm going to say yes, absolutely, but it doesn't stop there. What is one of the top five indicators for success for individuals? It actually isn't what people have been throwing around in terms of length of stay of tenancy. It actually is the performance indicators are wellness, levels of integration into the community, the ability to actually have dialogue and interface with those that are around them. The current, and, and I have to say, because this is the closest that I've been in proximity to a supportive housing complex, which would be the Santa Maria home, is completely interfaced with our school uh, community and surrounding neighborhood. Now, what that looks like on an almost monthly basis is the children carrying bags walking over, knocking on that front door, full of food, provisions, 
And oftentimes at Christmas, we're also putting together gift baskets and presents and there, and we're writing Christmas cards, and we are, we are demonstrating our love for that community because there is this auto opportunity for interface when you have someone you can um, empath- directly um, almost see in the mirror. Um, also, um, I mean, these are just sidebar thoughts. But I also see there being an opportunity to offer daycare on the site that perhaps even the neighborhood children outside of the property, but also those within, could attend. Another opportunity for interfacing, if we're talking about lasting solutions, ones that will then lift potentially even the next generation out of poverty, out of homelessness, and start looking at solutions that will prevent it from the go, this is what I see. So what I'm hearing you say is you'd like to see uh, more opportunities for uh, into integrated housing and for community involvement. And what I, I I'm trying to clarify this. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you haven't felt that way thus far in the process. Well, because no one's asked the community. No one has. I mean, how, how would they know when they haven't returned my phone calls? How wouldn't they know when counselors have referred me in E, you know, what do you call that when someone does an E introduction to someone like James Forsyth? You think that a counselor doing that, that he would email me back. I emailed him three times. I phoned him twice. I didn't get one phone call back. And I am just, I'm a community volunteer. I get it. Maybe I'm low on the totem pole, but I was coming with, with, a, with a present of like a solution, something positive that could bring together the community. I believe we all want to win. We want to walk away at the end of the day high-fiving, and it, that's the way actually it should be in order for the dwellers to be a success, to have a success, and to have well-being in their future lives. And that should include, in my opinion, the next generation. And just to clarify in the last minute I have, you're not against, what I'm hearing from you is you're not against low barrier housing in your neighborhood. You're not against uh, having low end of market housing in your neighborhood. You just want to see that dignified. Actually, that's actually a really great question because guess what? The North Vancouver House, the North Vancouver Project is low barrier. So that's what you would like to see in your neighborhood. So you're welcoming of of that type of tenant group. I don't want to say I'm unwelcoming of one or another. What I want to say is, and what I've established is a need in the community, and it's quantified. I can send this if you'd like to see the data. It's quantified. It's right next door in the vicinity, not just a Sancti Maria home, but potential sites that will be demo evicted. I spoke to a woman this morning who actually has two children. She's living in a unit that's three blocks away at 8th and U, and And she is at risk of homelessness. And that's my time, but I'd love if you send it to all of us as you have to through the public hearing process. Thank you, Charlie. We do also have questions from uh, Councillor Dominato. Uh, thanks, Charlene. Thanks for coming in person. I know you've been there for a couple of days. Um, I have a couple of just really specific questions. Um, one's following up on uh, your comments around how you've you've reached out and tried to engage as a community member, as a resident. You've reached out to BC Housing. Um, can you describe for me um, what an ideal sort of approach would have been in terms of as, as someone who simply is engaged in your community and you are reaching out for more information or to give your input, what would that look like ideally? This whole thing, I think, was troubled from go because you also had, let's just admit it, the COVID played a role. Therefore, the in-person you know, interactions, like town halls and things, couldn't, couldn't happen. Um, but when I heard that there were... Um, for three open houses initially. Those, um, we thought, oh, three open houses, 25 people each. What we didn't realize is they were actually doing it at Aaron Brockovich style, where they actually had um, 12 people, was it 16 people on their side and only allowing nine from the community. So three times nine, simple math, 27. 
I had to phone and actually have 10 volunteers phone the community liaison officer, the person that is listening, multiple times over four days to ask for one more consultation session. That added nine more people. So I allowed nine more people. I'm telling you, it has been a fight from day one. And then, actually, since, I mean, you know I was speaking of you, when you did that referral to James, I was thinking, oh, this is a very common process. It must be a common process. This is the community layout. I'm not sure what his title is, but I understand that he's responsible for communicating with stakeholders and not receiving any phone calls back, not even an email back to say, you know, hey, I'm really busy. Um, can you email me your concerns or can we have a 15 minute call? Nothing, it was completely ghosted. So I would suggest um, from like, if we're talking COVID era, more Zooms with minimums of um, whatever, let's say 25 per, per Zoom, perhaps more if the communities are more dense. I would also encourage what North Van does is they actually have not just one small sign with really fine type on the site, they, have, they actually publish it. They have seven in the community. Do you know how big those billboards are? Um, about twice the size of the screen that I'm looking at on the wall. And they have all the details, they have the drawings for the site on, on there and they actually cite, it was on this corner and this corner, they mail out to 1,000 households, sorry, 1,000, not 1,000, that's a lot, that's a few, one kilometer away from the site, not just two blocks, a kilometer. Um, there's just many other things that they, that they did in North Vancouver that I feel that we could, we could improve upon so that a community feels listened to, but certainly just ghosting people um, when they're being referred to by a counselor, I feel is poor um, decorum. Appreciate the feedback, Charlene, because um, I also think um, while we're considering this particular project and I'm asking the questions in that vein, um, there's always lessons to be learned. Um, the other question I have is just going back to a question uh, Councillor DiGenova had asked for you about um, the uh, building uh, itself and um, units there. I'm curious, you talked about community engaging with the Sancta Maria House, the existing yeah. um, supportive housing there, and that um, there's uh, been a ritual and culture of the school community and the broader community engaging. I'm curious, could you see that replicated here, even if um, uh, this were approved and it didn't include family-sized units, as was asked by Council DiGenova, but could there still be a uh, a culture built of engaging with um, new housing at this site, even if it didn't include family-sized units? Uh, no one in this community would ever turn up their nose to, you know, we don't turn up our nose to anybody. Honestly, there are people sleeping on the benches um, that we buy food for. There's, um, you know, people picking up trash in the neighborhood when it's not their turn. There are people delivering meals when they hear they have COVID. Um, it's just, it's a, it's a hard question because I feel like you're trying to ask me to, you know, to make a choice. Actually, I actually want to make, I want to drive, I want to have the community being part of the conversation and I, I've demonstrated the need that there is, there are more than a thousand women in holding pattern in thank Vancouver. You. We, are at the five, we are at the five minutes. Thank, uh, you. So I just, thank you so much for, yeah, thanks for the time. Questions. Thank you. Thanks, and we're going to move uh, to the speaker who has been waiting uh, in person, and then we're going to take a, a break for dinner. We have Amanda Bogan, uh, who's there, speaker number 68. Hello. Hi there, whenever uh, you're ready, up in five minutes. Okay, I'm speaking today as a person who was a member of the last iteration of the Downtown Eastside Neighborhood Council. The people on the board at that time gathered information regarding the policies required to run a program specifically in a building of this design. Um, all of those board members, from what I can determine, are now deceased. I'm the only, I'm the last one. And uh, the other, there are two people who were on the board, but they were paid by the city. 
I have a box in my living room that's full of all of this information, and I try to put it together as succinctly as I could in a letter. If it's not relevant to this issue, please let me know. Uh, I believe it is because it, it's about the policies that are required to run a program in a building of this specific design. In 2015, uh, as I say, I was a member of the last iteration of the Downtown Eastside Neighborhood Council. At that time, an issue was brought forward by a neighbor who was later appointed the mayor's drug policy advisor. Based on that issue received by our humble neighborhood council, I would like to share what we discovered concerning the design of this building and uh, what is proposed here as a program that the building is designed to facilitate. Uh, the issue was uh, brought forward uh, was that the congregate ho supportive housing buildings have an effectively coercive element. People in this housing are, live in this housing because they are given no other choice within a near zero vacancy rate. And further, that within that environment, in order to make that system function at all, there is arguably and uh, a court has confirmed this, a violation of the tenant's basic human rights and violations of the Rental Tenancy Act. I personally believe this is why we're seeing so much mayhem on our streets, that people are angry and they don't have the words to express um, what is happening to them. Even though we did not hear from that person who became the future mayor's drug policy advisor again after that initial meeting, the Neighborhood Council was alerted, and myself and the secretary, who was a lovely person who also happened to have substance use disorder as a disability, dutifully investigated and documented the human rights issues and Rental Tenancy Act violations that person had brought to us as an issue. We found that when confronted, the supportive housing uh, provider argued they must impose arguably illegal policies uh, on the tenants by necessity in order to make this program function in a congregate setting. In a case that is typical, the supportive housing provider had a blanket policy of surveilling all tenants through a security check at the door for visitors and even their family members. And the tenant took this issue to the rental tenancy branch. The judge found the BC Supreme Court judge found that this surveillance violated the Rental Tenancy Act. The judge said that the management of the supportive housing uh, building had no authority to impose a blanket policy to monitor the tenants. Tenants like these are covered by the Rental Tenancy Act. Supportive housing tenants are to be treated like any other tenant under the RTA. And yet, because the BC Supreme Court ruling came up from the RTB, the ruling only applied to that one tenant, though we can presume it should apply to all tenants of these buildings. Because that is what it states in Section 9 of the RTA, that landlords may not unreasonably restrict visitors. In fact, in people's rental agreements within the so-called supportive housing buildings, we found that it actually stated in those standard agreements that tenants signed that the landlord may not impede their visitors unreasonably. And then the landlord had a blanket policy of doing that anyway in opposition to the agreement. So what we found was that the supportive housing providers however pretty of a picture they want to draw in public, actually continue to operate systematically in violation of the RTA. During my visit to my friend, each time I visited in the supportive housing building, I had to show my government ID at the security desk. The staff had me stand in front of a camera like they have at ICBC. They took Sorry. my picture. You, uh, you are have to understand. Okay. Sorry. That's okay. Uh, you do have questions from uh, Councillor Hardwick, though, and these are clarifying questions, uh, Councillor Hardwick. Okay, I'm right, I've, over, I've I'm right finished. over here. I'm, can I finish? Okay. No, you are at your five minutes, but Councillor Hardwick can uh, can ask you questions. Go ahead, Councillor Hardwick. I'm right here. Oh, sorry. No, no worries. Um, you had to stand in front of a camera and get your picture taken like at ICBC? Yes, and I, I, I've, I've almost caught to the the gist of it, of how horrifying it was, really, for me. Um, so each time I went to visit my friend, 
I, I had to go to a security desk at the front door, and this is common to all these supportive housing buildings, I understand. This is what Karen Ward came to us to complain about, uh, because they don't have any legitimate authority to do this. You have to stand in front of a camera, they, just like at ICBC, they take your picture, they take your ID, and they upload your ID to HIFAS, which is a federal database. Nobody knows what they do with that information. But how does that relate to this? Okay, this is, these are the policies that the supportive housing providers claim they, they have to implement in order to run a program in a building of this design, in a congregate setting of this design. And, and, and the Supreme Court judge ruled against it, and our most prominent supportive housing building provider, Atira, said, we don't care. We're going to continue to do that anyway. I, I've got it. Um, I, we are sure. getting a little dangerous here with naming yeah. names of organizations and also people. So I just... Okay, I sorry. Thank you. I'm yeah. sorry. So your principal objection is to the congregate housing? Yes. Uh, to, no, not to... No, because it, under the Housing First program, people have a choice. Some people have needs. Some people need to be in congregate housing, as I understand it. Um, but there has to be a choice. And, and the way that the congregate housing is being run as I, in, in, in Vancouver is um, in violation of the RTA. And there, the house... For the public's the, yeah. understanding, the RTA stands for? The Rental Tenancy Act. Okay, thank you. According to this BC, BC Supreme Court ruling, I brought the transcript. It also made all the newspapers, so I brought the newspaper articles too. Um, and so we found other violations too. And I wrote a, I wrote a, um, a magazine article about it um, with help from law professors at UBC. Would you um, share that? Could you photocopy and share yes, that? Yes, I, I have. Okay. And I, I've also... Um, you know, um, written as best I could about these um, illiberal, argu arguably uh, illegal policies in a letter that I can give to each council member. I can submit it here or... Yeah, I, th yeah, I think yeah, it would the be clerk best will, with the clerk. The Thank you. Yeah. Clerk Thank you take very much. Thank um, you. Should, I, should I continue? Uh, with, no, we're going to move on to Councillor Dominato, who actually has questions for you as well. Okay. Councillor Dominato. Uh, yes, thanks. I'm I'm similar to Councillor Hardwick. I was trying to understand. Are you speaking in objection to this proposal because you view it as congregate housing? I'm, can no. you just clarify? For I me? don't feel that I. I'm from what I understand. I have no legitimate authority to say who who should live in the building and who shouldn't. Like my understanding is, we're not here to pass that kind of judgment. Um, I'm telling you about an issue that concerns uh, the design of the building, the policies that are required to move to, for people to live in the building uh, under this program. It's about what the building is designed to do. And uh, there's problems. I'm not, I'm not saying that no one should ever live in the building. I'm saying okay. that when people do move into the building, they should feel safe and um, they should feel that their rights are being respected. And because we don't have any kind of um, legislation, right, governing this program, the supportive housing providers end up just making things up as they go along. And they end up uh, doing things to people that are, that cause, uh, well, that are the opposite of well-being. And, uh, you know, it, maybe, maybe if you don't, if you haven't experienced uh, living in uh, supportive housing or you um, don't know anyone who has lived there, you might find this issue easy to dismiss. But actually, the people who live under this system feel it very keenly. Um, they feel they can't advance in their lives because they don't have any housing choices. And they're living in these buildings where, uh, you know, the policies are pretty questionable. So, okay, that, that's helpful. So what I'm hearing is you're expressing concern in, in, based on your experience. You're expressing concern about um, the 
health and physical and mental well-being of individuals who may opt or be offered the opportunity to live in supportive housing. And you're raising questions around potentially some of the policies or frameworks around some of the nonprofit operators that operate housing. So I'm not right, hearing no, that you're necessarily... It's integral. It's integral to the design. Okay, so... It's in every single congregate supportive housing building that I have been in or heard about. Okay, so I, and again, I'm, I'm reflecting back some questions so that I'm really clear. Is I'm not hearing you, so I'm not hearing you speak in support or in opposition to this particular application, but you're raising some broader questions around um, ensuring the well-being of individuals who access supportive housing in the city, as well as the policies and um, that are implemented by housing operators. In right, I can't housing. speak to who lives in the building. But I'm saying that the policies that are required in order to run the program within a building of this design are, uh, you know, illiberal, very questionable. Uh, we don't know where the authority comes from for the supportive housing provider to have the surveillance of the tenants. Okay. Um, yes, Thank and I, I would also, sorry, I also want to make the Did point that this add? has an effect on the rest of society too. I mean, I, I'm sorry to sound so strident, but um, what I see is that, um, you know, the Housing First program um, was uh, initially a rights-based intervention and people got housing that was integrated into society. Um, and that is where the healing came from, apparently, from what I have read, except for those who did require congregate housing. There is a, um, you know, they, people did have, do have choice under that original program. Um, but what is happening here is that people are just being segregated. And what it does is it, um, uh, it sets up a, a system, a housing system. So um, as I have written, in this case, this liberal makeshift setup within an institution has a bad effect on the rest of society because such settings are not operating, uh, are, are only operating against the RTA in, a, in an illegal or a liberal manner. And that a liberal process is dependent for justification on the suppression of a whole comprehensive housing program. Uh, so um, the system called supportive housing, as we have seen it develop in Vancouver, um, shoves an illiberal spoke, if you will, into what should otherwise be a comprehensive regulated housing plan. A comprehensive regulated, regulated housing plan provides a structural guarantee that such institutions with their illegal policies are not necessary as there is inclusivity built in the housing plan for all code groups. Okay, I'm it's going to stop you there because yes. we are over Councillor Domino's five minutes, but you do have another question from Councillor Swanson. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Councillor Swanson. Thanks for coming in, Amanda. Thank you. I I know what you're talking about. I I've had to give my ID so that I could go visit someone in supportive housing, and it's I mean, just from my perspective, it was very irritating. But are you saying that? Um, you would think this building would be okay if the operators were required to obey the RTA and not have these restrictive policies on the tenants? Is that what you're saying? Um, no, you know what? I, everything that I'm saying, I've already said. Like, I don't have the expertise to say how a congregate housing program should be run. I'm not a doctor. I can't comment on people's medical conditions. Although I have seen firsthand how these programs run. What I'm saying is there's, in our system of laws, there's a glitch. And it can be probably fixed. But I think because it's left as a glitch, where people are experiencing, um, you know, rights violations without any law, and some housing provider is just making things up as they go along, uh, that is causing a lot of suffering. And, um, you know, because people feel very restricted in their lives. 
without any kind of legitimate authority. There's also the problem that because the, um, you know, the actual su supports that are put in place are inadequate, then it become, the whole thing becomes completely unjustifiable. I mean, my friend was in distress in a supportive housing building, and help had to be cobbled together from outside. And yet, you know, in order to help him, and he actually had to move out to save his life or to extend his life as far as he could. Um, there was no justification for these, um, this security because, you know, it wasn't really helping anybody. And it was having a harmful effect, a harmful, a liberal effect on our comprehensive housing plan that we're supposed to have um, because all they're doing is kind of segregating people away who some people think don't belong. And that's all I've come here to say. And I have all this material. I'll submit it. And I hope that you can um, look at it and that it will be useful. But um, I can't speak to who should live there and who shouldn't live there or, you know, what a program should look like. Is that sort of clear? Yeah. Thank you, dear. Okay. Thank, thank you so much for coming in and answering all the questions. That is it for questions for you. Just want to say thank you so much for your inputting into this uh, decision making process. Uh, Council, we're at 531 now. Let's come back at uh, 630 to uh, so we can just get a break and it can continue with the speakers. Uh, the next speaker will be uh, speaker number 69, Chase Chow, follow, uh, followed by speaker number uh, 73, uh, Stephanie Valentinuzzi. Okay, thanks so much, Council. We'll see you in an hour.
6.30, so I'm going to uh, reconvene the meeting and move to our next speaker, who's uh, speaker number 69, Chase Chow. Clerks, do we have speaker number 69, Chase Chow, on the line? We're just yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, sure can. Hello? Uh, you have Hi, you have up to five minutes whenever you're ready. Oh, okay, perfect. Um, yeah, good evening, everyone. Uh, hope um, hope everybody enjoyed their uh, their break there. Uh, so my name is Chase Chow, and I oppose the uh, rezoning on 7th and Arbutus uh, in its current form. Uh, first and foremost, I, I just want to take this opportunity to thank you all for hearing um, our feedback. Uh, you know, whether we agree or disagree, I just want to thank um, everyone for the work and, and um, your, your public service to, to our community. Um, <clears throat> I recognize uh, BC is in a housing crisis and thousands of unhoused people in Vancouver alone. Um, and it's extremely evident that we um, can see the crisis with our own eyes. I understand that the government wants to accelerate housing solutions, as many of you were elected on a mandate to address the housing crisis. And I am personally extremely supportive of the need for social housing in Vancouver. However, I am saying no to this proposal because a far better yes exists. Because I think a far better um, um, yes uh, uh, can, can be provided uh, for the unhoused people in Vancouver and with all the communities involved in supporting these initiatives. Here's why. I live in Marple, and it's been my home for most of my life. And we recently welcomed the Riderman Residence Social Housing uh, to our neighborhood in 2019. That is only a few blocks from my home. So yes, proudly in my backyard. The residence has been extremely well integrated into the community overall, and BC Housing has considered this site one of its success stories. And this is because the site is surrounded by less density with a much smaller operation of 77 supportive units for mainly marginalized seniors spread over two low-rise buildings, both with sufficient staff on site. I called this morning and confirmed that they always have three to five staff during the day and two in the evening to ensure the site is well-managed, tenants are well-cared for, and minimally disruptive and safe to our neighborhood. This level of success is not achievable with the current proposed 13-story tower and 129 units. First off, Marple is nowhere as dense as the Broadway corridor, and the Riderman residence is not steps away from a bus loop or a subway station. The Riderman residence is also not a 155-foot high-rise tower situated on a very small site that faces an extremely narrow six-foot-wide residential sidewalk with no buffer. That also breaks all the rezoning bylaw regulations as yesterday's speaker, who was an architect, also addressed. So I'm saying no for a far better yes that already exists. This scale of supportive housing has never been attempted before in such a dense setting, and it's very evident that the government urgently wishes to achieve their mandate to homelessness through density. And Dr. Julian Somers, whom we've all referenced um, uh, over the last few days, you know, I, I'm surprised that BC Housing and um, the provincial government hasn't consulted his local, uh, has, hasn't consulted him given his local involvement in academic studies and homelessness. But he's provided his assessment on why this form of housing and density does not provide the support for the needs of its residents um, and help with reintegration back into society. Furthermore, supportive housing needs to be dispersed amongst several neighborhoods and not congregated in any one large tower or in any one neighborhood. I support quality care through lower density and dispersed locations, as Dr. Summers has proven this method effectively helps those in need, and more importantly, it provides them the support to reintegrate back to society and live an independent and fulfilling life. Isn't that what it's all about? It's not only a mandate to house the homeless, it's about integrating them back to society and helping them gain their independence back. So in summary, I, I am saying no for a better yes. I'm saying no to a high volume densification government, uh, densification the government urgently wishes to achieve um, to meet their mandate. But I'm saying yes to a proven approach through quality of care, lower density, dispersed supportive housing through multiple communities, like what we've seen in my own very backyard in Marple. You know, I recognize to many of you, um, approving this proposal would be much easier as you're so close to achieving an important mandate. 
rather than going back to the drawing board. But oftentimes, doing what's right, and I say this to my kids all the time, doing what's right um, is, is in the long run takes multiple attempts, and it's never the quickest and easiest path. So I ask you to consider the facts and to reject the rezoning in its current form as we all strive for a much better yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you do have questions. Uh, Councillor Boyle, up to five minutes. Yes, um, thanks so much for waiting over the dinner break and showing up to speak. I I'm wondering, I I've been reading Dr. Summers' uh, report and it seems to um, pretty clearly say that housing in both congregate and scattered sites achieved better outcomes um, than no housing. Uh, I I'm wondering um, what your interpretation is based on or, or um, where you're getting your understanding yeah. of the study from. Yeah, that's a good question, and I, I think uh, Julian Somers will, will talk a little bit more about that himself, and I don't want to provide the wrong information here, but I think from my understanding, um, there's um, uh, it's, it's more about housing stability. Um, so from a stability standpoint, they, they, they stay in, in the same place, but in terms of actual recovery and wellness and reintegration back into the community, it is far superior when it is a recovery oriented type of housing and it is not congregated. Okay, that, that's not what I was reading, but I can ask Dr. Summers. I'm also wondering, um, BC Housing in, in questions the other day uh, said pretty clearly that this, if this project doesn't go through, the funding would go elsewhere in the province. It, it won't be available for a, a different model or different project in Vancouver. So given that, you know, it's not an easy choice, but but that reality from BC Housing, do you think we're better off not having this project um, or, or having this and, and uh, working through the supports people need? I think um, approving the project in its current form um, is, is, is um, too preliminary. Um, and um, I, I recognize that uh, the funding is there, but at the same time, when you're um, when you're pushing things forward, and you know the 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 building, for example, it goes edge to edge, <clears throat> right up to the property line. If you look at the Riderman residence, there's a lot of green space. There's there's a lot of green space for the residents when and and I see them in the neighborhood. They they love spending time in their little green space. And with this type of proposal, there's no green space for them. There, it goes edge to edge, and it's a 13-story tower. So, you know, I, I, I understand that we want to provide a solution, but I, I feel like the, the solution that we provide has to be the right solution, uh, and it has to make sense. Um, it, it can't, um, we can't rush through things. Um, so, yeah, that's my opinion. Okay. I, I'm out of time, but thanks. Thank you. Uh, thanks. That's it, I think, for questions. Oh, no, we have Councillor Carr. Councillor Carr, up to five minutes, please. Yeah, yeah thanks very much, um, Chase, for, for taking the time to talk to us. Um, it's just a follow-up question to Councillor Boyles. Um, I mean, we have a chance to ask staff questions, and amongst those questions, I'm sure, well, certainly for me, will be what opportunity there is for Council um, to... Uh, to uh, have a discussion around the tenanting and a number, well, a number of things that have been raised by speakers. Um, so, uh, if this project is actually um, uh, open or has the possibility of market change um, through um, things like the tenancy agreements, for example, um, would you be open then to um, saying, okay, like if it can be changed and there is different uh, sort of direction around? you know, yeah, just a different direction around the tenanting in particular, um, would you be more supportive of it going forward? Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. I, I would be uh, definitely more supportive. Um, I think the the big issue, though, is is for me is, is the densification. It's just the, the 13 stories um, and um, the 129 units. Um, I, I feel that that's far too dense, and the what, what type of support is going to be there to be able to to, to help the residents? Um, as again, as we've seen in Marple, 
um, you've got 77 units, and you have three to five full-time staff on site at any time. So I, I called them this morning, and I spoke with them, and, you know, there, there's always enough support there. And so um, my my biggest issue is, is the densification, um, and, yeah. Okay. Appreciate that. Thank you very much for taking the time to speak to us. Thanks. Uh, that's it for questions. Uh, we're going to move on to the next speaker, 70, in a second. Um, Council, that's 70 of 265, just so you know. Uh, my calculation puts that at about uh, 16 hours uh, if each uh, if each speaker uh, t uh, has five minutes. But um, and again, it's it's your right. I'm just saying if, if every speaker gets a question, that would uh, double the time. So that would be about 32 hours that we have before we get to debate and decision. So I am working with the clerks. Uh, we have July 14th uh, slated uh, for the next hearing, but um, that in my calculation could be three, four, eight hour days that we have left to uh, to get through this list and that's without calling at the end. So I am working with the clerks to let you know, um, just, uh, and I understand we're all aware that uh, we wanna be finished by the end of July, um, but I am looking at alternatives here for um, for uh, completing this item, just so you know. Uh, Stephanie uh, Valen uh, Tanuzi is uh, the next speaker, speaker number 70. Hello. Can Hi you guys hear me? About, yep, up to five minutes whenever you're ready. Great. Thank you so much. Good evening. My name is Stephanie Valen Tanuzi, and I'm a resident who has lived in the neighborhood for over 20 years. I'm strongly opposed to the proposal before you. I am a mother to a two-year-old son, and I am currently seven months pregnant. I take my son to Delmont Park on a weekly basis, which is adjacent to the proposed social housing development. I listen to the full three hours of discussions on the first Tuesday evening, and I must say it was an embarrassment that BC Housing, City Planners, MPA, Mayor Stewart, and our councillors did not at any time bring up the safety of the 450 children who attend the school in the area or the children who play at Delmont Park. The health and safety of the most vulnerable, which are children, should be at the forefront of this discussion for this proposed development that is only 20 metres away from a school and even less from a toddler park. Callers have been asked to phone in and give their support or opposition. I am, I am in opposition, but I would like to pose questions to our councillors that as elected officials who are going to be making a decision on this proposal should be able to answer. It was clear from Tuesday night's presentations from BC Housing, City Planners, and MPA that they have not done the research on a development of this size, nor do they understand how it will be operated. MPA said that they have never managed a facility of this size. BC Housing said they will not discriminate against anyone moving into the building. Therefore, those tenants with potential violent pasts are welcome to live in a building 20 metres away from children. Chi Chan, city planner, asked by Councillor Kirby Young what square footage was planned for support in the building for those with mental illness. He did not have an answer. If you've been working on a project for over a year, how do you not know this number? It's because there is no support plan for the residents of the building. Another comment that was raised just last night from a supporter on the phone who works as an expert in the BC housing industry noted that it is the neighboring community's responsibility for cleaning up the parks surrounding the social housing development. So what they're saying is, myself as a pregnant mother, I will be responsible to do a sweep and cleanup of needles at a park when I take my two-year-old son there. This is unacceptable. This is why my questions tonight fall solely on our councillors, because again, BC Housing, City Planners, and MPA don't have any answers. My questions are simple, yes or no responses. Please answer as the mothers, fathers, sons, and daughters that you are. Question number one, given the mental health issues of the residents that are proposed to be living at the 7th and Arbutus development, can the councillors guarantee the safety of the children who will play daily at the Delmont Park and those who attend St. Augustine School? Yes or no? 
Question number two, do you feel it is acceptable for children to witness multiple emergency responder calls to the proposed housing development? Yes or no? Counselors, if your answers were no to these two simple questions, then your vote must be no to this proposal. I'm speaking as a mother who's very passionate right now about the safety of my children and those other children that are, that are close proximity to the, to the school and to the park and the development. Thank you. Thanks for calling in tonight. I don't see any questions for you, so just want to thank you for presenting your views, and I'm going to move on to the next speaker. Uh, we have uh, Craig uh, Parasini, uh, speaker number 71. Hi, one, one second, sorry. Okay. Okay. Hi, right my ahead. name is Craig Parasini. Can, can you hear me? Yep, can do. Okay, hi, my name is Craig Parasini. Uh, I'm a professional engineer. I've lived in Kitsilano since 2006. Uh, I have a young son, and some of the last uh, caller there, I have a, another child on the way shortly. Um, as an engineer, I've been involved in, a, in various stages of major infrastructure projects throughout the Lower Mainland over the last 15 years, and I just hope to offer some of my thoughts from that perspective uh, for the Council. I've been listening uh, for the last couple of days to these proceedings, and it's been clear based on the comments over the last three days that there are significant and relevant concerns around this project. <laughs> Questions on number and mix of tenants, unit sizes, supports for residents, protections for children, access, traffic, and even shadowing, greenway con congestion, things like that. Um, that should make you question the suitability for this project as is currently planned. I've listened as those who've called in to support this project have generally done so based on two things. One, we are in desperate need of housing, especially housing that will support the vulnerable members of our community. Two, that this site is suitable to provide some sort of supportive housing. These are not things people opposed to this proposal have disputed. We all agree on these points. The concerns are about the specifics. This is the wrong project for the site for a long list of reasons you've heard, and there's no plan and no commitment from city staff, the applicant, or the proposed operator to address any of the concerns the community has brought forth. As previous callers have mentioned, there has been community engagement, quote unquote, and feedback has been provided prior to this part of the process. But I'll remind council that the adjustments due to the previous feedback, which is all the same stuff you've been hearing, were that, and these were lauded out by the city during the initial presentation on Tuesday night, were a less than 10% reduction in their number of units from some theoretical maximum that they had initially proposed. The removal of a rooftop parapet that served no real purpose. And my personal favorite, they changed the color of the building. Any further concerns brought forward have been brushed off as just something to be dealt with later. The time to deal with these questions is now. It is a fundamental engineering principle that our ability to impact outcomes decreases dramatically as the project moves through its life cycle. Your chance as counselors to have a meaningful impact on this project that could be a tremendous success or an abject failure is when you vote on the motion before you. Do you really believe that you have enough information to know which of those it will be? I urge council to vote no on this pro proposal and force city staff to come back with a proposal that is meaningful to address the concerns brought forth before approving a plan for the site. I've heard concerns from council that BC Housing may pull the funding and reallocate it as it was threatened by BC Housing on Tuesday night. Please do not be strong darn by BC Housing's threats to pull funding. We are the biggest city in the province and the provincial government's hopes of being re-elected now without John Horgan, rest significantly in their building to address housing. You hold the cards in this negotiation. Act from the position of strength you are in. The other um, thing I'd just like to address, a couple callers back, we're talking about, you know, this being a binary yes or no uh, process of, you know, if we don't move forward with this, maybe we get nothing. You know, the analogy I draw is, hey, is, 
is this, you know, is this better than them being on the street? Yes, it is. Is the cheeseburger from McDonald's better than going hungry? Yeah, it is. But what we're committing to is feeding these people cheeseburgers for the next 60 to 80 years and offering no opportunity to provide them a wholesome meal. Um, when this when this goes forward, zoned as it is, plan to build the way it is. There's no chance to change. You might be able to get you know chicken nuggets instead of a cheeseburger, but you're not going to a different restaurant. You've made your decision, and we will all lie in the bed that we've made. Thank you. Thanks so much. I don't see any questions for you, but thank you so much for coming in and expressing your uh, views on this uh, project. I'm going to uh, move to the next speaker, who is uh, Irene Klatt, speaker number 72. Hello, my name is Irene Hansel. I am chair of the governing body of St. Augustine School, and I'm speaking on behalf of the school. The school is 18 meters from this site. The student population, including an independently run daycare, totals 500 children aged 2 to 13. The school is a vibrant, engaged, active community. It offers programs and activities at the school as early as 7 a.m. and as late as 7 p.m., including an after-school care program. The school is located west of Arbutus, and, but uses the facilities of St. Augustine's Church, which is located east of Arbutus. So this development is located in the middle of our campus. Children represent a vulnerable population, and respectfully speaking, on behalf of this population, is responsibility of the school. The motion in front of council is not approval of the provision of housing to those in need. The motion is for the rezoning of this specific site and the elements of this proposed development in its building form and use. The site and the unique characteristics of the immediate surrounding area need to be taken into careful and thoughtful consideration. The proposed development fails to do so. Anecdotes and stories should be heard, but more than anything, data and evidence needs to be the basis of decisions. There is no data that indicates that permanent supportive housing that uses a harm reduction approach to the size and scale of this building with 129 units is, success is successfully co-located with an independent school. That is because there is no other directly comparable permanent supportive housing buildings of this size that use a harm reduction approach 18 meters from elementary school, 18 meters from a preschool, across the street from a toddler park, within three blocks of four other elementary schools, and across the street from a major transit hub. It was noted that 57% of supportive housing sites are within 500 meters of schools in Vancouver. There are 0% permanent supportive housing sites that have a no harm reduction approach across the street from a school. What the data and evidence do support is that a is that the few supportive housing buildings located near elementary schools, and by near, I mean within a few hundred meters, such as Fraser Supportive Housing located at located 400 meters from Sir Alexander Mackenzie School near John Oliver, which was referenced earlier this evening, or Mount Edwards Court in Victoria, are low-rise, small-scale buildings. Fraser Building has 30 units, and residents are expected to abstain from alcohol and drug use, whereas Mount Edwards Court is a 78-unit building for residents 55 years of age and older who have no current problematic substance use issues and no history of violence. In addition, the Riederman residences have also been frequently mentioned and included in the BC Housing presentation at this hearing. It is not at all comparable to what is proposed here. This is a permanent building, not temporary, and this is 65% bigger than the Riederman residence. Acknowledged by BC Housing staff and noted specifically in the audit of Penticton Supportive Housing is a lack of recovery-focused housing sought by those seeking safe housing that supports their recovery journey and that are as a struggle, they struggle in a harm reduction approach. Yet BC Housing will not consider this type of housing here. Further amplifying the challenges of this site, the Arbuta Sky train station will be located immediately south of this site across 7th Avenue. As this is the terminus station of the Broadway SkyTrain, a bus loop is co-located here, which at its peak hours will have articulated B-Line buses arriving every one to two minutes. The B-Line along Broadway is the busiest bus route across Canada and the U.S. Arbutus at this site is not an arterial road, road, but a narrow neighborhood collector street, which cannot support the concentration 
and intensity of activity that will come with this development. Effective community planning would not support what is proposed here. Finally, the impact of shadowing and reduced sunlight on the school's children is significant. The geometry and the height of the building create significant morning shadowing over the school's playground. The revised shadow studies on the city's website demonstrate that between September to October and February to June, nearly the entirety of the school's playground is shadowed by the building early morning, while November, December, and January have less shadowing. Approximately one half of the area of the playground is shadowed, shadowed every morning, including the entirety of the preschool play area. The school is open to social housing on the site, but it needs to be the right housing. We invite you to meet with us to determine what that is. As council, you have the tools, authority, and accountability to put in place enforceable measures to make this the right development. This is not the right development, and I urge you to reject this rezoning application. Thank you so much. Right on five minutes. Really appreciate your uh, being succinct. Uh, thank you for your input. We do have a question from Councillor Hardwick. Councillor Hardwick. Thank you. So I just had to get to that unmute button. Uh, no sorry. problem. Yep. Go ahead. Um, thank you for your your detailed uh, analysis and uh, clearly understand where your your um, your representation of the school is coming from. Um, unpacking it, we've got a physical space that's arguably disproportionate. Um, we've got proximity to 500 children competing vulnerable groups. If you unpack it, what um, what do you find? Uh, I mean, obviously you've got kids across the street, but if 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 that social housing, as you characterize it, was was comprised differently, but still social housing, um, would that be less objectionable? The size and massing, uh, height and massing of the building. There was some suggestion earlier of, you know, 50 units, family composition, things of that nature. Can you can you un explain to me a little bit about where you would come at this from from different perspectives, uh, having expressed the concerns that you have? I think there's a multitude of issues and challenges that this uh, proposed development uh, has. Size, the shadowing impacts, the concentration of, of, of activity in a very small neighborhood with a very small and narrow street um, are significant. Uh, but we are looking as a community for enforceable measures from council that would allow a social housing project to be situated properly with the concerns of residents, but certainly of the school children uh, in mind. So what that is, is, um, is, is something different than what's being proposed here. And I would, I, would, I would urge council to reject what is here and to go back and come up with something that addresses the concerns that we have outlined. Well, the city has land that it has made available to um, builders such as, as really BC Housing is the builder in this case, and then operators separately as you have observed. Um, so there you're still, you would still be okay with some form of how social housing on the city owned site, um, but not this configuration. Yes, we have, we, have, we have stated right from the beginning that we're not opposed to, so, to social housing on this site, but it needs to be the right form. It needs to be the right composition. It needs to be the right scale, and it needs to consider the impact to the community, and this proposal doesn't. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> I don't see any other questions for you, so thank you so much for uh, calling in, and I'm going to move to the next speaker now. Uh, Next speaker is, uh, sorry, thanks for coming in person, I think. Um, Hollis Bromley is speaker number 73. Uh, not, not on the line. Thank you, clerks. Uh, next is Niall Currid. In person, I believe. Hello. Hi there. Uh, thanks for calling in or coming in. You have uh, up to five minutes whenever you're ready. 
Steve, thanks very much for your time today. I was in the City Hall earlier a few times, um, but I've had to call in now. Um, oh, I'd like to start off by just giving me a brief background. My name is Noel Courage. I'm a resident of Kitsilano. I lived in Kitsilano since I moved here from Ireland in 2015. I became a Canadian citizen in 2018. My six-year-old son, who was born here, will be attending St. Augustine's Elementary School this coming fall, beginning grade two. I'm opposed to the planned rezoning of 2086, 2098 West 7th Avenue. I have the following concerns about the planned development. Infractions on local schools and parks from shadow. From the shadow studies that I've reviewed, there will be a large shadow cast on the playground of St. Augustine during their morning recess. The shadow will lead to a cold playground space and also an overall lack of sunlight for the children during their morning recess, particularly during the springtime when it will be cold outside and the sunlight brings warmth. So there is a, there's a lack of solar access for the children in, in the school. Infractions on Delaman Park from the shadow. Again, the shadow studies that I've, that I've seen, and also speaker number seven on Wednesday evening there did a very detailed analysis and a 3D analysis of the actual shadows that it, it intends to cast. Uh, Delaman Park will also be in shadow after, after school finishes around the afternoon time. So many children, including myself and my, and my son, we go to that playground and we play soccer, we play in the swings, and a lot of the children go there directly after school. It's a, it's a great green space, and we enjoy going there. Uh, a huge amount of parents and children from the area do attend that playground. Um, the shadow cast on that will actually leave it quite um, unwelcoming uh, during the uh, spring and fall months. Uh, there's also a shadow element that will fall down onto... Uh, the Arbutus Greenway, which is a recent, um, recently built and deployed uh, for the city access, for pedestrian access there. And it's going to be uh, cast in quite a large shadow down the Arbutus Greenway. Scale and magnitude of the development. This is an extreme change in the zoning for this area, irrespective of the pro proposed Broadway plan. Um, from the speakers that I've been listening to over the past few nights, uh, there are various infractions upon even the, the recently passed Broadway plan um, code about um, clear ways um, as well as uh, sidewalk access, etc., etc. From that, it seems to be that the developer here has put the biggest possible monstrosity that they can that they can come up with um, to to, to maximise uh, the amount of people that they can put inside that building. Mm -hmm. Lack of community engagement during this planning application, um, information has been very scarce and limited. Any time I've reached out to any local councillors, uh, I've sent letters in, uh, I've tried to engage with, with um, various different people on this. I've just got generic responses, such as thank you for, for your response. Uh, there's a number of us also who've been tracking this as well, and we all seem to get the same copy and paste uh, information back returned to us. So I don't think that it's, it's been engaged and very collaborative with the neighbourhood. Uh, this just leads to a lot of fear uh, that we've had. Safety concerns. As a parent, I'm very apprehensive about the use, uh, the planned use for this development. From the research I've done, and that's supplied by the Kitsilano Coalition, there seems to be little or no consideration of the crime statistics that will come along with these developments, such as that as Marguerite Ford Apartments. When this development opened, the VPD received almost a thousand calls in its first two years, and it's still receiving upwards of those kind of numbers. That is an uplift uh, from previously the previous two years before that building came in from uh, about 55 calls. Currently, the neighbourhood I live on, which is close to um, the development, it's around 55 calls per two years as well. This is directly across the road from the playground at both St. Augustine School and a toddler playground. Um, that's another safety concern I have. Um, there were some really good points brought up by so, some of the other speakers about access to the building, which uh, I wasn't aware of, about how the emergency service intend to access it, coming in from 7th Avenue. Uh, there's bike paths all along here. There's uh, pedestrian crosswalks on the intersections between Arbutus and 7th. And I don't see a real structured safety plan about how this amount of people go into that building there uh, and, and the requirement for emergency service to access that, as well as the ingress and egress of 3,000 people per hour on the Arbutus uh, a subway station. So we're going to have a huge influx of pedestrian people, a school, and a huge amount of traffic in the area there. And we also have to kind of consider what's the emergency services that are planned for this building. 
as, as we heard earlier, there's no planned thank medical you. facility. You are at your five Sorry? minutes, so I just want to say uh, thank you. Right. I don't see any questions for you, so I'll just, um, thanks for calling in today. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Council, we're on to speaker number 75, Nathan Davidovich. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of Council. Do you hear me? We sure do. Please go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Well, as I told you on the 14th of June at the other public hearing, we have the same problem with the BCHMC. This project is the same as the King Edward and Knight Street. The only difference is that the West Side got organized and have 15 times as many speakers as on the East Side. This Crown Corporation is trying to do a job that used to be done by a proper Ministry of Housing and a full-time Minister of Housing. We don't have that now. And that's where we have so many problems and so many questions are being asked and so forth. Uh, you know, why not use the site beside where the MLA for Point Grey lives? UBC and UEL. There is lots of room there. There's, you know, for many uh, mid-rise buildings, they they have nothing there. They have no uh, 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 social housing or uh, or very few affordable rental apartments. But every building, you know, around a rapid transit line or station should be, have a minimum of around 15 to 20 stories. Uh, maybe the new amendments to the BC Transportation Financing Authority will get the BC government to buy everything within 800 meters of all stations and provide affordable rental apartments. And that would solve the situation here because they'll buy everything. Uh, I mean, the Metro Vancouver Housing Committee will discuss this on July the 7th. Uh, transit access to this site is bad. Arbuta Station will be the only station in Vancouver that does not have access in all directions. Staff are refusing to bring this to the attention of council. There is no bus service on Arbuta north of Broadway. Uh, yes, there are services on Broadway and south on Arbutus, but on the north side, there is nothing. The right-of-way is there, and the street can be widened by just four feet to allow a proper width so regular buses can operate uh, on Arbutus between Broadway and Fourth Avenue. Why the 2023-20 2026 capital plan does not have this project. Maple Street, one block to the east, is a dead end street uh, at one point, and it's not a true street. So, therefore, most of the traffic will have to use a beautiful street. So, why are staff not reporting on it? Why are they hiding the truth? This is not possible in this kind of situation, you know, and people are asking the right questions. And, uh, you know, if the staff can't uh, provide the answers, then, uh, you know, <laughs> then you should table the whole matter until you get some proper answers. But uh, this this project is just another example of how bad we are, and it's all because of vision policies from the okay. council before you. You That's know. good. Let's not just yeah. uh, thank people. You. Okay, thank you so okay. much. Thank I don't you. see any questions for you, uh, so I'm going to move on to the next speaker. Uh, we have uh, Andrew Rosnicki, speaker number 76 of 260. Andrew Rosnicki. Uh, good evening, council. Uh, thank you. Uh, good evening, council. So uh, it's Andrew Rosnicki. I'm a resident of Vancouver, and I oppose this uh, rezoning application. I oppose it on the basis that it affects the interests and well-being of three vulnerable populations, and they are the homeless, 
the toddlers and school children, and women in a recovery home for alcohol and substance abuse. With all due respect, the staff report presented to Council whitewashes the areas of identifying the issues such as safety, the housing model, and addressing their resolve. We saw elements of that in the presentations by BC Housing and City staff at the opening of this public hearing the other night, where they struggled to confirm tenant composition, what services there would be, or how many staff would be on site, et cetera. Uh, as such, uh, this staff report lacks credibility and should not be relied upon. The housing model on which this proposal is based is flawed, as it is based on a failed old school thinking. The downtown, the downtown east side is one example we can all relate to. Forever a homeless pity and failure. This raises the question, will imposing the same model of housing only on a large scale in Kitsilano also be a failure? What it will do is segregate the homeless into a warehouse type community in which the sole benefit is limited to putting a roof over their heads. And by that, I mean one common roof and a high rise building with 129 SROs and there lies the problem. This is like a warehouse that will round up those battling with personal life issues such as mental health and addiction into one single location. It provides little, if any, opportunity or support to constructively deal with their respective issues so that they can move forward with their lives. There will be no criminal record checks, so no one will have any idea whether there will be tenants with violent histories, drug trafficking, sexual predation, child okay. molesters, okay. etc. Okay. That's good. Let's uh, not comment on the potential characteristics of uh, folks here. Let's keep right. to the... Thank you. Okay. All right, so uh, in addition to this, there will be a, a, a drug injection site, and this is an administration of hard drugs. Now, if you look at a street map of the locations proposed, house, proposed housing, what does one see? It's situated directly across the street on the west side of a school, or sorry, on the east side of a school, right, with over 500 school children. And there, there's also a preschool and that's only 20 meters away. On the north side, directly across the street, is a toddler's park and playground where parents go with their kids to give them fresh air and exercise as there is no other outdoor green space nearby. Again, this is only 20 meters away. On the east side, right next door, a women's recovery house. Those who are trying to escape the clutches of alcohol and substance abuse and sometimes violence. So what we have here are two vulnerable populations children of all ages and recovering women, both who are in no position to be exposed to the adult life issues the homeless with criminal record, with no criminal record checks would bring with them here. In fact, many will bring their drug addictions with them. The proposed housing would okay, be right uh, in the speaker, middle of these vulnerable uh, populations. Speaker, I, I've warned you once, Speaker, we're not going to comment on the potential of, of uh, folks that may live in this Premise. We're, we're keeping it general, so you've got one more chance. Keep going. All right. Us. Okay. All right. So I'll, I'll, I'll turn on to the, the subject that this site will have an on-site drug injection. It would be in the immediate vicinity of the school children and recovering women. This is the administration of hard drugs. How is that government, how is it that governments see no issue with this or have a policy for yet they have strict guidelines for locations of cannabis and liquor stores close to schools. So, and we are directly across the street, I, I remind you, from school children and youngsters with their parents in, to in a toddler's park and next door to a women's recovery center. Now, there is a better, better model though, and I refer you to the peer-reviewed study by Dr. Julian Summers of Summon Fraser University, as has been previously referenced. This model provides the homeless with support and opportunity by integrating them with the community as opposed to warehousing them. It showed that the way forward is scattered styled housing instead of segregated congregate housing as in this proposal. By the way, this report was apparently presented to David Eby last year, but as to date, he has not acknowledged it. Thanks, that is so, your five minutes. Uh, appreciate all right, you. I, 
thank you for phoning in tonight. And uh, I don't see any questions for you, so we're going to move to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Council. Uh, next speaker is uh, number 77, Garnet Clatt. Hello, can you hear me? Sure can. Up to uh, five minutes. Okay. You're ready. Thank you. My name is Garnet Clatt, and I'm a resident of Vancouver, and I oppose this rezoning application. 13 floors of permanent modular construction, actually equivalent to close to 18 floors in height, is too tall. 129 single occupancy units with 50 to 100% housing targets at the shelter level is not a good fit for this site. There are over 1,500 students within three blocks, including an elementary school directly across the street, numerous daycares, and a women's recovery house next door, and a toddler park within 20 meters. The harm reduction approach this development is taking poses risk to women in recovery at the women's supportive recovery home next door and compromises their own recovery. A building to house the homeless can be provided at this location if it appropriately considers the proximity of the elementary school, sorry, elementary school and park across the street and implements the right measures. This proposal does not do that as, a BC, as BC Housing has confirmed. It will use harm reduction approach. The approach may, entirely, may be entirely reasonable and suitable for some who suffer from addiction but is not compatible with children. And the city has a bylaw that prohibits cannabis stores from being within 300 meters of schools, yet is not considering appropriate measures when there is an elementary school across the street. Kids has many supportive group homes to support individuals on a smaller scale, and they work in the neighborhood. This plan goes against BC Housing's guidelines of 50 to 40 to 50 supported housing tenants in one building. In addition, the site takes away valuable green space in the neighborhood that is only, has only one small park that serves the residents of the neighborhood bound by arterial roads of Burrard, McDonald, 4th Avenue, and Broadway. The recent, approval of ap the recent approval of application at Knight and King Edward, also referenced as a rationale to support this motion, is entirely different. It is not across the street from an elementary school. It's across the street from a large residential complex of towers is not, not anywhere near the transit hub or SkyTrain station or bus loop. It is located at the intersection of two arterial roads. I urge you to reject this rezoning application with feedback to BC, BC Housing to go back and offer housing that is suitable to the neighborhood. Thank you. Thanks for your time tonight. I uh, don't see any questions for you, so I'll thank you very much for calling in. I'm going to move to number uh, uh, speaker number 78, who's Andrew Keller, and it says in person here, but um, I'm not sure if that's true. Andrew Keller, are you there? I'm on the phone. I was unable to show up in person. Is that acceptable? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, please go ahead up right. to five minutes. Thank you very much. I'm Andy Keller. Uh, I'm a renter, and I live in Kitsilano. I support affordable housing. However, I oppose this rezoning proposal. I oppose the proposal because it is short-sighted, it is divisive, and it distracts all of us from what should be a golden opportunity to build more affordable housing for all people. Housing is not a prize. It is not a reward. It is a necessity. It is a starting point, not an end point. If you rezone this site and approve the construction of a 50-meter tall building, you use this issue to justify a CD1 area and to build more 40-story towers like the one that will stand atop the Granville SkyTrain station. Will any of the units in those towers be affordable? To satisfy real estate developers and investors, you are willing to sacrifice the health, the happiness, and the well-being of children, of seniors, of the destitute, of an entire community. We face multiple crises and the city of Vancouver needs to act in three ways. One, the city needs to stand for all its people. This means establishing rapport and building trust with community stakeholders. This means creating desirable, affordable housing in every neighborhood. This means not stripping people of their agency. Two, the city needs to heal all its people. We need to improve social connectedness through housing, and safe, through housing safety and stability, and by providing services and supports. 
These include mental health, job training, positive relationships with landlords, and peer mentors who will act as navigators, helping to engage with the newly housed and creating a safe space. This is about dignity and respect. Three, the city needs to invest in all its people. We need to integrate social services, harm reduction, and safety measures with input from community stakeholders, academic research, evidence-based approaches, and sustained proactive public policy. We need the city to be transparent and to coordinate public support, not dismiss our suggestions and contributions for the design and the delivery of this proposal. We need timely, credible, and reliable information to measure progress, to understand the city's responses, and to demonstrate accountability. Affordable housing needs to be present in every neighborhood, not kept at arm's length and segregated because of socioeconomic status or any other factor. Affordable housing needs to be an asset to every community. Critically, this is about priorities and trade-offs. Funding exists for the World Cup, for an Olympics bid, and only until recently because the public became furious with government officials, the Royal BC Museum. Why then is it so difficult to properly fund affordable housing, healthcare, schools, parks, community centers, libraries? These choices are reprehensible. The crises that we face are dynamic and they require innovation, not towers. Neither the City of Vancouver nor BC Housing have demonstrated that this proposal will be an asset to the community. At best, it is a half-hearted stopgap measure. Reject this rezoning proposal so that we may move forward together, so that we may succeed together. Thank you. Thanks. You do have questions from Councillor Hardwick. Uh, Well-articulated position, thank you. But at the heart of it, what we're being told is use it or lose it. If we don't develop this in this particular location at this particular height and massing with this particular configuration, the money will go away. And the argument is that it's better to build something that's imperfect and get the money and do it uh, than not. How would you respond to that? I think the question needs to be phrased to the BC provincial government and to the federal government, why they're putting the city of Vancouver in such a position. Why are they effectively holding the city hostage, allowing something that could be better, could serve the people of the city hostage, and are effectively playing us versus them? Why should, if, 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 if Vancouver did not have something perfect, why can they not take the time to make something better? And why should other people in the province, why should they not be able to have the money? Why should people elsewhere in the province suffer? Just because a building is imperfect. That's, that's incredible. Well, thank you for so what, your... It's, it's, like... Sorry? Uh, it just seems it it seems it seems like a very old political game, us versus them, and I think the question has to be thrown back to be to, to the BC provincial government and the federal government. How dare they? Well, thank you for your input and your candor. Thank you. Thanks. That's it for questions. Uh, appreciate you phoning in tonight, and I'm going to move to the next speaker. <clears throat> speaker seventy nine, Robin Chan. Hi. Can you hear me? I sure can. Up to five minutes, please. Great. Uh, thank you, Mayor Stewart and councillors for the opportunity to speak to you today. My name is Robin Chan, and I'm calling in to speak in support of the proposal. I know there's a lot of people after me, so I will try to keep this super brief. I want to speak to three main points. First, I'm a mother, and my two children attend daycare close to the proposed building, and they play in nearby Delamont Park, and I support this proposal. I hope that my children grow up knowing that cities are for everyone and that everyone deserves to live in every neighborhood. I would much rather explain to my children why social housing is allowed near their school and why it may cast a shadow on the park where they play than have to explain why we allow people to sleep on the streets. 
Second, discussion about safety and of the potential future residents of the proposed building. And as a mom, I completely understand that we want to keep our children as safe as possible. But when I think about that, I sometimes have to ask, have to ask myself, is, do I feel unsafe or do I feel uncomfortable? And more often than not, the answer to that is that I'm just uncomfortable, which is a totally, completely normal way to feel when we're faced with changes that are not completely within our control. But to take that further, I have to ask myself why I feel that way and what are the systemic, colonial, and patriarchal things that are contributing to that and why might I feel like my feeling of being uncomfortable is more important than somebody else's right to the city and right to safe housing. And of course, it's not more important. We all have the same right to the city, regardless of our circumstance or our income or the type of housing that we live in. Third, uh, I'm a resident of Falls Creek South, and I live basically right between Margaret Mitchell and Hummingbird Place Temporary Modular Housing. So my family and I are very, very familiar with living and playing within close proximity to low barrier housing. And so I want to reassure people who are calling in and are worried about what this building means for their neighborhood that it has not been an issue here at all. In fact, our community embraced the temporary modular housing and that has paid off. Residents from both buildings are our neighbors. We share our public spaces. Residents have volunteered at our block parties before COVID. Margaret Mitchell Place has in fact been so successful here, but the community advisory committee that was set up disbanded because there weren't any more issues and visioning for the future of Falls Creek South has always included how to make that housing permanent within the neighborhood and even expand it. Vancouver plan is coming up for council's consideration very soon and it calls for an equitable approach to housing across the city. This is one very important example of that. So I ask you to please support this proposal. Thank you. Thanks so much for uh, phoning in tonight and sharing your views. Um, I don't see any questions for you, so I'll just, uh, again, thank you. And um, before I move to the next speaker, uh, Council, just um, want to remind folks that if you're, um, we, I'm just checking with the clerks, we have three people on the line to speak. Um, <clears throat> and we've sent reminders to speaker up to, up to speaker 120. However, we are now trying to get speakers 84 to 120 to phone in. The number is 1833-353-8610, 1833-353-8610, code 106-1445-POUND. And of course, we're making those announcements on Twitter and uh, the live stream too. So if you are, um, I'm right now currently on speaker number 80 and um, we're looking for speakers 84 to 120, uh, thinking that we won't make it past that number tonight. Um, 120, that is. And with that, I'm going to move to speaker number 80, who is uh, in person, uh, Dominic. Uh, speaker 80 is not in the chamber. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to move to the next speaker then. Speaker number 81 is James Ashenden. Speaker number 81, James Ashenden. Yes, my name is James Ashenden. I'm a resident of this the neighborhood of Kitsilano and Arvidus Ridge for the last 20 plus years and a resident of Vancouver for over 35 years. I just want to thank you for your service on this evening. Uh, it being the beginning of the long weekend, uh, I'm sure uh, most people have lots better places they would rather be than a, in a, um, a chamber listening to people. So I thank you for your service. I would say that I am opposed to this specific project, that, uh, yeah, but I'm not opposed to uh, help uh, social housing on this site if it was done right. The other thing I would like to first uh, bring to the attention of all the council members is something that happened in Calgary this just this past winter where they closed two uh, LRT stations, including one that Chinook Center Station would be the equivalent of Metrotown here in Vancouver. And the reason for this was there was so much uh, lack of public safety because drug dealers were in there creating a drug superstore that the police could not guarantee the public safety other than at rush hour. 
Now, why, you, why am I saying that? Well, I'm going to come back around to that. One of the things that I've noticed in this uh, discussions is that there's been very little reference until very recently about the location that it is. this proposal is right across from a transit station. The, uh, specific, the specific development is going to be there for up to 60 years. Now, you have to consider the uh, location of the transit as an entry and exit for the area. And it could become, because of its location, because, as a negative project with frequent police, ambulance intervention, and other problems, such as those at the Calgary LRT. Now, Previously, there has been an indication of all the other issues that have been brought forward regarding this specific pro pro uh, proposal, such as its location, the park, near the school, near the church, near other social housing, the shading, the Arbutus Green uh, Way. In particular, the operational uh, operation of the uh, of the project and the vagueness in which it is talk, talked about and how the operator that is proposed does not have equivalent experience in a project of this size. So I want to emphasize that the other designs and locations did not have these sets of amenities, particularly in my case, the transit stop. And I think the council should consider the operational and social implications of it being right at the terminus, probably for 10 to 20 years of the transit, as well as the main bus loop leading out to UBC along West Broadway. So I think it's uh, an inappropriate design that could be built back, built better. And it's a design that you have to remember is going to be there for probably up to 60 years. So as I said again, hopefully you consider it and build it better, not as it's proposed. Thank you. Thanks for your time tonight. I don't see any uh, questions for you, so I am going to move to the next speaker. Uh, but thank you for calling in tonight. Um, Council, the next speaker is uh, Mina Wong. Speaker number 82, Mina Wong. Uh, no, 82 is not on the line. Thanks, clerks. Uh, we have speaker number 83, then Michael e Yapinche. Yapinche? Good evening. Yes, I'm in chambers. Thank you so much. Uh, you have up to five minutes whenever you're ready. Good evening, Mayor Stewart and City Councillors. My name is Michael Yapinche. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. My wife, two young children, and I are residents of Vancouver. I work in Kitsilano, and my children attend school in Kitsilano as well. I've had the pleasure of meeting many of you uh, before a public hearing um, was, uh, was referred to you um, as the principal of St. Augustine School. But today I'm here not as a principal, but uh, speaking as a concerned citizen and parent. My wife and I have deep concerns with the proposed BC Housing Project, and we strongly oppose the rezoning application. My wife and I are very aware that the need for housing for the homeless in Vancouver is crucially important, and we are raising our children to understand that assisting the marginalized and those in need is a priority. However, a major concern is the location of the proposed development and its proximity in particular to a school, which services a vulnerable population itself, over 450 children aged 3 to 13 years old. Both the proposed residents and school-aged children have very important and potentially complex needs, and putting two vulnerable populations directly across the street, 18 meters from each other, each with their own specific needs and vulnerabilities, is simply not a recipe for success in any neighborhood. In addition, because BC Housing will not commit to requiring the operator to provide a min minimum level of s staffing for the building or minimum level of support, services, and resources until each resident is identified, we are left with very serious unanswered questions and uncertainty. What will be the consequences of this? Will the proposed rezoning successfully meet the needs of the, of the intended residents, the children attending the school across the street, the toddler park just to the north, 
the women's recovery home next door, and other residents in the neighborhood. A heightened level of care and attention is required to ensure that all these distinct populations not only coexist, but also succeed and thrive. This is not in place in this rezoning application, as you've heard many other speakers before me point out. Waiting until the operational phase of the development is simply too late, and any action then would simply be, as a speaker noted earlier on, a Band-Aid fix. As I'm sure you can agree, prevention, not reaction, is needed. Guarantees, not assurances, are needed. Furthermore, coupled with the continued densification of the neighborhood, as well as the increased congestion and challenges to traffic management due to the construction of the Broadway subway project, terminus and bus loop, traffic safety is also a big concern. As thoroughly demonstrated by previous speakers, because the Arbutus site does not have laneway access and no setbacks, all traffic servicing, servicing the building, such as taxis, deliveries, pickup and drop-off services, and emergency vehicles would likely be pushed onto surrounding streets. The rezoning application as proposed would contribute to and exacerbate existing traffic safety issues. As residents of the Olympic Village, my family and I are very familiar with how the introduction of two supportive housing developments and a third not too far away has impacted and changed our neighborhood in just a few short years. My experience is different from the speaker just a couple of speakers ago. Um, my home is sandwiched between the Marguerite Ford Building and the temporary modular housing development Hummingbird Place on West First Avenue. I live the reality of the data and statistics that other speakers have pointed out concerning police and emergency calls to these establishments. In fact, I've reported several incidents myself since these developments went up. Based on my lived experience, Minister Eby is incorrect when he said earlier this month, and I quote, I think that once the building's been operating for a bit, the community will see that it works well. Minister Eby's logic that everything settles down within six to nine months is simply incorrect. The Marguerite Ford has been up for nine years, and if multiple police and emergency calls every week, and indeed every day, is any measure, then we have to seriously question what works well. Councillors, I can only imagine what it must be like for you, to write, for you right now to have to listen to over 250 presentations on this topic. I think, Mayor Stewart, you said 16 hours, potentially 32, and you're only a third of the way through. I'm grateful that you're asking all the questions you are asking. This decision is a big one. This is a 60-year lease that will have long-term lasting impacts. It must be the right decision. Continue asking your questions, and if you don't get the right answers, please do not vote this in. My family and I respectfully ask that you take the time to thoroughly consider all the research, all the documents, all the data, all the science, and all the comments put before you, not only at this hearing, but since last fall, and really listen to your voters and oppose the proposed rezoning. The different stakeholders in the neighborhood are not asking you to vote this down for the wrong reasons. They're asking you to vote it down at this point in time, because of its current form, for all the right reasons so that we can go back to the drawing board and have meaningful consultation and discussion and determine something with which the community can truly partner that can be safe, successful, and thrive at this site. Thank you. You do have a bunch of questions from councillors. I'll start with Councillor Hardwick first. Councillor Hardwick, up to five minutes. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. It has sometimes been characterized as the residents and, and even the school across the street as being selfish and lacking in charity in their response to this application. And that objecting to this um, in the face of the most vulnerable of our society um, is bad. And I'm wrestling with that. And I, as someone that works in a a Christian school environment where you're teaching children to be charitable and understanding uh, of the most vulnerable in society. How do you reconcile that? I think our experience with Sancta Maria House uh, speaks to that. Uh, it is a recovery home that we support and work closely with. And we speak from that experience that a smaller model of care that is successful where our children can walk through the front doors and feel safe and uh, continue to contribute to the uh, reintegration and recovery of uh, individuals. Uh, I don't think that speaks uh, contrary to, to our Christian values. But the notion is, um, you know, there are unhoused that need to be housed now at all costs. And if 
we were told by BC Housing that if we don't take what is being offered at this point, it'll go somewhere else. We'll lose the opportunity. Well, what would I, you say to that? Well, I'll, I'll be honest. I, I, I did not know that the funding would be pulled until I heard what was discussed here at the public hearing. But I don't think that, um, that um, you know, pushing through with the wrong project that could potentially put children's safety at risk. Um, I don't think that, uh, I don't think that should go, that should be funded. I, I just don't. Well, ultimately the city owns the land, but it needs to be developed. And, and I think everyone agrees that it needs to be developed for some form of social housing. Yeah, yeah, um, we have not, um, or, you, you know, we've, we've said all along that uh, supportive housing, social housing, we've, we've, we're not opposed to that. Um, it's just that this particular site, this proximity to vulnerable populations um, and the size of and density of this and the composition of the tenants, just I, I think that that combination needs to be revisited. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Kirby -Ann. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. Um, and thanks, Michael, for coming to speak. Um, the question that I have for you, because uh, you're obviously coming into this um, with sort of a dual perspective in, in terms of your role as a principal, but then you spoke also to your experience as a resident living near Marguerite Ford. And I'm wondering if in that specific situation, because you're obviously bringing that perspective into this, are you aware, were there any mitigating measures that were attempted to be taken at Marguerite Ford um, that could have been successfully applied here? Was there a resident advisory committee? Was there any opportunity to engage in that? Is there any parallels that you could bring forward to the site? Or do you feel that it was just problematic in terms of the model and approach to how that particular um, facility was tenanted? I'm, I'm trying to draw a parallel into this specific application. The, the only parallel I can, I can speak to you, unfortunately, I don't know how it's run or managed uh, in any detailed way, but I do know that it's a congregate housing model, and that um, it was said earlier that uh, what you what what, what uh, you see in the streets is, is simply replicated in the building, and and that's that's been my experience, regrettably, um, and I, it it does not feel um, like it is well supported. Okay, um, and with respect to the sort of the argument that was brought up. Um, by some councillors, or the, not an argument, perhaps a question that was raised as a consideration um, with potentially losing this funding. Council has um, turned down project opportunities before and lost funding from BC Housing. So would you say that that would be inconsistent to use as an argument that we should be guided more by trying to develop something that's going to be successful for decades as opposed to um, simply accepting funding or as opposed to shaping the funding and trying to deliver a successful project that supports yeah, and community and that can actually that can integrate trying to look for that that, uh, that absolutely. Balance. yeah absolutely i think you should have to say in how to shape that uh, that funding use it in a way that uh, is successful uh, for okay. the success of the can entire you neighborhood about, can you also share a little bit about what your experience was like in the public engagement um as a principal of the school you're obviously and, and immediately across the street did you have a chance to participate in the focus group sessions that um, BC Housing ran? Did they reach out to you as a separate stakeholder? What was your engagement like? They, they, they did reach out to us uh, uh, initially and we did meet with them on a couple of occasions, but um, the answers were always the same, unfortunately, that um, it, would, it would be like this and these things would, would be, uh, we could not guarantee these and I spoke to assurances and guarantees and uh, unfortunately, every time we asked if there could be any assurances, uh, I'm sorry, sorry, guarantees and enforceable measures that could be in place to ensure safety, um, um, we were just constantly told that um, it would depend on the residents who would be residing there, and that uh, th that was all that we were able to uh, to get. Okay, thank you. That's my time. Thank you, Councillor Dominato. Up to five minutes. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Thanks, Michael, for coming in. 
Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Um, following on Councillor Kirby Young's question about um, engagement, uh, either through our staff or through BC Housing, um, given uh, your role as principal of the school, I'm curious if they spoke to you about um, uh, the lessons learned from Marguerite Ford, because that seems to be the example that's been raised by a number of speakers, and how um, the tenanting approach has changed over time as a result of lessons learned from that, and, and some of the tools that they use to tenant uh, supportive housing uh, to a sort of, I would say, um, sort of come to the right mix uh, that's going to allow a supportive housing to be successful. Did BC Housing talk to you about that? No, um, they did talk to us, however, about uh, community advisory committees being formed. But again, like one of the earlier speakers said, community advisory committees are more of a reactionary committee that brings problems to the table that then need to be solved after the fact. Okay, well, that's, that's helpful context. Um, I'm surprised by that, but again, I, we can follow up with staff. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm also curious from your perspective and, and recognizing that you're saying you're drawing on your experience, um, you know, lived experience near Marguerite Ford. Um, do you see an opportunity for uh, something to be successful there to coexist, if you will, uh, with the school uh, if um, there were um, appropriate conditions or, or considerations um, identified for um, the housing? Yes, absolutely. I think the, the harm reduction model has to be replaced with at the very least a recovery-based approach and model, which, as I understand, comes with minimal levels of supports that are integral to the recovery process and reintegration for the tenants. Okay. Um, uh, that, that's all I have for questions right now. Thanks, Mayor. Thanks, Councillor. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Weed, what's up next? Five, up to five minutes. Councillor Weed. Yeah, first question. We heard earlier about the use of the church site for programming for the school. Can you talk about the, the use of the other site to the east of the project and how many students a day go between the two sites? That, um, you're referring to the, the church and the, yeah. the campus, I guess you could say, of St. Augustine's Parish. Yeah, uh, we, we often walk uh, different classes at different times, walk daily. And multiple times weekly between the school and the church for things like mass, for celebrations, for um, seniors' lunches. We work very closely, a very interconnected community, the church, St. Augustine's Church and St. Augustine's School. Daily, we use, we use that, and our kids walk class by class, sometimes entire, the entire school over to the church and back throughout the day. Okay, and I know, I know when you spoke to counselors earlier, you also had some suggestions about traffic calming on 7th and opportunities for crosswalks and others. Yes. Did you feel that your um, solutions or ideas have been incorporated into the project you see before us? No. Are you no. able to speak to a couple of the ones that you were surprised yeah. that didn't get incorporated? I'm, I'm sorry, that was very blunt of me, but I just think about um, Christina Doyle's presentation the other day, who is a parent at the school. I sit on the same advisory committee as her. Um, yes, everything that we talked about, about making that that intersection of Seventh and Arbutus, um, that has, you know, that, that Tracy Cooper from the Broadway Subway Project, vet, veteran uh, in, in this field, uh, supported, um, but it just was ignored, uh, unfortunately. Okay, appreciate that. And if community advisory committee was to be opened up, would you be open to joining it? We would be if if, if that if this did happen, we we, we would be. We're hoping it doesn't come to that and that uh, we can be part of a community advisory committee for a better project. Okay, thank you very much, appreciate it. Thanks so much. Uh, I just have a quick question for you. I think one of your colleagues um, was on earlier and said that you're planning to expand the school, is that correct? Uh, we're in the middle of a capital uh, building project, yes. We've finished building the school proper. Um, and we still need, uh, uh, the final phase of the build is the school gym. So the gym has not yet been completed. We're still fundraising oh. for that. So you've already built the, uh, you've kind of maxed out on the on the construction side and, and you're uh, just finishing a gymnasium, but that's the extent of the construction that, happening on the That's correct, that's right. But the, the, the construction of the gym also includes a re-landscaping of the courtyard so that right. it is level to, to Arbutus. Okay, great. Thanks so uh, thanks for that information. I'm going to go to uh, Councillor Fry next. Yeah, um, thanks. And thanks, Principal Yabathay. Uh, 
Nice to see you here. Um, I'm curious. Um, so we've talked months ago, and 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 certainly um, we've seen. I believe since the 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 first iteration of this project, we've seen some changes. Um, I think that we're sort of conducive to where you were looking at things as far as the tenanting. So it moved. It, w it was going to be 100% supportive housing, and it's since moved towards sort of a um, half supportive housing and half low end market. Is that? Do you see that as a positive step forward? I, the language, I think, in has to be changed in the application because it says minimum 50%. As, as was expressed by other speakers before me. So I, I, okay, but, it's, it's, but it's, if, if we were to take it at, at, at a 50-50, that is a step in the right direction. A step in the right direction, perhaps, but uh, just the, the, the density, the size of this uh, development doesn't seem aligned with uh, the other successes in, of BC Housing, uh, that BC Housing draws from, which are smaller, 50 units. I guess, but but this is is this is only sixty units of supportive housing, and sixty units of low end market housing. Like I said, I think so, it's a step in the right direction, but it's, it's yeah, it's so, still, it's and, still and, poses and, concerns. And so there was another comment that you'd made about, and then I think Councillor Weeb kind of touched on on that as well. And, and the comment was around um, that advisory committees are formed only sort of when there's a, an issue, and it's sort of as a reactive rather than a proactive. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I just, you know, reflecting on, I know how the, the Reederman residence, um, which was, is the one out of Marpole and that's 78 units of two, two buildings of 70, combining 78 units of supportive housing. And there was a lot of anxiety around that, which is more supportive housing than we'll be seeing potentially at this location. Uh, but with 78 units, there was a lot of anxiety in the community. And, and I know that, that there was a different approach. And in fact, the director of planning at the time, Gil Kelly, because it didn't go through a rezoning, it went through a, 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 a design permit review or a development permit review. And he, he you know, made them go through a, a community advisory committee with representatives from the school on the community advisory committee. And, and to my knowledge, there's been no issues at all. Um, but, but I think, Councillor, I think that speaks to the fact that there was collaboration <laughs> between the school and the, the project um, so that certain... Uh, measures and certain requirements were in place for tenant tenanting, and, and I, I, I don't I, I can I can't confirm this, but I do I do understand there there are a lot there's a lot more uh, litigation involved in making sure that that um, that process was was in place. Um, I, I can't speak to that fully, uh, but that's what what's what I understand. Oh, for sure, this is this and this is new territory for us as well. But uh, but I do know that that seventy eight units uh, that the Community advisory committee came about at design permit or development permit stage, rather than so oh, which yeah. happens after rezoning. So, so I, you're I'm, correct, I'm you're correct to me. I stand corrected. Then that's that's great. If if it comes at a preventative stage, that I, I, I fully support it. Yeah. Well, and and I and I hope we can land something that that works well with with uh, with the school and the parish. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Thanks, uh, Councilor Dayton. Over next. Thanks very much. Thanks for your presentation. And, and uh, I was able to cross off some questions from some of the questions you'd answer. But you had said that you might be willing to, to sit on an advisory committee. But what would you intend to get out of that? Like, would you expect that that advisory committee would actually, for lack of better words, have teeth? As in, it wouldn't just be, here are some recommendations, but you might not implement these. It would instead be a contract where you know, what the advisory committee sort of, you know, saw fit, that, th that there would be action there. But I think that's the, that's the, one of the issues is that advisory committee simply provides advice. It's not enforceable, correct? Uh, I, it would all depend. I'm not quite even sure how that would work. <laughs> yes, that is my line here. It's, uh, it's a it's a clarifying I'm question. Just moving into my next question. I was Thank answering you. the question that I couldn't answer the question there, Mayor Stewart. Thanks. Yep. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, does, does it does it concern you at all that, you know, there have been um, other applications to your point that, you know, there have been good neighbor agreements and those good neighbor agreements haven't been followed through? Yeah, that's a, that's been a concern of ours and that's why we, we need something contractual, um, but, but more, more than just good neighbor agreements. 
And more than just an advisory And just more than just an advisory committee that could provide advice that may or may not be taken into consideration, yes. Okay, and can I ask you, um, you know, and, and you don't have to answer this, but are you concerned, have you heard from the parents in your school that there, there may be enrollment issues, that they may consider withdrawing their children, that there's that type of fear? If this were to go ahead without any any consideration for the concerns that have been shown from the community? That is actually already a reality. We've lost a few families. Okay. I'm sorry to hear that. I, I did have to ask the question we, though. We are too, yes. Um and, and can I ask you, would would this be something if if council refer you know, the mayor laid it out, this is what council can do in a public hearing, we can prove something. We can deny something or we can refer it back to staff. Would you be willing to work with BC Housing and our staff um, to to bring together a model where it was more than an advisory committee? Your school had some input and you know that input was heard. Do you think that that might be a good step forward? After this is defeated or <laughs> if well, this is I, I can't, passed. I can't, I have to keep an open mind. So <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm saying, I, I welcome any I welcome any opportunity to collaborate. Okay, to collaborate. Um and, and can I can I just ask, are you, are you speaking in support or opposition of the current proposal? I oppose this this rezoning application. I just want to be very clear on that. So I appreciate that and thank you so much. Uh, thank sorry you, for the question. That's okay. Uh, Thanks, Councillor. Thank you. Oh, okay. All right. I just want to thank the speaker. I do have two minutes, Mayor. I haven't been asking very many questions, but thank you very much. And sorry that, that we only have uh, such a short amount of time. But I appreciate your presentation. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Carr, up to five. Yes, um, thanks so much, uh, uh, Principal Yipchinji. Um, really appreciate you taking the time and also um, for touring around um, councillors, uh, making sure that we, before this was referred to public hearing, I think that was. That was very useful. Thank you um, for coming. There's so, um, there's many issues at play here. There's the sort of the building size and um, shadowing and um, uh, street and traffic safety um, uh, and, uh, and, the, and the concern around the tenanting and supports for the tenants and concerns for the safety of children. So my question to you is this, um, if some of the if the issues resolve, uh, were resolved around the safety of the children, and that might include issues around the tenanting and supports for the residents, as well as uh, traffic-related um, issues, um, would you, and do you think you, the people that you, um, you also represent would be um, okay about the building size the shadowing issues. I'd like to say a simple yes, but uh, it's, it's hard to imagine that something this big, a structure this big and this dense, um, without proper measures, could fully be safe. So, oh, it, size itself, or the number of people. Just, just based on what we've heard from BC Housing and others, that the optimal size is to be able to support uh, is 50, 50 tenants. This is a big structure right. and a lot of tenants. Right. If it was at, at 50%, it would be close to that, 50, right? If it was 50% max, not, not, I know you've used the term minimum, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? So it is an, a number. Well, okay. Um, are you open to hearing um, that? Or, and I'd be open. Yeah, I'd be open to hearing what, what measures would be in place to ensure that safety. Right. Is. Okay. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, uh, Councillor Carr. Uh, Councillor Swanson, up to five. Just clarifying questions. Yeah, thanks so much for coming in to speak. You're welcome. So, at the end of all the speakers, and before we make a decision, the applicant gets to make comments. And what I'm wondering is there anything the applicant could say that would get you to support the project? And if so, what would that be? Oh. I'd have to think about that one. I think a big thing would be um, this is how we ensure the safety of the community. Um, recognizing that there are vulnerable populations competing with each other. Um, 
That's a hard one, Councillor. I'd, I'd, I'd have to think about it fully. Okay, thank you. That's it. Okay, thanks, Councillor Swanson. Uh, that's it for questions for a speaker. Thanks Thank you. so much for coming in. Yeah, appreciate it. And we're going to move on to our next uh, speaker. Uh, Council, it is 8 o'clock, uh, and we're on to speaker number 84, Tony uh, Cola Braro. Uh, yes, good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor and uh, councillors and uh, fellow residents. Uh, you did good on the pronunciation there, uh, Mayor Stewart. Um, my name is Tony Colabro. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm a longtime uh, resident and proud to call uh, Vancouver home. And I'm writing and uh, calling in this evening to say I'm opposed to the rezoning application as it's been presented uh, for many reasons. But I'm limited to five minutes, so I'm going to try to keep it short uh, and concise because I know uh, it's been a long day for uh, for the council and uh, everyone else who's listening in. Um, first. I feel there's been a lack of consultation with the neighborhood, and because of that lack of consultation, you've received over 1,000 pieces of correspondence, documentation, and have over 250 people registered to speak uh, at this public hearing. And um, because of that, I feel like they haven't been heard, and they want their voice heard, and this has been their uh, opportunity. Kitsilano is an inclusive community with a history of helping people. I know this because I lived in East Vancouver, South Vancouver. I now live in uh, Kitsilano, and at one time I lived downtown. I've never seen a neighborhood that comes together like Kitsilano to help people and especially help those who need help the most. With this proposed uh, rezoning, um, how are we supposed to help our neighbors if we're setting them up for failure before the um, complex is even built uh, without any on-site clinical supports. Uh, in a neighborhood with a lack of clinical supports for mental health and substance abuse. Now, this isn't the time or place to recreate the wheel. The operators, MPA and, and several other ones that I've uh, sort of researched, have managed buildings around the 50 to 80 uh, approximately uh, uh, resident uh, uh, houses. and. They, from what I see, have been successful at uh, at doing that. The largest one I understand that uh, the um, operator chosen for this proposed project was uh, managing is Larwell, and I believe that's uh, 98 units spread over two buildings. Now, it's been stated previously um, by uh, the, um, I believe if I recall, there was an answer uh, from uh, to one of the councillor's questions about um, what recourse is available to the city if this project doesn't work? And uh, the answer basically given was there is no recourse to the city. There are no defined responsibilities at that point. We'll figure it out later. The city, the councillors, have been put in a tough spot here to make a decision, and uh, a difficult decision at that, and uh, basically approve this or lose the funding. The city has been provide, will provide the land. So basically the way I see it, this is a partnership between the multiple levels of government. They should be involved from the beginning. I, I always go back to why was this site selected? Why this place? There are other locations in the west side that I know the city owns land. And again, throughout all the consultation that I was reading before, I was never seen any information that was basically delivered why was this site chosen over other sites? And that still uh, is probably one of the biggest reasons why I'm opposing this uh, development. And uh, the uh, I also did some research into the Dunbar Apartments and Sanford Apartments. Those uh, projects seem to be working well at the 50 to 60 unit level. And if I saw something like that um, that would be proposed for this site, I probably would have been uh, not speaking in opposition tonight. I would have been uh, putting my support toward that. And uh, at the end of the day, I just, you know, I have young kids, and a lot of people have spoken who have young kids, and I just don't know why this has to be so close to a school. Uh, and these other these other um, uh, apartments are, you know, 1,000 uh, uh, meters, 800 meters from a school or anything like that. I'm happy that the city... Uh, uh, voted in the development, sorry, for the uh, Knight Street location. That seems to be, uh, you know, a good location for that, and the city has done their due diligence, it seems. But for whatever reason, the city's been put and the councillors have been put in a very tough position to 
basically approve this this uh, project, and that's why I'm calling in tonight to voice my uh, opposition to this. And I hope the council uh, does their homework. I know there's a lot of stuff to go through, but uh, I know they will make the uh, right decision for the best interest of the city, and that's why we have elected this council uh, at this time. Thank you very much. Thanks for your time tonight. I don't see uh, any questions for you, so I am going to move to the next speaker. Uh, but thank you so much for your participation. Uh, Next, we have speaker number 85, uh, Nimish Parekh. Hello. Hi there. You have up to uh, five minutes, please. Wonderful. Thank you for taking the time. Um, I am, uh, I guess it's my whole adult life in Vancouver, specifically in and around the Hastings Sunrise area. So I don't want to speak directly on the the, the building which has, uh, and the shadow and all those type of things which have been thoroughly talked about. Um, what I just want to say is, what a tough position because obviously the housing is so needed. The old SROs are falling apart. A lot of the BC housing units, as someone who's worked in many of them, you know, they're, they're running their course. They're getting old. The housing is desperately needed, um, for all sorts of people. This type of housing will be appreciated beyond, beyond belief. People who, who I hear saying, uh, Excuse me. People who are saying, "Oh, it's inhumane. It's not, you know, it's not fancy enough, or whatever terms." It is so needed. The people who receive any type of housing will be very grateful to have this or anything like it. On top of that, all sorts of housing are needed. I, uh, I'll just take a quick moment because for the rest of my time here, just to say, I went to pick up my daughter at the last day of school. Um, what do I see in the parking lot? But a tarp with a fellow who was just evicted. He's in the school parking lot. All of his items out there. Sudden downpour. Like, what's going on, sir? He's like, I was just evicted from my home. And I'm like, wow. You know, what, what can he do? The school is generous enough to let him be there. And I come home and ask my wife, who works in a harm reduction center. I was like, well, what happens to this person now? What's going to happen to him? She's like, well, he's going to get rid of all his belongings. And hopefully find a shelter for the night. This is someone who is now evicted and homeless. And with some support, all of these, so many people can avoid that transition and prevent you from having this tough decision where you have to immediately house everybody. People like him need support so they don't become homeless. Long-time renters like myself, who was recently evicted last October, now awaiting arbitration next year in February, potentially. You know, there's protections that are needed all across the board. I'd be so happy to be renting a place that was owned by the government. I pay market share. Anyway, and the government gets the profits, and I get a place where I can live and not be afraid that I'm going to be evicted, and my daughter will have to move schools, that type of thing. Anyway, it's a very tough decision you're put in, and I'm, I'm so happy we have a strong council like you who was elected to make these very tough decisions, whether you vote in favor or against it. I appreciate the work you put into it. Thank you. Thanks so much for your time. Uh, I don't see any questions for you, so I'm going to uh, go to speaker number 86, Shannon Little. Can you hear me? Sure can. Up to five minutes, please. Hello. Okay, thank you. Good evening, Mayor. Hi, good evening, Mayor and Council. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you. My name is Shannon Little, and I'm a volunteer with the Kitsilano Coalition. I have lived in Kitsilano for over 27 years, and I'm speaking here today to strongly express my opposition to this low-barrier supportive housing model being proposed by BC Housing. We have been told the model will not provide the complex care the population will require, and there are no mental health or substance use services in the neighbourhood. On Wednesday, June 22, 2022, during the 6 p.m. Global News broadcast, the Minister of Housing was reported saying, generally we find that after they have been open for a few months and things have settled down at the site, that people don't notice buildings. They really blend in nicely. The Vancouver Police Department data provided to the Kitsilano Coalition stated there were 972 calls to the Marguerite Ford building in the first two years after the residence was opened. That is a 1,700% increase in 911 calls. The Marguerite Ford Building and the project plan for West 7th and West 8th and Arbutus share some distinct similarities. They are both low-barrier supportive housing projects. 
The most striking differences, however, at the West 7th and West 8th Intervita site are the 500-child elementary school and daycare within 20 metres of the proposed site, as well as a toddler play park across the street and six other schools and daycares within a four-block radius. St. Maria's Women's Recovery Shelter, a senior's home, and the Arbutus Greenway are directly adjacent to the proposed building site. There are already significant traffic and safety challenges existing in this area, with the school pickup and drop-off times and tight access for vehicles, pedestrians, and cyclists, not to mention the additional increase in traffic that will occur once the Broadway and Arbutus subway and 99B line is completed. The confined space and inability to service this many 911 calls, with each call often being responded to by numerous emergency vehicles, represents a risk not only to the individuals needing these calls, but to the surrounding neighbourhood. Everyone deserves to have a home. No one is disputing that fact. We as a community are simply asking the City of Vancouver to consider all the other options available to accommodate everyone. Please work with us as a community. Public safety for all should be a priority for the City of Vancouver, especially for it to continue to grow, thrive, and prosper. Please take all my words, stats, and facts to heart. Thank you. Thank you for calling in tonight. I uh, don't see any speakers for uh, any questions for you, so I am going to move to the next speaker, but thanks for participating. Uh, thank you very next, much. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, Council, is. Um, <clears throat> is uh, Daniel Roberts. Just to let you know, uh, probably after this speaker, I'll just give everybody a 10 minute break because it's been a long day. So, uh, and just so speakers know, and then we can uh, make sure folks are on the line. So we have uh, speaker number 87, uh, Daniel Roberts. Um, good evening, Mayor Stewart and, uh, and Vancouver City Council. I hope you're doing well. My name Thanks is Dan Roberts and, and I'm a resident of Kitsilano. Uh, who together with my wife and four school-aged children have been residents of Kitsilano for about two, about 10 years. We live about 800 meters or four city blocks west of Arbutus and 7th, which is about a 10-minute walk from the proposed development site. Kitsilano is a great community, and one of the reasons is because of the diversity of people that live in this community. And we hope to live in this community for many more years. I am calling in opposition to the rezoning application for the property between 7th and 8th on Arbutus as it's currently drafted. I understand the urgent need to address the housing issues in the city of Vancouver for all people, especially the homeless, and feel that the site at 7th and Arbutus will be a great site for the right project, one that is smaller and integrates into the community appropriately, perhaps a project that welcomes families and children this proposed project is simply too big for the location and brings far too much uncertainty in terms of health and safety to the proposed residents as well as the existing community. I want to make a comment on a statement that was made by the applicant on Tuesday and has been discussed by other speakers both for and against the proposal. That comment was that over 57% of current supporting housing in BC is located within 500 meters of school of a school or park. I took it upon myself to do some research using Google Maps. Um, my first comment is that 500 meters is a much greater distance than 25 meters. It's about four city blocks. To put things in perspective, 250 meters is approximately the distance from West 7th and Arbutus to Broadway and Arbutus, two city blocks. According to the City of Vancouver website, there are currently 12 temporary modular home developments in Vancouver and five new proposed locations, including this one. These numbers do not include the Marguerite Four Apartments, which does not have a school within 500 meters. Of the 12 current temporary modular home developments, the closest one to a school is the Marpole development, which has been discussed. It is about 250 meters from a school, a secondary school. It is a two, three-story, it is two three-story buildings on a big piece of land that fits well into the surrounding neighborhood. Of the five new development locations, excluding this one, the closest one to school is the South Grandview Highway, which, ha which has a school within 350 meters and is a 64-unit development. The proposed project, most similar to this one that has been referenced by some speakers, is 1406 King Edward, which does not have a school within 500 meters. So to clarify, based on my, albeit you know, 
preliminary research, there are currently 0% of developments that are within 25 meters of a school. There is simply no comparable properties in Vancouver. Given this, I feel the proposal for the site is not appropriate and may create problems that the community is not equipped to handle. Most importantly, I feel that the proposed model of harm reduction supportive housing may create significant health and safety issues for both the future residents and the surrounding community. We have heard from many more informed speakers than myself that there is evidence that the proposed supporting housing model does not work and should be much smaller in size, especially given the size of the property at 7th and Arbutus and the proximity of the different types of neighbours. The proposal currently has no details or commitments from BC Housing and the operator that address the health and safety of the residents of the proposed development, the 450 plus elementary school students that will be less than 20 meters from the proposed development, the many children that live in the community and play at Delamont Park, including my children, that are less than 25 meters from the proposed development, and the many families with young children, the many fa senior families that within, will live within a few blocks of the proposed development location, not to mention the clean women's only recovery home that is less than 20 meters away from the development site. It is my understanding in listening to BC Housing and the MPA Society that the reason that there are currently no developed plans or commitments to address the potential health and safety risks associated with a supportive housing project of this size is that this is not the appropriate time to address those and those concerns will be addressed as part of the operating agreement and tenant agreement where the city and community may, may have the ability to provide suggestions on, but no ability to actually enforce. To me, this is not good enough. I urge council to diligently consider the health and safety of both the current and future community members in deciding how to vote on this proposal. For a project like this, which is the first of its kind in Vancouver, and where the applicant and the operator, despite all the great work they have done and continue to do for our city and province, Thank you. simply do not have pre- your, your five minutes, did you want to finish your sentence? <laughs> I was just going to say, please vote no. Great, okay, thank you so much. I don't see any questions for you. Really appreciate you calling in tonight and expressing your views. Um, Council, it is 8.17, so let's come back at 8.17. <laughs> And just so everybody can stretch and we can give the clerks a little break who've been saying there a long time. So we'll um yeah, we'll come back at 827. And the next speaker, just so they know, is um Alice uh Choi, speaker number 88. Okay, see you at 827.
number 88, Alice Choi. Alice Choi, speaker number 88. Hi. Hello. Hi there. Uh, thanks for calling in Hi. tonight. Uh, Hi. Uh, but just wondering, uh, you haven't provided it ahead of time. We're wondering if you are uh, a resident of Vancouver. Yes, I am. Great. You don't have to tell us anymore. That's just something we ask every speaker. Uh, so go ahead up to five minutes. All right. Hi, uh, my name is Alice, and I'm here to say that I oppose this rezoning application as I have concerns about the size and location of the building of this plan, which can put many people at risk, including those who will be housed as well. The proposal indicates 129 single occupancy units with 50% to 100% low barrier housing for homeless people who are hard to house. Major problem for the chronically homeless aren't just the lack of home. These vulnerable population with mental illness and substance abuse problems, the studies have shown that simply providing people with housing does not reduce any drug abuse issues. They need a structured environment with adequate staffing levels in place. Housing 129 single occupancy units, the size itself is too big to prevent and control any risk associated with the current announced staffing level. And at one randomized controlled trial in Ottawa, the homeless put in supported housing had a higher rate of substance abuse, mental illness, and death. Homeless people with mental illness in permanent supported housing with no adequate support in place can also increase social isolation. The tenants are, all, as I said, the tenants are also at risk when they are self-isolated behind closed doors. People with substance abuse have a high incident rate when they are using drugs alone in their private space because there's no one available to call 911 or administer naloxone, that which is an opioid reversal agent. And not to mention to address other risk factors such as missing and wandering around neighbors that is cross a close proximity to schools, daycare, and other supported living for people with disability and seniors. And the location itself raising a question on emergency response with the traffic congestion, which time is cr really critical for any emergency response. Therefore, this proposal needs to be reviewed not only for the safety of our neighbors, but also for the safety of residents who will be housed. And I do support a, I do support a supported housing model for homeless people who are hard to house, but it needs to be the right size and in the right location. Thank you. Thanks very much for your time tonight. I don't see any questions for you, so I am going to the uh, next speaker, uh, who is speaker number 88, uh, Carmen Liu. Sorry, that's speaker number 89, Carmen Liu. A speaker 89 is not on the line. Thank you, clerks. Uh, we have um, we have speaker number ninety, Maris Power. Hello, can you hear me? Sure can. Have up to uh, five minutes whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mayor Stewart and City Council for taking the time to listen to uh, all of the people who have called in this evening. I think we'd like to acknowledge that every single one of you has taken on a role in public office due to a passion to try to help people, and that should really be applauded. Um, I'm a resident of Vancouver. I'm a mum of three children, uh, and I'm a physician. Um, I look at this proposed development, and the emotion that it engenders in me is despondency. Because a project of single occupancy for 129 of our most vulnerable people in the city in a congregate housing model of higher density that's than, than is recommended by BC Housing themselves is doomed to be a failure. It's doomed, as per the study of Dr. Summers, to be an ineffective and stigmatizing form of housing for these most vulnerable people. I know from my work that we have inadequate medical, mental health and substance use support in this city and that I see no evidence of that being improved in the similar models of housing around the city. I lament the fact that this project has reached this stage before the community feels that their voices can be heard. I have encountered many homeless people over the course of my work over 17 years in the city, 
And there's a common theme amongst all of these awfully sad cases. And the common theme is when I when I hear the stories and I walk away and I talk to my colleagues and to my family, I frequently say, this poor person never had a chance. Either they were born into depravity and terrible abuse situations or had the really unfortunate situation of encountering a mental health, substance use, physical, intellectual disability that made them made it impossible for them to live in an expensive city and to achieve adequate, stable housing. So our society has failed people at many, many steps along the way here. And when I look at this development, this proposed development, I feel like, how low are we setting the bar? Why can't we be more aspirational? Why can't we look at models that have worked? Why can't we look at Finland? Why can't we look at our local data and pick a model of housing that is most likely in 10 and 20 years to lead to an improvement in our housing crisis? My feeling would be, instead of the comments I've heard earlier, make the numbers work, use it or lose it. Come on, let's be more aspirational. Let's look for a model that will actually help those that are most at need in the city. My grandfather was a psychiatric nurse who I adored and who uh, ran a large psychiatric unit and actually opened one of the first psychiatric units in Ireland to be attached to a general hospital. He believed that you don't stigmatize people by putting people all with the same problem in the same location. And you know that's exactly what this does. He also taught me that every person needs to be treated with dignity. And dignity and care and respect for people in this level of need is not provided in this model of housing. A Vancouver study back from Simon Fraser University 10 years ago, 2011, so that substance use and mental health are the major issues behind prolonged and persistent homelessness. And this study also said community involvement is vital in any work on homelessness and its conceptualization, measurement or change. I feel that our community concerns also have to be heard. This is not just a problem being an inadequate housing model. It's also that we are looking at a situation where I have two children, two of my children have disabilities. I consider them to be extremely vulnerable. And this is not a safe proposition for a neighbourhood. This neighbourhood is inclusive. It wants to support people with difficulties. It cannot support 129 people with complex needs where the support will not be provided by mental health and substance use because it just doesn't exist. I would like to see a supportive housing development here. I would like to see there being some people who need low barrier supportive housing, but a manageable number in a mixed-use facility where our community can really embrace and support us. I think this is based on our research. We know that it's better for the people, the residents that will be in, in these communities. It's also better for the community itself. And I do feel like our safety and, uh, and health and safety issues have to be acknowledged as members of this community. And I really thank you for your time this evening uh, and uh, for listening to all of our concerns. Thanks so much. I don't see anybody on the queue to ask you questions, so I'm going to go to the next speaker, but thank you for participating tonight. Uh, the next speaker is speaker number 91, uh, Nora Ma. Yes, this is Nora Ma. Hi there. You have up to five minutes. Hi, Mayor and Council. Thank you for listening to me. My name is Nora Ma, and I am a resident of Vancouver. I wholeheartedly oppose the idea of, of housing up to 129 vulnerable residents in a harm reduction high-rise setting in a busy part of the city with elementary schools and a woman's supportive recovery house so close by. The density combined with low provision of support could result in public safety issues to the dwellers, the neighbors, parents, and young children included. I am a senior, and I fear my safety may be affected as I frequent the area often as part of my daily routine. Located at the site should be affordable housing which is badly needed, that mixes singles, children, and families, and allows for a smaller number of units for the homeless with mental health and or addictions. I urge all councillors to vote no, no, no to this current proposal and reconsider a better right model. Thank you for your time. Good night. 
Thank you for your time. I don't see any uh, questions to you tonight, so I really appreciate your uh, participating. And I'm going to move to uh, speaker number 92, Jonathan O'Connor. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Sure can. Up to five minutes, please. Hi, uh, my name is Jonathan O'Connor. I've lived in Kitsilano for the past 20 years, and together with my wife, are raising three school-age children that all attend St. Augustine School and Parish. I reject this proposal unequivocally. As a slight aside, I believe it's worth mentioning that I've never engaged in the political process before on a municipal level. If nothing else, and regardless of outcome, this entire process has invigorated within me a sense of engagement, pride, and sense of connectivity with my neighbors, with their impassioned, compassionate, and well-articulated advocacy. I want to be clear, I am not opposed to the densification of our neighborhood and understand the Broadway plan is going to change the face of our community. I also want to be clear that providing affordable housing is a worthy goal, and I fully support that. On that basis, I would unequivocally support social housing built and dedicated to issues of affordability. But to be clear, at least 50% of this building, and likely more, will be to those facing issues much greater than affordability. Please focus on assisting individuals and families that need a nudge or subsidy to ensure that they can continue living, working, and contributing to our city. While it is tempting to repeat many of the points made by speakers today, I'm actually going to hopefully go in a different direction and that's more on questions around liability. I actually want to ask the council on a pointed basis, have they received a legal opinion that this project with all of its issues, such as improper consultation, deviation from acceptable planning, i.e. the setback, lack of concrete measures from DC housing or the operator on operations, will not attract liability in terms of process followed on approval of this project in its current form? I also want to know, following these hearings, are there plans to revisit the proprietariness of this process with City Legal? Also, given the trust us approach by BC Housing on the detailed operational plans for this project, is the City going to ask BC Housing to indemnify it against potential liability? These are legal questions, and they pale in significance to the moral liability of Council when and not or sorry, when and not if these concerns manifest themselves with injury to a child. The other point I would like to make, and I know time is tight, is the idea of the take it or leave it, leave it funding is quite frankly offensive. How can we actually believe this process is collaborative when we have David E. B. declaring on public radio on March 18th, the project is a done deal? Again, with the take it or leave it attitude, the suggestion is that we must take this and collaboration is all, let's be honest, a sham. Also, we had staff, MPA, and BC Housing completely rely on an anecdotal, non empirical observation on their Tuesday night presentations. It was actually shocking and led to the invigoration that is now being displayed by so many speakers about the lack of plans by BC Housing. Other things that were definitely shocking on the Tuesday night presentation was the shading. It was obviously a cherry-picked September drawing, and one of the very first speakers, and I congratulate him for his uh, uh, work on this, showed it different months rather than just one month presented by city planning. Um, so I'm just checking the rest of my notes here. Uh, I guess the only other thing I'd like to say is just even for the record, I don't know the number of convention used, but the speaker right before Speaker 80, who was in support of this, uh, did not declare that she works for city planning. Um, and so again, just process-wise, that probably should be on the record. And that is it. Councillor Hardwick has uh, questions for you. Councillor Hardwick. Yes, thank you. Um, very specifically, you talked about legal liability. Um, if you have some insight into that, uh, uh, 
would you please share with with uh, council? This is something that the city solicitor's office should be looking at. Uh, uh, of course. So again, this is basic civil liability that uh, a foreseeable danger is an act of negligence, similar to not shoveling your sidewalk and someone slipping and falling. You bear responsibility for the situation you create. City Council, having heard everything they've heard, can now not say they haven't heard it. The ostrich with his head in the sand has now been pulled up. You've been presented these issues. And frankly, any enterprising lawyer will say, here's the public record. You were advised of these issues. This came to pass, i.e. was foreseeable. You have now contributed. Thank you very much. I would appreciate an email with uh, just uh, the Cole's notes on that, if you would. Yeah. Again, I'm not a civil litigator, but I am happy to again articulate it and probably can do a better job than Orly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, that's it for questions. Appreciate you calling in tonight. And uh, Colin McGrath, speaker number 93. Hi there. Can you hear me? You can, up to five minutes. Hello. Great. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, I've modified my speech, and so I haven't time tested it, so I'm going to roll fast here in the hope that I can get through it, and um, I'll go about it. Um, my name's Colin. I'm a resident of Vancouver, and I'm speaking in opposition to this rezoning. I have family and friends who have suffered and continue to suffer from addiction and mental health challenges. I've seen the tragedy these challenges uh, have brought to them and their friends and families and their lives. I've seen how they've become isolated from general society and those who care the most for them. I've also been fortunate to see that recovery can occur. It starts by people feeling that they can come home, not home in the context of the building, but home in the context of society, family, and loved ones. Putting 129 people struggling with challenges in the same building, not allowing them to live in the same house as a family, not letting children visit or live with them does not give these people that hope. I speak for myself and for the friends and that I've mentioned when I say that if we put them into a building like this that has been proposed, we would not we would have lost them and not have brought them home. I'm not going to reiterate many of the things that speakers before me have stated around the concerns on a lack of transparency, suitability, lack of clarity, safety concerns, um, all of the things that have been um, stated in the past 17 months around this rezoning that many speakers before me have clearly articulated. I too have been ghosted by BC housing leaders and many councillors have made those connections for me and I thank them over the last year. David Eady himself made an introduction for me and I ignored. All of the evasiveness and deflections I saw again on Tuesday night, which infuriated me. My only consolation is, as one other speaker said, at least I'm in good company. For my speech to council, I want to clarify some items that were stated that night and keep being referred to. Firstly, the discussion is at the housing crisis uh, and the reasons for approving this. This is indeed a housing crisis. Nobody denies this. We have, we've been talked about it, but what's not been talked about is the mental health and addiction crisis that we have in this city. This proposal does nothing to address that crisis. Clearly, BC Housing is a developer, not an organisation that has adequate expertise in helping uh, people recover. They only seem to know how to house them. There were things that were said Tuesday that also warrant clarification. One is the comparison to the site that they hold up as the shining examples. 16th and Dunbar, run by Coast Mental Health, a good operator. Four-storey building, a mix of low, mix of uh, suites. Six suites, just from 10% uh, at the shelter rate. Uh, and all the rest that are tenants with very low needs. 600 metres from the nearest school. Seventh and third. Similarly, the Vancouver Coastal Health, well run by MPA. I have a person I know who lives there. Uh, retain, uh, taking care of those people and retaining the rest of the RT tenants, 500 metres from the school. Uh, the Marpole Riedemann site, 78 units, 150 metres and 350 metres from school. Um, and, and this site still has challenges that someone actually called me today to tell me about who's from that community. These are oranges that are being compared to apples, just as Council Fly rightly cited last night for another speaker who referred to another site he was familiar with. The other discussion around Mount Edwards and restrictions in place. The limitations at the site, 55 plus, nobody with active uh, addiction challenges. Staff uh, guaranteeing cleanup at particular intervals, all enshrined inside the housing agreement and on the title. It's not a vulnerability assessment to accomplish this. 
is binding this into the specifics of the title. As well, the ongoing discussion misrepresented that money will go away. The provincial housing site shows that there's $1.9 billion allocated over 10 years starting in 2018. These are funds that are allocated for this province and this city. DC Housing was implying and threatening these funds will go somewhere else. Our tax dollars should be well spent and, and they're not entitled to, 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 to threaten in that manner. I also confirmed with my federal MLA, Joyce Murray, that the provincial funds uh, that are being deployed are under no time constraints. This is not use it or lose it. Um, funds, funds um, I think the only reason, uh, I, th I think this is only David Eby putting pressure on the city to move this forward, and I don't think that's appropriate. Um, finally, uh, well, let me turn, um, I think what I would say is that I think it's okay for the city to push back. There's reasons why we have multiple levels of government, municipal, not to agree with one another, but to hold other levels accountable on our behalf too. And you would have everyone's support in pushing back to David Eby should he call that bluff and say no money for this housing. He has no right to say that. Finally, from the recent discussions that were mentioned on some of the items around quotes from Julian Summers, um, I think it's my understanding that those quotes are from a different study around housing stability. Housing stability is a measure of how long a person stays in a house. Um, those quotes were not from the study related to recovery-oriented housing. The recovery-oriented housing study showed that there was a 70% reduction in criminal inter interactions and a 50% reduction in medical emergencies for the people in recovery-oriented housing. The metrics that were being cited were for a different study, and they were just studying, they were deciding how long somebody actually lives in a house. And in that case, there was no difference between congregate and recovery-oriented housing, which makes sense. I want to close by asking Council to do two things. Please don't accept whatever documents BC Housing gives you in terms of their research, which is largely surveys with no controls that will ultimately have you comparing oranges to apples. None of us have ever seen any of these and we've asked for them. And so they might give them to you, but please inspect them carefully and don't accept them at value. If you don't have guarantees that they can be enforced, then please assume that it won't. Also, please don't be intimidated by BC Housing for passage to power. There are Thank reasons you, we have to remember the dimension. You are over your time, but you do have questions uh, from Councillor Hartman. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Colin. Um, it is perplexing this notion that that uh, the money would go away. One mm. thing that we know that won't go away is the land that the city owns, presumably. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so the argument then would be, since the city's land is there regardless, and if its objectives are are social housing um, that would be consistent with the successes that we heard, you know, even uh, Dunbar was an example that you gave. Mm -hmm. Do you see a, a potential path forward uh, should BC mm -hmm. housing fall out? Yeah, well, I mean, yes, I had the opportunity to talk to a, a well-known architect. I won't mention his name because he actually is fairly high profile and looking at this site. And yeah, he described it as saying, well, this is just awful from every perspective, the human perspective, the architecture perspective, perspective. But if there was an opportunity to bring something that fitted together, mixed housing, absolutely, shelter rate. Uh, the right portion, small portions, as, as to the summer study, 5%, less than 10%, mixed in with families and all those things, integrated in the community, is actually, you know, words were, this could be a groundbreaking site. This could be an amazing project. And that's what everyone's been asking for, and it's just been denied outright and not even, not even, not even considered. So, yes, I think that no one's opposed to supportive housing and social housing, whatever we're calling it, because they're so, so interchangeable today on that site, not me. That's an um, interesting question. Thank you very much. Appreciate your input. Thanks. That's Thank it for you. question. Thanks. Going to move on Thank to the you. next. Thanks for calling in. Uh, next is uh, Mary Lee, speaker number 94. Speaker number 94 is not on the line. Thank you, clerk. So just got to mark that one. Okay. Uh, speaker number 95, Joanna Roberts. Hello. Hi there. You have up to five Hi. minutes. Hi there. Go okay. right ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Joanna Roberts. I live with my family in Kitsilano, and I oppose this proposal. 
Thank you for taking the time to listen. I will keep this short, as so many have said in my thoughts already. I have many concerns about this proposed development, including that it is so close to an elementary school. However, I wanted to focus more on my concerns for the future residents of this building. I support that this site may be used for social housing, but I feel that in the current plan, there are too many unknowns and many questions have not been answered. The people that will live in this building deserve specific plans for how they will be supported, be safe, and be living in an environment that helps not just to provide shelter, but integrates them into the community. A more research and detailed plan must come into play so that the residents there can grow with integrity. There needs to be a guarantee of a balance and diverse mix of people, extensive support, if necessary, preventative measures that will help their quality of life and their potential. Without these specific plans in place ahead of time, there lies too many dangers for both those people living inside and outside of the housing development. Thank you. That's all I have. Thanks so much for your time. Um, that There are no questions for you, so I'm going to go to the next uh, speaker. Thanks for calling in, though. Um, Let's see, uh, we have uh, speaker number 96, Christina Lee. I'm not on the line. Thank you, clerks. Uh, we have Grayson Doyle next. Hello. Hi there, uh, up to five minutes whenever you're ready. Good evening. My name is Grayson Doyle and I am a father and a member of the Kitsilano neighborhood who speaks before you today in strong opposition to this proposal. As a resident of this city for over 24 years, the mental health and addiction crisis has only gotten worse, not better. This proposal is an attempt at what many believe to be a solution to this problem, but will have long lasting effects on the neighborhood if input from the surrounding community are not. This proposal and its long-term legacy is currently in the hands of city councillors. Based on my observations over the last three days, I wanted to recap what I have learned. While I am not an expert in social housing, I am able to listen and understand what the challenges are. Here are my observations. This proposal clearly does not have a majority support of the community based on the numbers of speakers registered. Congregate housing doesn't work unless someone from the support side is able to counteract the points raised by Dr. Summers. It is very unclear to me if the city planners have accommodated the additional traffic access for emergency services, and pedestrian safety, which primarily includes elementary school children, into its plan. This building will bring additional pressures to an already challenging arterial road, not to mention the Broadway subway terminus station directly adjacent to the building. It is unclear to me what the resident composition is made up of. Did Councillor Fry question ever get answered? It is unclear to me as to what level of supportive services are being provided in this facility. I understand the building has a safe injection site in the building, which I understand is needed for the proposed residents. This proposed building is 17.8 meters away from an elementary school with 450 children and 300 meters away from another 1,500 elementary school children. There is shade from the proposed building on the elementary schoolyard in the mornings when children are playing and shade on the toddler park utilized by the students after school, directly to the north of the proposed structure. This, I believe, contradicts current practice. The building is 13 stories tall, which is equivalent to an 18-story tower 
in a neighborhood which is comprised of four to six stories max. Smaller over height, smaller overall height, and the smaller number of residents appear to be a more logical solution. A lot of long-term questions have came up, and the response is that it will be dealt with during operations. These questions should be addressed at the design phase where appropriate mitigations can be incorporated into the design. In summary, the city is investing a significant amount of social capital into this development and a significant amount of financial investment into this community. Should this project fail, which based on the last three days of discussion, certainly doesn't give me any comfort that it will be successful, this will be a significant amount of investment wasted and a black eye on mayor and council along with the impact to the community into perpetuity. Once constructed, based on the height, it will be easy to spot and be a long-term reminder to the mayor and council if this project fails. It will be a very long time before this 18-story tower will be erased from the Vancouver skyline. Thanks so much. Please that consider is... my words and feedback you have received over the last three days when voting on this currently very divisive proposal. Thanks so much. That's the five minutes, and I don't see uh, any questions for you, so I will move on to the next uh, speaker. Thanks so much. Uh, we have Gloria Chow, speaker number 93. Gloria Chow. Hello. Hi. Good evening. Hi Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? You can. Up to five minutes, please. Okay. Excellent. Good evening. My name is Gloria, and I oppose the rezoning on West 7th and Arbutus in its current form. BC is in a housing crisis, and I support our government's desire to accelerate housing solutions. I am supportive of the need for social housing in Vancouver, but I believe that we can do better than what has been proposed. I live in Marple, and the Reederman residence social housing is a few blocks from my home. The residence has been, the residence has been extremely well integrated into the community overall. The residence is less dense, a small operation of 77 supportive units for mainly marginalized seniors. It is spread over two low-rise buildings, both with sufficient staff on site, three to five staff during the day and two in the evening. Tenants are well cared for and minimally disruptive to our neighborhood. This level of success is not achievable with the current proposed project. A 13-story tower for 129 tenants with high-level clinical needs. What assurance do we have that there will be enough support staff? Another concern is how oversized this building will maintain the architectural integrity of the neighborhood. This is a 155-foot high rise tower situated on a small site and faces an extremely narrow residential sidewalk. It breaks all rezoning bylaws. It's very evident the government wishes to achieve their mandate to reduce homelessness through density. I urge you to consider all of the points that have been raised in opposition to this project up until this time with great care. I recognize for many of you, approving this proposal would be much easier as you're so close to achieving an important mandate rather than going back to the drawing board. Doing what's right takes multiple attempts and is often not the quickest path. I ask you to consider the facts and reject this rezoning application in its current form as we all strive for a much better solution. Thank you for taking the time to hear my comments. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any questions for you, so I'm going to move to the next speaker. 
Uh, Council, we are on speaker number 99, uh, Christina Valentinuzzi. Uh, speaker 99 is a duplicate in error. Okay, thanks, clerks. Uh, we're on speaker number 100, John Hatsitoliosis. No, that's not right. <laughs> John Hatsitoliosis. Hatsitoliosis. Uh, no. Oh, I worked so hard on that pronunciation too. Uh, okay, uh, Jane Bird. <laughs> Speaker 101, Jane Bird. Um, one moment, Jane Bird is uh, to be here in person, so we're just checking to see if uh, you, Jane Bird has arrived. Thank you, clerks. Just a reminder that uh, we have many speakers still to come on this item. Uh, we won't finish it tonight, so we'll be reconvening to hear from speakers uh, July 14th at 3 p.m. Speaker 101 is not in the chamber. Okay, thank you, clerks. Um, we're going to go to Speaker 102, Saj Karsan. Hi there. My name is yeah. Saj Carson, and I'm a resident who strongly supports these homes. I also implore Council to come up with a better process for approving homes, one that doesn't take hundreds of hours of City Council time. The zoning regulations are out of control, in my opinion. If a government entity or nonprofit or a private person wants to provide housing on their own land, they should be able to do so. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your time, and I don't see any questions for you, so thanks so much for calling in. Uh, 103, Speaker 103 is Bill. Bill, no last name, Speaker number 103. Speaker 103 has been disconnected. Thank you, clerks. Uh, in person, Speaker 104, Adrian uh, Kutshan. Speaker 104 has withdrawn. Thank you, clerks. Uh, Speaker 105, Jennifer Malcolm. Uh, no, Speaker 105 is not on the line. Thank you, clerks. Uh, Speaker 106 is Margaret Nan Gregory, uh, recorded as in person here on my list. Uh, can you hear me? Sure can, yeah. Thanks for calling in. You have up to uh, five minutes. Okay, thank or, you. Thanks for coming in. Thanks. Um, my name is Nan Gregory. I'm speaking in support of this application. I represent the social justice team at the Unitarian Church of Vancouver. And I should tell you that um, I'm a, a pensioner and I live up the hill in West Point Grey in a house that I bought in 1986. And I would be speaking in favor of this application if it was around the corner from my house. I want to address a few things. First is fear. It's only natural to fear and resist change if the status quo suits us. It means facing the unknown when the known seems so safe. The second is privilege. These people, my friends and kids, who don't want their neighborhood, these people in their neighborhood, are no different from you or me. Sorry, I've got to start again. These people, my friends and kids, don't want in their neighborhood are no different from you or me. They're no less intelligent, no less hardworking, no less caring, no less gifted. They share our longing for happiness and want to contribute the same as we do. So how come there's such a difference in the ways we live? No matter how hard we may work for what we have, we wouldn't have got it without luck. Where we were born, who we were born to, circumstances breaking to our advantage, the color of our skin, so much of our privilege is unearned. 
And in this unequal world of ours, neither did those without privilege earn their deprivation. They do not deserve it. Population grows, neighborhoods gentrify, people with less money are squeezed out of their homes. Rental buildings burn down or are reconditioned out of use. The value of our houses goes up. Those who pay for our privilege sleep on the streets. They are no different from us, except they have no homes. No place they can go and shut the door and be safe. No private space. They sleep on concrete. Morning comes after night after night of waking many times to pain, to cold, to fear. They suffer constant sleep deprivation as they move through unspeakably difficult days. Under those circumstances, what might I do to make the unlivable livable? I expect I would very likely suffer also the downward slide into substance use disorder. I have been convinced by what I've heard so far that this congregate building is not the perfect solution to the problems faced by those who will live there. But, if, but waiting for perfection pushes the possible ever, ever beyond reach. The small spaces in this proposed building, so scorned by those who have houses to live in, provide blessings we don't even notice anymore. A morning cup of coffee in their pajamas, a sink to brush their teeth over, Good God, a toilet to piss in when they wake. And look where it is. Green space, flowers, clean air, a beach within walking distance, an environment treasured for the nourishment it gives our children. Might it not also nourish these people? Might it not encourage them one small step to a better life? Which brings me to my third topic, gated communities. You and I didn't make this world. It's centuries in the making. But we who have means and power are responsible for perpetuating the inequities that give us our privilege and deprive others. Peer-reviewed studies show that people with wealth are less empathetic than those without it. They say because wealth brings independence and people who don't depend on others don't care about them. But I do. I don't want to wall the world out. Every caring, considered, well-researched, reasonable reason for saying no to this project is another way of saying keep out. I don't want to live like that in a gated community. To live without a moral compass knowing that people are suffering needlessly because I'm hanging on to more than enough and can't bear the idea of change. Counselors, I call on you to do the right thing and push this project through. We will find that what we fear is not as bad as we predicted. And if we are open to it, I will promise it will enrich our lives in unexpected ways. And Greens, I'm watching your vote on this to see whom you deem worthy of inhabiting your green world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, that is five minutes and I don't see uh, any questions for you. Uh, thank you for coming in tonight. and. Uh sharing your thoughts. Okay, Council, we are on to uh, Speaker 107, Chris Reed. Chris Reed, Speaker number 107. Hello. Hi there, Chris Hi, Reed. Can you hear me? Hi, Hi, can you hear me? Sure can. Up to five minutes, please. Hang on one second. A little technical problem here. Okay. There. Can you hear me okay now? Sure can. Up to five minutes, please. Wonderful. Okay. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. I applaud your fortitude with this process. Um, my name is Chris Reed. I'm a professional engineer. I've lived in Kitsilano for over 10 years. And uh, I've been, I know the subject area very well. I support recovery in social housing, but I'm opposed to this rezoning project for three specific reasons. The first is that data shows that large congregate low barrier permanent social housing as anticipated is inferior to much smaller congregate permanent housing, to scatter permanent housing, and certainly to sober living houses for positive outcomes. 
My sister suffered from addiction and mental health issues for over a decade in Vancouver. She lived with her addiction in many parts of the city, including the downtown east side, the Kingsway Corridor, and Kitsilano. She accessed several of the social aid organizations and lived in many different settings. It was not until she registered in a sober living house integrated well within a neighborhood in Victoria that she overcame her addiction, and now she's been sober and clean for over 20 years. I don't say this to suggest that this will work for everybody, but it does reinforce the research view I have developed when consulting peer-reviewed papers and speaking with professionals who serve the addiction recovery sector, including, including the former chairman of Turning Point. The Government of Canada website, in a section discussing the housing-first approach to homelessness, says, in order to respond to client choice, minimize stigma, and encourage client social integration, more attention should be given to scattered site housing in the public or private rental markets. That said, there are plenty of peer research papers that show that scattered site housing or smaller congregate sites are simply more effective. I've heard several times uh, about only half of this building being supportive housing, which is not what the application says. To be clear, even if 50% of the units were very low rental housing, will still be a, there will still be a significant portion of these residents who will likely still be suffering from the same issues as the supportive housing residents. This building is just way too big. Bottom line, large-scale congregate housing doesn't work nearly as well as the alternatives. The second reason is that the West 7th, West 8th, West 8th Ave location is not consistent at all with large-scale congregate social housing. This will result in low effectiveness for the tenant, as well as both acute and chronic neighborhood disruption. The building, as everybody knows, the building will be very close to a school with 450 elementary kids cast a shadow over the playground in the toddler park right next door and it'll generally be set in a district of low rise housing with families not to mention issues such as neighborhood and tenant safety it is so clear that this type of building will not fit within this community why are we considered why are we not considering scattered housing or low rise smaller congregate housing that is far more effective and will fit within the existing architecture and culture wouldn't that be a much more consistent approach with this neighborhood Everybody's heard several times a similar, a similar building, the Marguerite Ford Apartments in Olympic Village, experienced a 1,700% increase in 911 calls once it was built. And eight years later, the calls still come in at an increased rate of 1,500%. The discord does not disappear after six months, as suggested by Minister Eby. This is a mistake, and it will not go away. The third reason is the high rise proposed is a poor match, not only for the type of social housing for this neighborhood, but it's also a poor match for the low-rise Kitsilano location. Overall, a high-rise here will destroy the integrity of the neighborhood, and it is especially egregious considering that low-rise, high-density methods are vastly preferable for both increasing dwelling density and providing the preferred scattered social housing or smaller congregate models. Low-rise, high-density models have been used globally by the best city planners and architects for character neighborhoods to avoid the destruction of livability wrought by high-rise zoning. Certainly, the math is clear that Kitsilano and the area subject to the Broadway plan can meet the city's population and dwelling density goals of 2050 by employing low-rise, high-density methods alone. So, this leads to a wonderful confluence of solutions that can address both the zoning for the social housing that is the subject of the hearing and a solution that can meet the city's needs for densification, all while eliminating the need for high-rises. Councillors, Kitsilano is my neighbourhood. We have an opportunity to listen to the experts who have transformed iconic and livable neighborhoods around the world into higher density without sacrificing the neighborhood to high rises. And we have an opportunity to listen to peer-reviewed expert opinion, including the federal government, to use scattered site housing for hard-to-house Vancouverites, or at least to keep the site to low-density congregate setting. This means that we can do the right thing for the homeless, and we can do a right thing for our neighborhoods, and we can meet the city goals all without destroying the neighborhood with unwanted and unneeded high-rises and experimental large congregate social housing projects. Please, councillors, dig deeper. Let's get the right solution all around. Please do not experiment with my beloved neighborhood when there is well-developed science, successful precedents, and obvious neighborhood characteristics that point in a different direction. Let's adopt these best practices for all rezoning issues and enhance Vancouver's livability for all its residents. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. I don't see any questions for you, but uh, appreciate you calling in tonight. Uh, Council. Thank you. We're on, uh, we're on Louisa uh, Desiel. Hello. Desiel. Uh, one oh. Yeah. One oh eight. Yep. 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 Great. Go Hi. ahead. Uh, five minutes. Hi. 
Thank you. My name is Louisa Desiel. I'm a longtime Pitsilano resident who raised both my now young adult children here. I live seven blocks away from the proposed Arbutus project, and I support this project. I believe that housing is health care and that everyone has a right to safe and affordable housing. A lot has been said already from other speakers, so rather than reiterate it all, I would like to speak to our thriving community spirit and the amount of compassion and generosity I witness on a daily basis, as I believe this is what might differentiate us from some other areas of the city. Over the past couple of years, I've become very active in our community through various volunteer opportunities. This experience has opened my eyes to how many people are already living within Kitsilano who are either homeless or at risk of being homeless. It has also made me aware of how many good people we have here who are willing to give their time to make a difference. We have a vibrant kids community group um, on Facebook that has over 4,100 members, many of whom are already part of our vulnerable population. People reach out in this group every day to offer and or ask for a helping hand. It's remarkable how much gifting is done and how quickly we all jump in to help each other get through the many challenges and often the loneliness that has increased due to the pandemic. This group is open to anyone who lives in Kitsilano. The people of Kitsilano are truly inspiring and I'm convinced that this level of empathy will also be extended towards welcoming our new neighbors. With that strength of community, we can be the difference that is needed to help these residents feel a sense of belonging if that is what they're seeking. We can also take comfort in knowing that we are all looking out for each other, each other's children and the seniors who may feel vulnerable, those currently living here and new to the area. Kitsilano has so much to offer with such a well-established community. The strength and conviction of the opposition demonstrates that there's something spectacular here. It's time to share that. I have seen the smile brighten on a senior's face when they get to hear the joyful laughter of children playing in the park. I have sat and talked with our homeless citizens and know how much human connection means to all of us. I have read the stories of multiple people who have been helped by housing such as this to transition to a happier and healthier life. We can't keep turning our backs on the vulnerable people who need our support the most. This housing will save lives. And I urge all of the city councillors to please support this Arbutus project. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your time tonight. Uh, you have a question from Councillor Weed. Councillor Weed, go ahead. Yeah. Uh... Thanks for coming to speak today. You talked about having projects like this integrated by welcoming neighborhoods. Can you talk about some of the specific things you think that the neighborhood could do to welcome pro a project like this? Uh, we do have a lot of resources already in the neighborhood, um, such as uh, Work BC is, is right across the road currently. Uh, we have Kitsilano Neighborhood House. We have, I'm part of the West Side Food Collaborative as well. Um, I had a community pantry built um, just beside Kitt's Neighborhood House uh, in November and uh, where, you know, food donations are given and taken as needed. Um, people are now, I'm also on the board for the Neighborhood Small Grants and we are funding so many fantastic projects um, on the west side that uh, such as block parties, um, educational classes, uh, exercise uh, programs, all things that are free. And uh, I just, because I started this community group um, in March of 2021, and now that we're over 4,100 um, members, I've just been really um, encouraged by the, the coming together. We now have, through that group, we now have um, family beach cleanups that happen every month who also applied for funding. There's just so much desire to this neighborhood thriving and um, it should be open to everybody. Uh, it, 
we have a diverse group of people already in the neighborhood, and these newcomers would not be anything different than what we, you know, who we already are here. Okay, so you believe someone that's living in their car in Kitsilano that would move into a project like this, there's services in a community that could support them and make them feel I, part I of think so. I, okay. I believe so. And actually, i um, actively working towards um, pulling together some kind of hub resource that could, um, you know, help that we could put information together to give people who wanted it to say, you know, this is where you can go to help get your resume together. This is where you can go dress for success to help get an outfit for an interview together. This is something that I'm starting to work on now because I have been so inspired by this project, actually, and listening to the pe people's concerns. And I really feel we have the potential to mitigate a lot of those concerns. And if there was a community advisory committee, would you be someone that would want to step up and be part of that to be part of the solution? I absolutely would. Thank you. Appreciate you calling today and your insight. Thanks. Thank you uh, so much. Thank you. That's it for questions for you. Thanks so much for calling in. Uh, Council, we're at it's like 9.23. Uh, so our next speaker is 109, Rebecca Aston. Speaker 109, Rebecca Aston. Hi there. Um, Hi there. I'm Rebecca Aston. I'm a resident um, in Arbutus Ridge, and I have children in school in Kitsilano. And I am very for supportive housing, and I want this land to be used for supportive housing. However, I do not support this specific proposal. Um, to me, it seems like a desperate idea that's being pushed through out of desper desperation and politics, um, and that's not a reason to move forward with a plan that is sub subpar. I know that there is a real housing crisis and a real toxic drug crisis happening. However, this is not solving the problem of getting people out of the cycle of addiction and homelessness, but is keeping the cycle going and pushing those in need um, further down. Having chatted with places like UGM in my role as, as a social impact director at our company, they have talked about um, people who use their shelter um, short term, however, but that they have repeat people coming through because th their shelter does not, with the housing, it does not get them out of the cycle that they need to break them out of the homelessness and addic addiction. So this, to me, seems like a short term stopgap that is just ticking a box. And I cannot say that I am an expert on housing or addiction. However, I do think that I understand people and I do think that these people need better, and I do think we should be welcoming them to our neighborhood with our best and not giving them our bare minimum. And then when we give them our bare minimum, we wonder why they feel less than others and stigmatized. And I think we can do better and offer them a more dignified entry into our neighborhood with supports like the last speaker spoke about, where it's a very connected and supported by the community, um, by the people who are there. They are. It is a very giving community, and it is a very supportive community. Um, but we need to give these people to hold their heads high with dignity um, in the housing that can support them a bit better. And I think the city can do better. Thank you. Thanks so much for uh, calling in tonight. I don't see any questions for you. And I'm going to move to the next speaker, uh, Derek O'Keefe, Speaker 110. Derek O'Keefe, Speaker 110. Not on the line. Thank you, Clerks. Uh, we have Speaker 111, W. McGrath, uh, in person, it says. Uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor, Councillors. Uh, my name is Bill McGraw. I've been a parishioner and lector at St. Augustine's for three decades. I've been working on, the, on social justice issues for more than 20 years. First, I was on the Social Justice Committee at St. Augustine's Church. Then I worked with the St. Augustine, Augustine Saturday Morning Showers Program at the Kitts Community Center. And then on social housing issues long before there was any government funding. 
After that, I managed the St. Mark's Extreme Weather Shelter for about 10 years, until it was forced to close. So I am well acquainted with the Kitts Street community, its issues and problems, and its people. I am well acquainted with the social justice file. Mr. Mayor, you asked earlier why street people would prefer living rough over living in current shelters. Well, there's lots of fresh air, no crowds, and no drug peddlers. And it's normal for them. Now, I've, this is the fourth version of my speech that I've uh, written. Um, basically, it's um, a, a work in progress. But um, I've come to the opinion that this hearing could be a real learning experience for council moving forward with other so social housing, housing facilities. Most importantly, you need to do the right thing, of course. But we want to create a positive, successful example of social housing for future repetition. As to the lost funding, lesson learned? <laughs> no way. Try asking for an extension. Or maybe take that to the media. Who's cutting us off? Um, now, BC How I was appalled at BC Housing and MPA. Um, They've shown themselves to be naive, uninformed, and inexperienced with projects like this. There's been inadequate consultation with the VPD, Narcotics Anonymous, medical, psychiatric, and other addiction and health authorities, much less the school and neighborhood. We need to realize that without good input, any design will never be optimal, much less practical. This proposal is too tall, too wide, too congregate, too homogenous, the units are too small, too much traffic, and so, so on. So I would suggest you reduce the size of the building and increase the setbacks from the sidewalks. All social housing in general should address the needs of seniors, single parents, the physically disabled, mentally challenged, addiction challenged, singles, couples, abused women, and many other demographics. Build a mix of apartment sizes, bachelors, one beds, two beds, for a diverse population. I suggest, oh, hold on, uh, scroll, scroll, scroll. I would suggest you, um, no, did I, did I not? Hold on. I'm afraid I don't have. Computer, this proposal, yeah. I would suggest you build, okay, I would suggest that you build a six story development at 60% of the proposed cost per square foot, enabling us to fund two smaller facilities with the same resources. Relocate the drug recovery aspects of this building to a more isolated location and different building. Uh, we should not support the drug supply aspect of organized crime by establish in-house shooting galleries for addicts or their advocates. And uh, please, so please step back and reconceive and redesign this project. Vancouver is a progressive city. Let's do it right. Let's learn from others, from other cities, other countries, and other sites. Now, I've been looking for something unique to contribute to this discussion. So what I know from my 15 years experience at the showers and shelter, street people of Kitts and the downtown east side are very different communities. Most Kitts street people live in Kitts to avoid the hard drug community of the downtown east side. Most street people in Kitts are not hard drug users. The two groups do not get along well. Consider Dr. Summer's statement that street culture becomes building culture. We are talking about two very different communities here and all the violence that that entails. Please don't parachute citizens with their own private shooting gallery into the heart of a Kitsilano school community. Thank you so much. You're at your five minute limit, but you do have questions from Councillor Kirby Young. Hi, thanks for speaking to council tonight. Um, I apologize, my voice is a little, a little hoarse. Okay. Um, two questions for you. Um, and the first one is, 
um, just following up and clarifying your last point that you didn't quite fin get to finish, you're suggesting that it's erroneous to consider that vulnerable or homeless populations in different areas of the city are similar. You're saying that they have different um, perspectives or at different stages in terms of what right. they're looking for for housing. Is that, am I getting that correctly? Yes. I mean, most of the uh, street people in, uh, in my understanding is that um, in, in Kitsilano, most of the street people are alcoholics. Downtown, it's, there's a lot of, well, drugs, or drugs. Okay, and the, the, the two, two groups don't get along because they're one is trying to um, tempt people with hard drugs and get them addicted and, and things of that nature, and other people want to stay clear of that and they don't want they don't want to get involved with it. So you know, if you're going to bring the street people of Kitsilano into this facility uh, and hope to parachute another uh, sixty people of uh, from somewhere else, hard, who are hard drug users, into this facility, um, then I think you're going to have uh, massive turmoil within the building. Okay, so you're saying design for who you're intending to support and be aware of, of who that's going to be. My next question, um, just have limited time, is, is really, I think the key takeaway, and I, I just want you to affirm if, if I've got this correctly, is that you're actually suggesting I'm hearing you correctly, that council has an opportunity to actually influence through how it approaches this decision, the way that housing models are brought forward and delivered. Yeah, in the sure. Is that, is that a fair summary? Sure. Uh, what I'd recommend is that you sit down and say, put 10 building sites on the table, okay? And call in, you know, all the, the authorities and, uh, uh, sorry. So call in the various people and design them as a group and all the different um, uh, what, programs and um, uh, facilities that you need to build in, you know, so put one here, put one there, put one, one somewhere else. But, you know, design them as a group, not, you know, sort of one at a time, at a time, at a time. It's, uh, you, you know, I think you'll get a much better uh, design, design matrix, basically. If you, if okay. you approach things, it, collect, it if you approach things in that way, yeah. Okay, you're suggesting in terms of looking at the broader population and designing sites to serve specific segments of yeah. that population yeah. based on need. Is yeah. that correct? Yeah, it's like there's a lot of needs out there and you can't do it all in one building. Okay, yeah. thank you. I appreciate your comments. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, that's it for questions. Really appreciate you coming in and, and sharing your uh, thoughts and expertise. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mayor. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, we have on to speaker 112, who is Cole Har uh, Howard, who is also listed as being in person. Yeah, I did it. I made it. After okay. much ado, I don't know what's going on in the Broadway corridor, but it's, uh, I should look into that. It's a joke. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council, for inviting me here tonight. Uh, I'm really excited, really excited to be here this evening. Uh, my name is Cole Howard. I'm a resident of Granville Fairview. I'm a voiceover actor, and sometimes I'm a writer. But most importantly, tonight, I'm a concerned citizen on the brink of a looming battle for my own home. And while I hope in time to come back and speak on that specific issue, I feel that it's important as an engaged housing advocate to speak in support of this proposed rezoning. Counselors, as of today, I've spent a good part of my week now watching coverage of the January 6 hearings, uh, considering the pending resignation of Premier John Horgan and mostly watching this public forum. And as a consequence, I find myself almost sick with sadness. It seems that politically heavy days do that to me, and as I'm sure it does for many, and it does it for this reason, we are suffering from a glaring and galling lack of empathy in our, in our political discourse. We see it in the United States, and we see it in Ottawa, and we see it in our legislatures and our communities, and admittedly, I see it in myself at times. And distressfully, we've seen it here in this council chamber regarding this proposal night after night and opponent after opponent. A housing project like this is not ambitious for a city like Vancouver. At least it should not be. As I read through the proposal, I found myself surprised at how pragmatic and concise this proposal is. It is clear in its scope and the culmination of hard work of dedicated professionals who deserve nothing short of our gratitude and our trust. It seems to me that we all acknowledge that Vancouver is facing a housing crisis and we need a solution for said crisis. Well, here's a solution. A proposal like this should not be made out to be a profile in political courage. Proposals like this should be ratified by this council every month. 
That would be politically courageous and an ambitious and exciting response to the crisis we're facing in our housing sector. And from what I've seen, it seems there are a good number of people speaking in opposition with great ideas about where buildings like this could go and what those buildings might look like and whom they might serve. As a matter of interest, I mentioned that I'm facing my own housing battle. Being right along the proposed Broadway plan, I'm witnessing firsthand the change in my neighborhood. There's a 30-some-odd story tower going up directly across the street from me, which will sadly obscure my beautiful view of the North Shore Mountains. Bummer for me. Is that ideal? Not particularly, but that is the cost of living in a city. Why should my personal preference of what buildings go up dictate the ability for this city to function better and serve more people better? I do not understand how so many people can claim to support the building of housing, housing for vulnerable people, no less, and then shut the door when it falls in their lap. As I said, this proposal isn't overwhelmingly ambitious. It is sound, it's valuable, and it will make our community and our city better. I bike by this area most days, and I'd be thrilled to see this building thriving and serving our community. It displaces no one, it harms no one, and most importantly, it fulfills the obligation of the city and all of us, by extension, to find housing for vulnerable people. I have no time to run down the entirely speculative concern of heightened criminality or the ludicrous hand-wringing about casting of shadows because, frankly, that's not worth any of our time. Furthermore, if community interests are concerned about the integration of unhoused and vulnerable people, perhaps then we should go to greater lengths to project a commitment to welcoming unhoused and vulnerable people as opposed to presenting narrow-minded concepts of what may happen. The othering language opponents have used in this forum has been genuinely sickening. When we are talking about housing, I'm sorry, of, Mayor, yes. are you not going to intercede on this? You have a point of order, uh, Councillor? I have a point of order. The speaker is, well, yeah, just sorry. roll back the tape. You have a number? Caution the speaker, I'll come back with the number. Thanks. Point of, point, of, point of procedure, Mayor. Councillor Watson was not asked for a number earlier tonight. Right, a point of procedure. Go ahead, speaker. Continue. Uh, thank you very much. Um, the use of words like they and them when we're talking about housing are words of violence. They're words that are used to keep people out of communities and out of homes. We're not going to achieve any progress on housing in this city unless we realize that we don't live in gated communities. We live in a city that's built on stolen land. And in order for anything to get better, we must be allowed to change and grow. And I'm not just talking about neighborhoods and skylines. I'm talking about everyone's collective understanding of the challenges we face and appreciation that we all must contribute when we're asked. This crisis, like so many of the crises we will continue to face, cannot hinge on the whims of those who want for relatively little, myself included. When we go down that road, we can never hope to truly resolve the most pressing issues of our time. I hope my words have been valuable. I hope that you appreciate how badly needed a building like this is. And going forward, this proposal is a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of our social housing needs, but it's a start. And in despairing times, a start is better than a standstill. So thank you for your time tonight. I urge you once again to do the right thing and pass this proposal. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. I don't see so, any- Mayor, it is 7.8 and uh, C, engage in improper conduct. I'll send it over to the clerk. I think you have to be impartial and, and broadly applying right. these principles. What's the, what's the remedy yeah. you're asking for with this speaker, Councillor Hardwick? Well, it's kind of late now. You know, when people and, are in the middle I mean, of it, I guess you should respond to it. And yeah, anyhow. thanks for the lecture on how to share. Uh, we'll, we'll go to 113, uh, Curtis Jagel, Jagel, Jagelski. Curtis Jagelski, speaker number 113. Okay. Yeah, you're up. Uh, it is five minutes, whenever you're ready. My name is Curtis and I'm a resident of Kitsilano. I support supportive housing and I'm opposed to this rezoning application in its current form. Over the last few days, we have heard new, from numerous BC housing employees and a fine gentleman from MPA nonprofit, all of whom I have no doubt are good, kind hearted people, none of which addresses the elephant in the room. How are they going to provide the necessary critical services to the most vulnerable and unwell? BC Housing has handcuffed the City of Vancouver, you, to the rezoning of this site to 129 units and has used the use of public funds as the handcuffs, citing they will move on to other projects within the province. 
If approved in its current form, the City of Vancouver will be setting a very dangerous precedent with the BC housing for the rest of the city, resulting in buildings that do not adhere to the zoning bylaws, setbacks, or solar access, or community safety input. That you can throw a democratic process out the window, that you can forget about our city zoning bylaws as long as you pay up. Ultimately, the City of Vancouver can be bought. Because if approved, you have turned a blind eye to the community, the history, the failures, the inadequacies of BC housing, and most importantly, put the community at risk. This is your chance to change that. The applicant, city staff, the proposed operator of this building, and also proponents of the building who spoke during the hearings have stated numerous times that there are no safety risks and oftentimes failed to acknowledge immediate and apparent safety risks to housing a potentially large number of people with substance use, mental health disorders together in a supportive housing building that will also be about 18 metres from 500 small children ages 3 to 12. Recent statements to the Vancouver Sun made by the CEOs of Atira and PHS, two very experienced BC housing supportive housing operators in Vancouver, show otherwise. At this time, I'm going to read a published article by the Vancouver Sun dated March 18th, 2021. Wednesday's fatal shooting in a BC housing building in the downtown east side is the latest of a spate of drug-related violence that advocates say the government must urgently address through decriminalization, enhanced social housing with wraparound supports and more treatment services for people with mental health and addiction issues. Shania Paulson, 24, has been identified as a woman who was shot through a door at 4 a.m. on Wednesday as she walked through a hallway of the six-story Arco Hotel, a single-room occupancy building at 83 West Pender. Janice Abbott, Executive Director of Viteria Property Management, which operates the BC government-owned hotel, said she believes the shooting was a result of a dispute between two drug dealers who were long-term tenants of the building. The victim was caught in the gunfire as her boyfriend banged on the door to one of the units. Abbott said, It's clear drug-related violence is increasing in Vancouver, and she said supportive housing operators don't have the tools to address the prevalence of guns and drug dealers inside the buildings. We know we have dealers in most of our buildings, she said. People ask, Why don't you evict the dealers? Because people use drugs so they'll just be replaced with other dealers. Supportive housing staff are unable to search rooms for weapons or prohibit guests because the buildings are covered by the Residential Tenancy Act, Abbott said. I want all of you to take a moment to really think about what I just read. Supportive housing operators don't have the tools to to address the prevalence of guns and drugs dealers inside the buildings. These are not my words, but the words from Janice Abbott, ED of Ateria Property Management. In our nation's capital, Victoria City Councilors approved the only other supportive housing site in our province that is adjacent 20 meters of an elementary school. Sound familiar? As quoted by Victoria City Council, Mount Edwards House is housing for seniors who aren't addicted to drugs and who have been screened for violence in their past. Residents who have a history of addiction do need to be on a recovery path, as they said. The city councillors in Victoria did not turn a blind eye to the community's concerns. They worked with with the school and came up with a proposal that served those in most need and maintained all safety concerns within the, the community. Is the city of Vancouver really going to roll the dice with this proposal, denying the fact that another major Canadian city already determined that this type of use does not work adjacent to an elementary school for the same safety concerns as presented within these hearings. Is the City of Vancouver prepared to be BC Housing's guinea pig when it comes to supportive housing adjacent to schools? City of Victoria said no. You are are at your five minutes, but uh, Councillor Kirby Young has questions for you. Go ahead, Councillor Kirby Young. Thank Thank you. you. I just have one quick question, and I'm wondering if you would be um, willing to email a copy of your remarks to Council. 100%. Okay. Um, the clerk, I believe, can let you know the appropriate email to use for um, Aaron Council so we can all receive that. Thank you. Yeah, so much. no problem. That, that's it for questions. Appreciate it.
Uh, we're going to move on to uh, speaker 114, Gemma Isaac. Hello, good evening. Hello, up to five minutes, whenever you're ready. Thank you. My name is Gemma Isaac, and I'm a resident of Vancouver. I'm a registered clinical counselor and music therapist and first responder and frontline counselor for mental health and wellness, and I am opposed to this rezoning. I want to be clear that I am in support of inclusive, affordable, co-op, and social housing in every neighborhood. As a mental health practitioner, social justice and supporting the most vulnerable has always been a passion and priority of mine. What I am opposed to is the language and the ambiguity that this proposal put forward through this process. My main concern is that BC Housing and the applicants, to a large extent, took away the fundamental process of consulting with the public, specifically those who live and work in the neighbourhoods, where the developments will take place. I believe that there is a way to support social housing developments within every neighbourhood, but it must include the process of earnest consultation and reflect recommendations from those already living and working and stakeholders operating in these neighbourhoods in order to create successful and harmonious community. For example, the proposed social housing project slated to be built at 8th and Arbutus would have a great impact on the women's supportive recovery home in the vicinity and on my life as I work only a few blocks away and for my children and the other 450 plus students attending an elementary school right across the proposed building. It is integral to have proper thoughtful planning and sufficient public consultation especially when it comes to public health and safety of those living, working, and playing in the neighborhood, as well as for those that intend to be helped by proposed buildings. I want to be ensured that successful planning is in place to optimize an agreeable coexistence and community integration with new social housing projects, and not to mention the Broadway terminus, our beta station, on the next door block over. I thank you for the opportunity to speak. It is opportunities like this that I'm grateful to live in a time and place where we can practice democracy. And that is why I'm speaking today, is to fight and advocate that this is a right not taken away by proposals that threaten the opportunity for stakeholders who will be affected by such housing development to voice their questions, comments, or concerns. Thank you. Thank you so much. I don't see any questions for you, so I am going to... Let's see, what are we at? We're at 9.49. I think we can take our uh, final speaker of the evening, uh, who is Lindsay Bromley, uh, Speaker 115. Speaker 115 has withdrawn. Thank you, clerks. Uh, how about Speaker 116, Liz Flores? Good evening, can you hear me? Sure can. Uh, up to uh, five minutes, mm -hmm. please. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Liz Flores, and I strongly oppose to this restoring application proposal. I live in Kitsilano, and I work in healthcare. I clearly understand the need for safe housing in Vancouver, and thank you for allowing conversation and discussion on the service delivery model for this project. Psychiatrists have said before that we need a coordinated effort where the Ministry of Health, City of Vancouver, and BC Housing develop a meaningful housing model approach to end homelessness. The model starts with adequate treatment facilities, which I recognize that we currently don't have enough, access to supportive housing, and access to social housing for people on income assistance. It was mentioned before that the definition of support services will be discussed at a later time once the project is approved. I do wonder what those support services are going to look like. Access to two employees in the building, in my opinion, is not adequate support. Adequate support means having a variety of services available, including access to nutrition, to the right environment, education, and access to clinical and medical care. Assuming this is housing and the MPA operator were to consider a support service model for such a large institution where healthcare staff is hired to support the residents in their recovery journey, are they aware of the staffing issues that the lower mainland healthcare authorities are currently facing? The vacancy rates are trending up at an alarming rate. A more realistic solution would be to house the same number of people in smaller buildings where you can partner with churches, community organizations, community programs, and neighbors to provide a better recovery approach. As an example, look at the successful model by the Santa Maria House. Counselors, you have heard the facts on why the proposed model on its current format doesn't work. 
And in homelessness does not mean congregate 129 people in the building. It means better access to care, treatment, recovery, and integration into community. I am familiar with the stories of the single room occupancy buildings around the city, criminal activity, violence incidents inside and outside of the building, and the medical emergencies that require immediate healthcare assistance. Even though this building is not, is not designated as a single room occupancy, my first thought on the current proposal is the safety of these occupants and the community around it. Just comparing with the Marguerite Ford apartment building, that has seen an increase on emergency call and it hasn't changed in the past two years. This is the future of what we will see in the proposed project. And to our, and to our housing minister, when he states that if the project doesn't work, he will be committed and work to address those issues immediately. We're telling you right now, it won't work. By the time the building is functional and you realize that it will be too late. From what I have heard in the past two years, Today, sorry, we're not just opposing to the project, we are giving you plenty of feedback and great ideas. And some of those ideas are based on research, which again, I invite you counselors to review it, understand it, and act on it. I am repeating what you heard the first day. I strongly believe that this is a great opportunity to create and design a space and a program that has potential to be global leaders. But the most important is to be safe for its occupants, safe for the neighbors like the seniors and the woman in the recovery house next door and safe for the kids across the street. Thank you. Thanks so much for uh, sharing your thoughts this evening. I don't see any questions for you. So council, um, we're at uh, 9.53 and I think that's uh, probably good for this evening. Uh, we'll pick it up on, um, just the clerks remind me here, we're uh, we've agreed to come back at uh, July 14th at 3 p.m. to hear the uh, just over uh, uh, other half of the speakers for this item. Uh, July 14th at 3 p.m., uh, starting with speaker 117. Uh, there will be probably subsequent days scheduled for uh, the remainder of the uh, of this item that we will uh, advertise once we figure that all out. Uh, so with that, uh, Council, I'll just check with the clerks. It's, we're just going to recess until July uh, 14th? That's correct. It, great. So, so we, I don't think we need a motion for that. We can uh, just call it an aid and come back on the 14th? That's correct. <laughs> great. Okay. Thanks very much, Council, for all your work. And I know it's a, it's a, it's a lot, so, but I uh, appreciate it. And, and good job. And we'll, uh, we'll see you uh, after the long weekend. Hey, Good night, everybody. Okay, bye-bye.